welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 261st episode, our returning guest is Jonathan Fowler. Jonathan is the all-time most frequent guest of the Rob Burgess Show. For a complete list, check the show notes. Jonathan graduated with a BA in history from Indiana University in 2006. He is an unabashed left-wing political junkie. He has lived and worked in South Korea for over a decade, trying to help the citizens of that great nation hopefully talk pretty one day. And now on to the show. All right, so we we watched the debate, right? (laughs) Yes, we did. Oh, by the way, new season of Survivor started last Wednesday. Yeah, wasn't one of the Pod Save America guys on that? Okay, I'm going to warn your listeners now that there can be spoilers or whatever, so... Okay. I've, I've been super psyched to see uh, John Lovett from uh, Pod Save America, Pod Save the World or whatever, uh, Love It or Leave It. He's got multiple, you know, shows within that genre and stuff. Pretty cool, pretty chill guy, I think, and everything. I was really excited to see him play Survivor this time. I didn't know he was even a fan, but spoiler warning, he gets betrayed by his his only ally who freaks out and has a panic attack and throws him under the bus. And rather than his tribe mates voting the crazy guy out, they like turned on him for some reason. He was the first boot. Like Mm. the whole like survivor world or whatever is kind of in uproar right now because it was such a crazy scenario. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it was a a very disappointing first episode. And, and uh, my, my draft pick, he was my top draft pick or whatever for this Mm -hmm. season. So like, my draft is probably halfway screwed at this point. So, wow, that was that was sudden. Yeah, you would have thought they would have lasted a little longer than that. I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, he he would have been like, I do think he could have been at risk if anybody had known who he was. But the shocking thing was, <laughs> nobody knew who he was. Five other people, and it didn't seem like anybody really knew who he was. Wow. He's, he's like, oh yeah, I'm a podcast host. I do, you know pod save the world and like one person on the tribe was like oh yeah i think i've heard of pod save the world nobody else like nobody knows he's worked with hillary clinton nobody knows he's like (laughs) worked within the barack obama white house for multiple years nobody knows that he basically has like one of the if not the most popular political podcasts in the world like these guys are just oh okay yeah you're you're a podcast host you're kind of famous okay sort of kind of maybe yeah (laughs) so I, i think it's shocking you take like five maybe we're just way more political than most people or something but like you take five people and none of them have have listened to this podcast like a single time it's it's crazy i think yeah well i'm not sure everyone is as like you said politically aware or online as we are so (laughs) yeah i mean like most of the tribe members are younger than us and stuff but it's like okay so the young generation is just not listening to political you know I don't know, Bob, we may need, we may need to change the focus of the Rob <laughs> show for the, to, to appeal to a younger demographic. Do I have to talk about, like, K-pop stars and Riz now or something? <laughs> Rob, have you done any, have you ever been on TikTok? Can you, can you do a TikTok dance? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's, think, what, that's what it's come to? <laughs> I, that, I think that's what we have to do. Oh, no. <laughs> so, Man, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever watch Survivor, though? Not lately, no. No, I haven't watched it since the first couple seasons. That was kind of the breakout, you know? Yeah. No, I'm I'm, I'm still a huge fan. I, You know, and I, I never watch. I don't watch reality TV. Like, um, I don't care about any other reality TV shows. But Survivor has always kind of had a... Just the the thing of people being, you know, dropped on an island and having to figure a bunch of stuff out for themselves and develop a society and develop a political alliances with each other and betray each other. And there's a lot of, you know, the human human condition in there and everything. I love it. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes there are some frustrations with certain seasons or certain characters. But, you know, overall, it's a lot of fun, I think. Mm. Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound like it's off to a very good start, though. So. <laughs> I mean, it was a it was a wild episode. It was very frustrating how it happened, but um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep watching and see what happens. I'm just kind of I'm kind of rooting against the yellow team. I don't care to see them get decim like if they get decimated after this, I'll be totally satisfied with that. So, 
I think they kind of deserve it. Wow. Yeah. So the, we'll see how they do, though. There's still the blue and the red tribe, and the yellow tribe has lost John Lovett now at this point. Hmm. And and the thing was, like, he really didn't do a lot wrong the first episode. He was not he was not setting himself up to fail in most ways. He was kind of just railroaded by this one event. Like his his uh, teammate at at the immunity challenge, his teammate who was his only ally kind of just like collapsed on the ground and pretended to be having a medical issue, but actually it seemed like he was just having a panic attack or something. And then when they got him back up at the end of the uh, challenge, which that team lost, um, Jeff was like, Jeff Probst was asking him like, Hey, you know, what's going on? Uh, Andy, his name is Andy. Mm -hmm. He's like, and he said like, Oh, I was just thinking, you know, as I was watching the challenge, I was thinking that, you know, John is my number one ally, but I was thinking maybe I would throw him under the bus to save myself. <laughs> and like everybody from every tribe is hearing him say this. So it's not even just his own tribe that's hearing him say this. It's like the other tribes are their jaws all hit the floor and like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you telling us this and stuff? And even John Lovett like at, reacted pretty like, you know, magnanimously. But he's like, OK, that's kind of a weird thing for you to say and everything. And I don't know. This guy has a full blown meltdown. And. And my boy catches a stray over it. I'm super pissed. Wow. But sometimes survivors wacky like that. You're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. So you never know what they're going to do. Like my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> oh, man. Kind of joking. We watched a debate here. Oh, my gosh. That was that was something. Yeah. That was that was amazing. Yeah, he really yeah. had some all time quotes <laughs> to deliver. <laughs> yeah, I started off like as I was going through the debate and I was underlining just bits and pieces and just interesting things that I thought I wanted to mention or talk about. But towards the second half, I just found myself underlining entire blocks of text, mostly of what Trump was saying, because it was just so wild. Mm -hmm. um, and. The, and there became just a recognizable pattern at a certain point of, you know, I think Kamala did a pretty good job of baiting Trump. And then Trump would always take the bait and he would get distracted from what he was supposed to be talking about. And he'd start ranting about something that she'd said or, you know, responding extremely defensively to it. And it was it was very amusing to watch. And I think even Kamala Harris kind of had that happy warrior kind of, you know, smiling and, you know, you know, raising her eyebrows at him and that kind of thing. And like, yeah, it was it was wild. But mm. well, anyways, I OK, well, I I kind of made some questions here or something to start us off, I guess. Like, I mean, so, well, what before the debate, Bob, what do we think about the, you know. You know, sometimes I think we ought to almost do a pre pre debate you know, just kind of like a setting the stage kind of thing. Like, what do we think that this candidate needs to do during the debate? Well, what is this we, could do that, we could do that in this episode with the uh, upcoming vice presidential debate, because we I, I plan to have this out next mm -hmm. uh, Friday. So I think that's still a couple of days before their debate. So we could, you know, if you want to make any predictions about that, we could do that. But yeah, no, I agree. That's a good idea. OK. Well, yeah, I mean, we could try. I'd, I'd have to think about it. You know, I had more time to think about what I thought that the, I had ah. weeks to think about what, <laughs> I, you know, sure. What, what does J.D. Vance need to do before I don't oh, know, change his relationship <laughs> with women? Yeah, well, just can become. Can he do that in about a month? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I was thinking, I don't know. So what I mean, before, before this debate, like, what did you think that Trump and Harris needed to do? Like, what, what do you think that they was something that they had to do for themselves? Like, I mean, um, what kind of things did they both need to avoid for themselves? What kind of questions do you think that they should have been trying to make the other one answer? Um, and then do they succeed in any, any of these things during the debate? And, and finally, like, not, apart from themselves, what they personally need in order to win this election, like what do the American people do? The American people know know everything that they need to know to make a decision for the next four years. You know, not just to say like my side wins or something, but like you know, mm -hmm. you know, I want I want Harris to win, but I think there's issues that she has avoided. 
successfully, largely, that the, the voters actually deserve to know. But I can understand why the campaign maybe them because they any answer would be divisive. So it's kind of like, but I don't know. Anyways, these are my kind of my questions going into it. So did you have any thoughts like what questions they should answer? What questions they should try to make the other go, one answer? Go through, uh, go through that list one at a time. What's the first question? Okay, the first question, uh, what does each candidate need to do in this debate? Like what, what, should, okay, what well, should their goal be? I mean, it's, gosh, have we even and, talked since Harris became the nominee? I think we were... Did we? I don't remember if the last one was before or after that at this point. Yeah, uh, I feel like maybe it was before, maybe. I think but it was I can't right, remember like, exactly right either. I think I was pretty much giving up on on Joe Biden being able to win the debate or win the, uh, yeah. the election. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I was pretty down and negative on any Democrat being able to win at that point, even if they had switched out Biden. Yeah. Just because there was so much energy about Trump looking heroic post getting almost ass assassinated. Mm -hmm. Of course, by now we're on to assassination attempts too. And, you know, people hardly blink an eye, you know, it's. Yeah. So we, we talked about the assassination attempt and that was after she became the nominee, right? Um, the wait. Yes. No. Wait, well, wait, did, wait, was the. I'm losing track of time here. So it was the first assassination attempt before Harris became the nominee. Yes, yes. Trump, I mean, Biden was still clinging. Biden, on Biden. was still the nominee at that point. I mean, everybody was telling him you're going to lose. You're going right, to right because that was before the convention. And then after the convention, that's when the change happened. I see. Yes. So, OK, well, we talked about that first attempt, but I still don't remember if we talked about uh her since she became the nominee rather so anyway to answer go back to your question i think she needed to look presidential um i think a lot of people hadn't really formed much of an opinion about her yet which i think was probably good and actually in retrospect this may look like a very smart way of doing things because uh i think if we were allowed to have a competitive primary season and if she had to campaign for his, you know, 18 months or whatever, instead of just a couple months. Uh, how picked a part of a candidate are we talking about here? <clears throat> and other yeah. countries have 100, you know, day or whatever, short length of time, snap elections all the time. And they don't have years to like run for office. And yeah. so I think there's merits to that shorter time frame honestly from a practical standpoint so i don't know like what did you think she needed to do oh well i was thinking about i was thinking more about policies but yeah um or articulating things but yeah i mean i do think she has to kind of introduce herself and people can say well she's been there for you know three and a half years everybody already knows her we really don't you know when you're the vice president we really don't know that much about you and and also you're totally like subservient to whatever the, the president is doing as far as your policy goals and stuff. So we don't really know what your policy goals are apart from the president. Um, I think, I mean, okay, so I think there's a lot of overlap here, but I think like, for example, I she has been avoiding interviews and she has been, I think, avoiding hard interviews where she gets asked about questions that would put her potentially either in support of or in opposition to Joe Biden's policies, right? Because that's a really tricky situation right now as far as, you know, why should you be the president? What are you going to do different than Joe Biden has done? And you can't really say anything because you're the vice president right now. But at the same time, to be elected president, you have to say something. You have to differentiate yourself. You have to, you know, come with some new vision, but you have to do it in a way that doesn't make it looked like you're being disloyal or betraying the president you're still serving, you know? So I think, I think that's a, that's a kind of a, that's a, that's a tightrope that the Harris campaign has had to walk because they're the vice president for an active president right now. And I don't know, you know, there's no, there's no easy answer for what you should do there. But I do think like the thing is like, Harris's instinct, no doubt, is to try to avoid any questions about how she's going to be different than Biden in any way. 
but and I understand that for her that she needs to do that politically, but I do think the American people have a right to know what they're voting for for the next four to eight years, you know, like so I do think she has to answer some of these questions, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's fair, and I think I think you know one of my um so to so I think that's something that she needs to. The candidate needs to do is establish her vision apart from Biden's. But at the same time, that's also number two, question number two, what does she need to avoid? She needs to avoid uh, drawing distinctions against Biden. Um, number three, what should they try to make each other answer? If Donald Trump had a brain besides the, you know, the reactive lizard brain that he has, he should have been trying to make Kamala answer these questions, say, look, you know, Joe Biden's policy has been this. The people don't like it. Is your policy going to be the same? Or are you going to continue or is it going to be different? And if it's going to be different, how is it going to be different? Are you going to do, do things differently than Joe? You know, I think if, if Donald Trump had a real strategy, that's what he really should have been. He should have been trying to drive some wedges there and, you know, make her take some controversial stances on issues. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I think that's that's something, um, you know, I think I think one of the most important issues right now, you know, people can say, oh, it's the economy or oh, it's this or that or it's, you know. You know, transgender athletes or race or whatever it is. For me, I think I think right now the foreign policy, it's a lot of people never say foreign policy is that important, I think. Um, frankly, I think defeating Russia right now in Ukraine just you know, bringing this thing to a satisfactory end quickly is an important issue. And I think ending the, I think it's ethnic cleansing that's happening in, in the Palestinian territories, both parts, really. Uh, I, I think that those are things. And of course, she's never going to, I don't think she's ever going to say anything about those. She doesn't want to talk about it. Going to keep talking about, oh, Israel has a right to defend itself and stuff like that. And that's the safest answer for her. But, you know, as voters, I think people do have a right to know. I mean, it's a it's a double edged sword. We should know if and how her policy is going to be different on that issue. Um, but at the same time, that knowledge will make her less electable, probably, because it's going to upset the boat and it's going to, you know, activate different constituencies of the Democratic Party in different ways. But I understand why she this is the thing that's maddening about it all. We deserve to know it, yet at the same time, in the political environment we live in, if we do know it, it's going to make things harder for her to get elected, which is bad, probably. But at the same time, like we shouldn't be forced to make a decision that affects the next four years of domestic and international policy without without having that question answered, I think. Mm -hmm. Back to early. Yeah. But what about uh, Trump? What do you think he needed to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think sometimes back to after the first debate when there was that, that captured video of him being interviewed by somebody randomly at his golf course or whatever, and he's sitting, he's like reclining back on his golf cart and he's just shooting the shit with the people or whatever. And he's like, um, oh yeah, yeah. I, oh, I totally beat, totally beat him, totally beat him. Uh, they're probably. I hear they're going to switch him out for Kamala. It's terrible. She's a disaster. This will be even worse or something. And I'm just thinking, like you know, Trump is Trump is the dog that caught the the proverbial dog that caught the car. Right now, he doesn't know what to do with it. He's got <laughs> he's got a younger, more vital vital person, a vibrant person who's uh, you know younger and makes him look like the old guy now. And he doesn't, you know, there's only so much he can do with that on the debate stage. I think so. <laughs> with all his bloviating and ridiculousness so um mm -hmm. i sometimes i think like there could be a kind of a like a postscript or something to the trump presidency like or the the trump the man just like you know donald trump colon what if a narcissist got everything they ever wanted <laughs> I, I mean i think it's like just you know just everything the love the hate the the non-stop adoring attention the hateful attention assassination attempts, you know, almost being martyred, you know, being like a political rock star for ridiculous. Re I mean, this is like, you know, 
if you asked an undiagnosed mar- narcissist who was unmedicated and everything, like, what would you like to happen? Like, I mean, I, I think the last decade or so of Trump's life would probably be what he would ask for, although it would not have been what he would have needed, probably. Like, <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> but just that's what I'm saying. Like, what if a narcissist got everything they ever wanted? It's like, <laughs> this is the Donald Trump lifestyle, basically. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, what do you what do you think about that, though? Like, I mean, Kamala's obviously been avoiding interviews, certainly been avoiding, um, you know, a, I would say probably aggressive interviews or interviews that are going to challenge her on issues. Um, I mean, should she answer those questions? Does she have a responsibility to answer those questions? Does she have a duty more to to, you know, to Joe Biden? Or does she have a duty more to letting the American people know what she's going to do different? I mean, from a practical standpoint, I get, even though I'm a member of the media, I understand why people don't want to talk to the media. I mean, yeah. I interview people all the time, but I've also been interviewed and it's nerve wracking. Um, obviously a politician and a leader and a, somebody that wants to be president should be able to handle that. I get that, but it's, it's not easy. And, you know, one misstep can, you know, can take you all the way down. I mean, look at poor Howard Dean. He did one scream and the man never came back from it. Um, you know, that wasn't in an interview, but that was, you know, it's a moment and moments go viral and, I think she knows very well that she will never be held to the same standard that Trump is because he says off the wall things all the time. And it's like we're we're inoculated against it almost just because of the deluge of it. And it's like, who can keep track of it anymore? He's talking about Hannibal Lecter and the sharks and the batteries and the, you know, it's like, what, what, what are you talking about? Like, but like he does that all the time. And so it's like a different standard set where Kamala says one slightly goofy thing and it's it's a it's going to be the next meme. So I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, I I mean, apart from what Trump, the standard Trump is held to, I'm just saying, like, I mean, the. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like the press, like I, I think I've heard I, I think I heard somewhere that former reporters or something often refuse, like, even if they become the story or something, they often refuse to be interviewed by reporters because they know that a reporter, you know, doesn't necessarily want them to to, to win. And if they lose during the interview, that's great for them. And so they're going to, you know, to some degree, there's a, there's a, I, I think even other reporters understand that there's, you have automatically almost an, uh, an adversarial relationship with the reporter who's talking to you, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If if you if you fuck up and say the wrong thing, they can and will publish it, you know, and there's not much you can do about it at that point. So, but I mean, you're a politician, yeah. I mean, you've already that's you know you should love the limelight. You should see every interview as an opportunity, not as a challenge, right? I mean, like, but I mean, like, but my my basic question though, who's her duty more to? Should it be more to Joe Biden or more to informing the American people who want to know? <laughs> I mean, I think it should be winning, obviously. That should be the main thing she's focused on. In any way that she can do that, then that's what she should do. I mean, as much as I would like it, I, as a reporter, do not have subpoena power. I can't force anyone to answer my questions. And I know that certain people don't want to talk to me for reasons I'll never understand and can't be explained to me. But it's also people who put themselves forward who have their own agendas as well. So it's like, you know what I mean? Did you catch my joke? No, I'm not sure. I said it's like my (laughs) ex-girlfriend. There's people who don't want to talk to me and I'll never understand why. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Um, The... uh, well, OK, but Bob, that's I think that's from your perspective as a single reporter. I mean, yeah, I, I'm not saying that Kamala Harris has to talk to any one given reporter for any particular reason. But like, I mean, doesn't she owe something to 
I mean, she doesn't have to talk to like Barbara Walters per se, but like, doesn't she have to talk to somebody? Like, doesn't she have to be giving an interview to somebody? Did you talk to Oprah? Okay. I mean, to be fair, and I should, you know, as an informed political person or whatever, I should watch that. My suspicion is Oprah's much more vibes based and woo woo <laughs> than she is. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, what did she do in it? How long was the interview with Oprah? I don't know. She did, did say apparently during it that if you sneak into her house, she has a gun and she will shoot you. <laughs> okay, well, respect. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. The, hopefully the maggots who are going to show up with a hammer at her house or something to beat her husband senseless will hear that and think twice. Right. But, uh, but I mean, yeah, well, I, during the debate, I think at one point she mentions that both she and Biden are gun owners or something. So, yeah, I mean, I think they're trying to, you know, get, get some leverage on the gun issue, which. Uh, yeah, for some reason, Democrats have never been able to um, in the modern era, I don't think have been able to turn that into a winning issue. So, um, you know, it's a great tragic effect for the for the nation as far as the schools and everything getting shot up but but and it's it's sad you know i think about was it the parkland survivors who became politically active and went out there and did what they did and everything as much as they could like i respect that but i i mean if but if i'm the king of the democratic party and i have to talk to those kids i have to say look guys i'm on your side but Politically, this is not a winning issue right now, and I can have every Democrat in the world go out and say we're going to take away everybody's assault rifles, and we'll lose we'll lose all the elections. I'm you know I'm sorry this isn't this is not a winning issue for for Americans right now. So, okay, so did you see the uh, did you see the interview with Oprah? No, I didn't watch it yet. I just saw that one clip okay. out of it. <clears throat> My suspicion is Oprah is not going to push Kamala on Israel Palestine, for example. <laughs> Probably wrong. I want to watch the. I'll, I'll watch the interview. We, you know, maybe that could be a future episode or something. We could see how that is. But you know, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I I could be wrong, but I don't think that Oprah is. Oprah is not. I mean, she. Was she a, was she originally a reporter back in like the late seventies, early eighties, or something? Was that where she got her start, sort of? I think like local TV news. Yeah, yeah. I think she had her. She was like an anchor, and then I think she moved into having her talk show after that. Yeah, but um, my point is, she has not been a hard hitting professional journalist for a very, 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 very long time. Yeah, I'll agree with that. And. I, you know, I, my concern and my worry about this is that it's just, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be anti-woke or whatever, but it's, it's, you know, it's a powerful black woman interviewing another powerful black woman. And I, I'm just worried that it's going to be a more of like a kind of a you go girl and oh my God, isn't Trump cray cray. Like, I, you know, like as opposed to, you know, the Israel-Palestine issue has been splitting the Democratic Party. How are you going to diverge from Joe Biden's disastrous policies on this? Like, I don't see that question being asked. I think that's the question that needs to be asked, I'm afraid. I We should watch that interview. We should see what it was, how it was. Well, it was being titled as a campaign event, so I don't even know necessarily if you even call it a proper interview. But... <laughs> I didn't know that either. That's my concern. I mean, I think, yeah, that's that's a concern I have. Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, Oprah did give us doctors Phil and Oz, so she has a lot to answer for. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think she's. I think at heart she's a good person, but she is. She does get a little bit on that woo woo stuff and just kind of like hmm. vibes and your feelings and, oh, and kind of like all this stuff. And Williamson also. Marianne Williamson also was, came from that that area. If she gained prominence through connection to Oprah. Okay, well, uh, I have you know, I think I think Marianne Williamson is very smart in certain ways, but she also gets into that the the crystals and the the crazy shit stuff, and I'm just like, no, 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 I can't deal with somebody who's who's doing this stuff. Like, I don't know. 
So, but anyways, it, it sounds like a very friendly interview. And if they're, if yeah. they're billing it as a campaign event, then that tells me this is probably more of a total fluff piece and not an interview at all, hardly. It's just a kind of, how can I ask you questions that are going to make you look great? Mm-hmm. You know? So I don't know. Okay, I haven't seen it. I need to watch it, but that's my that's my worry. So, anyways, again, so this is we're just kind of establishing like what these people needed to do going into this interview, probably, and and probably what they couldn't accomplish. Like, like I know that Trump needs to force some divisive issues on Kamala and the Democratic Party. I think he tries that a little bit with the student loan stuff and stuff like that, but. He doesn't stick with it. He doesn't really hammer it. And he doesn't actually believe in the arguments that he's using to divide. So he can't really, you know, put his all into it. Like he doesn't want student loans to be forgiven. So he can't get too righteously indignant about it, even though the Democrats failed on it. Right. So it's like he throws it out there, but he doesn't really have the, you know, the courage of the conviction to push it home. You're right. Shout out to ABC for the moderator's job 100 times better than cnn okay Uh, yeah yeah i thought they i thought the the moderators did a very pretty good job here for sure like i mean they they asked hard questions they pointed out sometimes when people were lying yes they they tried to bring people back on topic when they totally avoided a, a question um they didn't necessarily do a good job of stopping Trump when he wanted to have always have the last word, but I think it was hurting Trump more than it was helping him actually. So it was kind of a, kind of a wash on that one. Um, and apparently a lot of people find, uh, what's his name? <laughs> David Moyer, Moyer, what's his name? I don't know. It was Muir, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Well, I will, uh, hold on. There's a, not not demure. What about all uh, all uh, defect? No, I don't know. Okay, I can't make the joke. There's a joke. There's a language joke there, but I can't quite get there right now. Um, okay, so apparently he's like a sex symbol or something after the, the debate. Apparently, a lot of people. I thought he was a very strange and average looking dude, and kind of strange in a way. But apparently, he's extremely popular. Mm-hmm. Or he was after directly after the debate. So this was this debate took place in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center, moderated by World News Tonight anchor, managing editor David Moore, 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 Moore. What did you say? I said Muir. Muir. Okay. And ABC News Live Prime anchor Lindsay Davis. Her name was spelled weird. I thought, is it L I N S E Y? I don't think I've ever seen Lindsay spelled without the D. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. So they were they were both doing a pretty good job, I thought. Um, the rules, as far as I know, there's no audience, which is good, I think. Yes. So we don't need a studio audience as of idiots who are cheering and no. booing and whatever they're doing. Like, you know, leave it to the people in their homes in America. Um Apparently, there was a coin flip at the beginning, and Trump won the coin toss. And I think he chose to have the final word or something, right? Is that what I understand? Mm-hmm. Um, and Kamala apparently had chosen to sit on the right side of the stage. Or, like, to Trump's left or something. <laughs> oh, sorry suffering with this cold here um i don't know i think i think that was a thing during the biden debate where biden wanted to sit on that side of the stage or whatever i don't i don't understand why they want to be on that side so much Did it suddenly appeal to republicans I don't know. yeah on the right maybe they know trump's got hard hearing on his left side or something mm. Mm. um Another thing, their their microphones will only be turned on when it's their turn to speak. No pre-written notes were allowed and no audience. So those were some of the rules. Now, and I'd heard people go back and forth on whether or not having no microphones is a good idea or a bad idea. <laughs> because obviously, I think um, uh, Trump was able to trip up Biden quite a bit. Bi- 
quite a bit by interjecting when Biden was trying to answer and stuff and kind of confusing him and stuff and outraging him and stuff. But so I think I would have thought that, you know, Trump would want that. But then then the conventional wisdom seemed to become that uh, the um, having the microphone. Well, I, I heard both sides of the story that having the microphone would help and or hurt Trump in different ways. So I, I think it's kind of a wash as to whether not having the microphones was a good idea or not. As it played out, they were both still able to interject against each other. So it worked out, I think. These were the rules. Yeah. Good rules. Um, at the beginning. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I like it. Good job. I mean, with the fact checks, they only did. I think it was four total. But mm -hmm. they were effective and they were true. And it was four more than CNN did. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's and I, I think it's, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's very fun to see, you know, a lie be called out in the moment because otherwise nobody nobody checks it the next day. So um, interesting at the beginning, Harris approached Trump for a handshake. Mm. Um, um, it was kind of a weird yeah. thing. She said, like, I mean, it was kind of a bold move and Trump didn't seem like he was about to walk across to shake her hand. So he, you know, she looks like the alpha or something in here. He, he's just kind of like, oh, 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 yeah, I'll shake your hand. But then Kamala says, Kamala Harris, accept the debate. I'm like, OK, yeah, we're here. I mean, that's a weird thing to say, I think. Why, why are we saying that? But OK, mm. especially as a greeting. So. OK. Um, yeah, so Lindsey Davis says that President Trump won the to coin toss. He chose to deliver the final closing statement of the evening, which actually I think we'll, we'll find at the end is quite a mistake on his part, actually. <laughs> um, and Vice President Harris selected the podium to the right. Okay. I guess the loser of the coin toss gets to choose which side they want to be on, maybe. And both she and Biden chose to sit on the right side of Trump. Or on the left of Trump, but on the screen, they're on the right. Yes. So, yeah. Um, the first subject, I think, was the economy. Kamala Harris. Let's have a good debate. Have fun. Thank you. Welcome to you both. It's wonderful to have you. It's an honor to have you both here tonight. Good evening. We are looking forward to a spirited and thoughtful debate. So let's get started. I want to begin tonight with the issue that voters repeatedly say is their number one issue, and that is the economy and the cost of living in this country. Vice President Harris, you and President Trump were elected four years ago, and your opponent on the stage here tonight often asks his supporters, are you better off than you were four years ago? When it comes to the economy, do you believe Americans are better off than they were four years ago? So I was raised as a middle class kid. And I am actually the only person on this stage who has a plan that is about lifting up the middle class and working people of America. I believe in the ambition, the aspirations, the dreams of the American people. And that is why I imagine and have actually a plan to build what I call an opportunity economy. Because here's the thing. We know that we have a, a shortage of, of homes and housing. And the cost of housing is too expensive for far too many people. We know that young families need support to raise their children, and I intend on extending a tax cut for those families of $6,000, which is the largest child tax credit that we have given in a long time, so that those young families can afford to buy a crib, buy a car seat, buy clothes for their children. My passion, one of them, is small businesses. I was actually, my mother raised my sister and me, but there was a woman who helped raise us. We call her our second mother. She was a small business owner. I love our small businesses. My plan is to give a $50,000 tax deduction to start up small businesses, knowing they are part of the backbone of America's economy. My opponent, on the other hand, his plan is to do what he has done before which is to provide a tax cut for billionaires and big corporations, which will result in $5 trillion to America's deficit. My opponent has a plan that I call the Trump's sales tax, which would be a 20% tax on everyday goods that you rely on to get through the month. Economists have said that that Trump sales tax would actually result 
for middle-class families and about $4,000 more a year because of his policies and his ideas about what should be the backs of middle-class people paying for tax cuts for billionaires. President Trump, I'll give you two minutes. First of all, I have no sales tax. That's an incorrect statement. She knows that. Uh, we're doing tariffs on other countries. Other countries are going to finally, after 75 years, pay us back for all that we've done for the world. And the tariff will be substantial in some cases. I took in billions and billions of dollars, as you know, from China. In fact, they never took the tariff off because it was so much money they can't. It would totally destroy everything that they've set out to do. They're taking in billions of dollars from China and other places. They've left the tariffs on. When I had it, I had tariffs, and yet I had no inflation. Uh, look, we've had a terrible economy because inflation has, which is really known as a country buster, it breaks up countries. We have inflation like very few people have ever seen before, probably the worst in our nation's history. We were at 21 percent, but that's being generous because many things are 50, 60, 70, and 80 percent higher than they were just a few years ago. This has been a disaster for people, for the middle class, but for every class. On top of that, we have millions of people pouring into our country from prisons and jails, from mental institutions and insane asylums, and they're coming in and they're taking jobs that are occupied right now by African Americans and Hispanics and also unions. Unions are going to be affected very soon. And you see what's happening. You see what's happening with towns throughout the United States. You look at Springfield, Ohio. You look at Aurora in Colorado. They are taking over the towns. They're taking over buildings. They're going in violently. These are the people that she and Biden led into our country, and they're destroying our country. They're dangerous. They're at the highest level of criminality, and we have to get them out. We have to get them out fast. I created one of the greatest economies in the history of our country. I'll do it again and even better. We are going to get to immigration and border security during this debate, but uh, I would like to let Vice President Harris respond on the economy here. Well, I would love to. Let's talk about what Donald Trump left us. Donald Trump left us the worst unemployment since the Great Depression. Donald Trump left us the worst public health epidemic in a century. Donald Trump left us the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. And what we have done is clean up Donald Trump's mess. What we have done and what I intend to do is build on what we know are the aspirations and the hopes of the American people. But I'm going to tell you all in this debate tonight, you're going to hear from the same old tired playbook a bunch of lies, grievances, and name-calling. What you're going to hear tonight is a detailed and dangerous plan called Project 2025 that the former president intends on implementing if he were elected again. I believe very strongly that the American people want a president who understands the importance of bringing us together, knowing we have so much more in common than what separates us. And I pledge to you to be a president for all Americans. President Trump will give you a minute here to respond. Number one, I have nothing to do, as you know, and as she knows better than anyone, I have nothing to do with Project 2025. Uh, that's out there. I haven't read it. I don't want to read it purposely. I'm not going to read it. This was a group of people that got together. They came up with some ideas, I guess some good, some bad. But it makes no difference. I have nothing to do. Everybody knows I'm an open book. Everybody knows what I'm going to do. Cut taxes very substantially and create a great economy like I did before. We had the greatest economy. We got hit with a pandemic. And the pandemic was not since 1917, where 100 million people died, has there been anything like it. We did a phenomenal job with the pandemic. We handed them over a country where the economy and where the stock market was higher than it was before the pandemic came in. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. We made ventilators for the entire world. We got gowns. We got masks. We did things that nobody thought possible. And people give me credit for rebuilding the military. They give me credit for a lot of things, but not enough credit for the great job we did with the pandemic. But the only jobs they got were bounce back jobs. These were jobs bounce back and it bounced back and it went to their benefit but I was the one that created them. They know it, and so does everybody else. Vice President Harris, I'll let you respond. So Donald Trump has no plan for you. 
And when you look at his economic plan, it's all about tax breaks for the richest people. I am offering what I describe as an opportunity economy, and the best economists in our country, if not the world, have reviewed our relative plans for the future of America. What Goldman Sachs has said is that Donald Trump's plan would make the economy worse, mine would strengthen the economy. What the Wharton School has said is Donald Trump's plan would actually explode the deficit. 16 Nobel laureates have described his economic plan as something that would increase inflation and by the middle of next year would invite a recession. You just have to look at where we are and where we stand on the issues. And I'd invite you to know that Donald Trump actually has no plan for you because he is more interested in defending himself than he is in looking out for you. That's just a sound bite. They gave her that to say. Look, I went to the Wharton School of Finance, and many of those professors, the top professors, think my plan is a brilliant plan. It's a great plan. It's a plan that's going to bring up our, our worth, our value as a country. It's going to make people want to be able to go and work and uh, create jobs and create a lot of good, solid money for our, comp for our country. And just to finish off, uh, she doesn't have a plan. She copied Biden's plan, and it's like four sentences, like run, spot, run. Four sentences that are just, oh, we'll try and lower taxes. She doesn't have a plan. Take a look at her plan. She doesn't have a plan. Mr. President, I do want to drill down on something you both brought up. Uh, the vice president brought up uh, your tariffs. You responded, and let's drill down on this, because your plan is what she calls is essentially a national sales tax. Your proposal calls for tariffs, as you pointed out here, on foreign imports across the board. You recently said that you might double your plan, imposing tariffs up to 20 percent on goods coming into this country. As you know, many economists say that with tariffs at that level, costs are then passed on to the consumer. Vice President Harris has argued it'll mean higher prices on gas, food, clothing, medication, arguing it costs the typical family nearly $4,000 a year. Do you believe Americans can afford higher prices because of tariffs? They're not going to have higher prices. What's going to have and who's going to have higher prices is China and all of the countries that have been ripping us off for years. I charge, I was the only president ever, China was paying us hundreds of billions of dollars, and so were other countries. And, you know, if she doesn't like them, they should have gone out and they should have immediately cut the tariffs. But those tariffs are there three and a half years now under their administration. We are going to take in billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. I had no inflation, virtually no inflation. They had the highest inflation, perhaps, in the history of our country, because I've never seen a worse period of time. People can't go out and buy cereal or bacon or eggs or anything else. These, the people of our country are absolutely dying with what they've done. They've destroyed the economy. And all you have to do is look at a poll. The polls say 80 and 85 and even 90 percent that the Trump economy was great, that their economy was terrible. Vice President Harris, I do want to ask for your response. And you heard what the president said there, because the Biden administration did keep a number of the Trump tariffs in place. So how do you respond? Well, let's be clear that the Trump administration resulted in a trade deficit, one of the highest we've ever seen in the history of America. He invited trade wars. You want to talk about his deal with China. What he ended up doing is under Donald Trump's presidency, he ended up selling American chips to China to help them improve and modernize their military, basically sold us out when a policy about China should be in making sure the United States of America wins the competition for the 21st century, which means focusing on the details of what that requires, focusing on relationships with our allies, focusing on investing in American-based technology so that we win the race on AI, on quantum computing, focusing on what we need to do to support America's workforce so that we don't end up having, the, the, on the short end of the stick, in terms of workers' rights. But what Donald Trump did, let's talk about this, with COVID, is he actually t thanked President Xi for what he did during COVID. Look at his tweet. Thank you, President Xi, exclamation point, when we know that Xi was responsible for lacking and not giving us transparency about the origins of COVID. President Trump, I'll let you respond. First of all, they bought their chips from Taiwan. We hardly make chips anymore because of 
philosophies like they have and policies like they have. I don't say her because she has no policy. Everything that she believed three years ago and four years ago is out the window. She's going to my philosophy now. In fact, I was going to send her a MAGA hat. She's gone to my philosophy. But if she ever got elected, she'd change it. And it will be the end of our country. She's a Marxist. Everybody knows she's a Marxist. Her father's a Marxist professor in economics, and he taught her well. But when you look at what she's done to our country, and when you look at these millions and millions of people that are pouring into our country monthly, where it's, I believe, 21 million people, not the 15 that people say, and I think it's a lot higher than the 21, that's bigger than New York State pouring in. And just look at what they're doing to our country. They're criminals. Many of these people coming in are criminals. And that's bad for our economy, too. You know, you mentioned before, we'll talk about immigration later. Well, bad immigration is the worst thing that can happen to our economy. They have, and she has, destroyed our country with policy that's insane. Almost policy that you'd say they have to hate our country. President Trump, thank you. Lindsay. Okay, they always seem to start with the economy, the number one issue to the American voter, I suppose. Then in the next part, she talks about a $50,000 tax deduction to start up small businesses. So, so Bob, if you've got, you know, well over a $50,000 laying around to start up your own business, you may be able to get a tax cut from the Democrat or tax credit from the Democrats, right? Or tax it's deduction. So problem. my problems are over. <laughs> it's a good day for the petty bourgeoisie. <laughs> so that'll that'll save this this race okay um okay then she the, so she talks about this thing these tax deductions tax credits and stuff like that then she talks about my opponent on the other hand has his plan is to do what he has done before which is to provide a tax cut for billionaires and big corporations which will result in a $5 trillion to America's deficit. My, my opponent has a plan that I call the Trump sales tax, which would be a 20% tax on everyday goods that you rely on to get through the month. And I was thinking about this and I'm thinking like, okay, he, he doesn't, he's not gonna put a 20% sales tax on everything we buy. I'm thinking, is she thinking about the, the tariffs? Like that he wants to tariff everything that comes in from outside of America with 20%, right? So I, I made a note, is like, is that what she's referencing here? And it turns out I think I was right. Um, Donald Trump responds, okay, first of all, I have no sales tax. That's an incorrect statement. She knows that. We're doing tariffs on other, other countries. I'm okay, yeah, yeah, that's what she was referencing. Then he goes on, I took in billions and billions of dollars, as you know, from China. In fact, they never took the tariffs off because it was so much money. They can't. They left the tariffs on. Um inflation has which is really known as a country buster it breaks up countries we have inflation like very few people have ever seen before probably the worst in our nation's history we were at 21 percent, but that's being generous because many things are 50 60 70 and 80 percent higher than they were just a few years ago i don't know yeah i'm, I'm outside the country bob how has the inflation been I, I think it's slowly easing. I think the greedflation <laughs> is definitely real, too. And I think people definitely took advantage of real inflation when it was at its peak and jacked up prices. Oh, yeah. Price gouging. Was. So I think that has been a little bit harder to get rid of. But I have seen prices come down on, on a lot of things lately from where they were. So Yeah. I, I will say when I was back in 2022... Like when I would go to a restaurant or something, I was often surprised and disappointed by how much I was spending. Like in Korea, the sales tax or whatever is included in the price that's listed and there is no tipping. Mm -hmm. So the price you see on the menu is the price you pay. Yeah. And it's often a little bit cheaper than in America. So in America, like I'm seeing prices like, oh, OK, this is this is only like, you know, eight dollars. But then after tips and tip and ta taxes and tipping and everything, I'm like, I spent fifteen dollars or something. Or oh, this is like fifteen dollars. And then I spend like twenty, twenty two, twenty five or something. I'm like, Yeah, oh man, this is, you know, they are really nickeling and diming me here I in know. a very annoying way. So I, I I definitely, you know, experienced some of that, I think. And the obviously the tax prices were pretty out of control because that was just within months after the beginning of the uh, war with Ukraine and you know, tax or gas prices were doing what they were doing. 
you know, uh, right. Saudi Arabia was being the fair weather friend that they always are, not controlling things properly. Mm-hmm. So, I you know, I guess there has been inflation, but but I think there's been global inflation in some ways too. So, it's not Definitely. just America. No, I yeah, I think that's the thing that people forget a lot of the time is that this is not just happening here. So, yeah. Um, and but I think the one annoying thing about this that that Trump points out is that these tariffs that he put on places, the 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 Biden administration didn't really undo them. And it, it is kind of annoying, like so many things, like, you know, when, when you're running to replace Trump, you say all this stuff on day one, I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to do that and we're going to undo and we're going to repeal and da, 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 da. But then every time you don't do that, you know, every time you keep a, a, a Trump policy in place, and I'm thinking about things like the uh, the COVID era border, you know, border clock down and everything, which, OK, sure, you know, we want to keep the border locked down because, People moving freely and everything is not great when there's a big COVID outbreak. But the longer you keep that in place, the the harder it makes for you to make the argument that you're fundamentally different from the Republicans when you keep a bunch of their policies in place when it's convenient for you in some way, right? Right. <clears throat> oh. Mm. Okay. Um. I don't know. I, I am curious if there are things that have had seen like 50, 60, 70, and 80 percent uh, inflation rates. I, I'm curious what those items would have been. Uh, I think uh, milk. I think uh, eggs. I okay. Think, uh, bacon. Mm. Meat, yeah, breakfast just, meat, is canceled. Meat, meat in general is very mm. high. Um, but yeah, that's like your staples. You know, things you can't do without. Office supplies as well have been affected. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just think about that for a second. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, man. This yeah, this this cold is kicking my ass here. Mm-hmm. Okay, I got to make myself not laugh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so those things have been affected. That's that's interesting to know. That's. Hard, obviously hard for a lot of people, I'm sure. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Trump continues. He says, on top of that, we have millions of people pouring into our country from prisons and jails, from mental institutions and insane asylums. See, and I once think again, this under, wait, so, all right, so you can read the rest of that quote in a second, but I do think he's confused about the word asylum. Yeah, I think he's talking about think insane asylums talk- versus asylum seekers. I think he's literally... I like, you know, as far as fact checking and stuff from the moderators, I would love for one of the I'd love for David Moore or whatever his name is to jump in there and say, Donald Trump, what do you mean by insane asylums? Like, or what do you mean? They're they're You mean asylum seekers or do you mean what What do you think an asylum seeker is? I would I would just ask, what do you think an asylum seeker is? That's the question that somebody needs to ask this guy. Absolutely. Because it may just be that simple. He doesn't know what the word asylum seeker means. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Then he continues. He says, they are taking over the towns. They are taking over buildings. They're going in violently. They're at the highest level of criminality. So, okay. I know they had that thing. They had the scandal with the, was it in Colorado or somebody somewhere where the, I don't know, the, the landlord, they had a slumlord or something, and then Venezuelan gangs allegedly took over the building and were collecting rent for them or something. I missed that. I don't, I don't believe I've seen that story. Okay. It was a, there was CCTV video of people with assault rifles inside in the hallways of this apartment complex. I don't know. It was a, it was a thing for a couple of days, a news cycle there. Um, then I think Kamala responds with her answer. She says, let's talk about what Donald Trump has left us. Donald Trump left us at the worst unemployment since the Great Depression. Donald Trump left us the worst public health epidemic in a century. Donald Trump left us the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. And what we have done is clean up Donald Trump's mess. Again, I think this is largely correct. 
Um, then she kind of makes a, then she says, but I'm going to tell you all in this debate tonight, you're going to hear from the same old tired playbook, a bunch of lies, grievances, and name calling. What you're going to hear tonight is a detailed and dangerous plan called 20 project 2025 that the former president intends on implementing. If you were elected again, I thought this was a really good strategy. She's, she's setting expectations for the the likely things that Trump is going to do. And I think by mentioning Project 2025, which Trump obviously wants to be, I'm sure he would agree with almost everything in it, but he has to pretend that he hasn't read it and he doesn't know what it's about, which, okay, he doesn't read, so he probably hasn't read it, but I'm sure he would agree with most of what's in it. But um, by, by mentioning that, though, she's going she's gonna to bait him into having to respond to that, which is exactly what he does next. Mm-hmm. So he says, but but I thought it was very smart to set expectations for the kinds of arguments you're going to hear from him all night so that when he does those things, you're kind of listening for them. It's kind of like that, you know, what what Trump did, or no, no, what uh, what Chris Christie did to Marco Rubio with, the you know, he's going to use his canned speech line. Oh, look, see there. He just did it again. Aha. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so at the mention of Project 2025, Trump says. Number one, I have nothing to do, as you know, and as she knows better than anyone, I have nothing to do with Project 2025. That's out there. I haven't read it. I don't want to read it purposely. I'm not going to read it. This was a group of people that got together. They came up with some ideas, I guess some good, some bad, but it makes no difference. I have nothing to do. Everybody knows I'm an open book. (laughs) Okay. So, again, you know, I, I, I didn't read it purposely. So there's he maybe he's going for like a plausible like a, a plausible deniability defense there, and then he's I'm not going to read it. I don't doubt that this guy doesn't read things. No <laughs> so it's you know he's 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 on the defensive. He's denying that he has anything to do with Project 2025. One of the few uh, true sta- I, I'm absolutely <laughs> certain that it's true that Donald Trump will not read the 700 and something page Project 2025 documents. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's not on his to do list necessarily. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in her next answer, I think she kind of teases him and baits him. She said. Um, um, Donald Trump's plan would make the economy worse. Mine would strengthen the economy. What the Wharton School has said is Donald Trump's plan would actually explode the deficit. Okay, so of course she's teasing him because that's that's his alma mater, right? (laughs) So, um, and of course Trump has to take the bait. So that's just a soundbite. They gave her that to say, "Look, I went to the Wharton School of Finance, and many of those professors, the top professors, they think my plan is a brilliant plan. It's the great plan. It's the plan that's going to bring our, you know, yada 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 yada." And at this point, um, okay, at the point where he says that's just a soundbite, they gave her that to say, "Look." For that entire time, his mic was turned off. So <laughs> his mic was turned off. He's not even supposed to be responding to this. But she mentioned the Wharton School disagrees with him, and so he has to he has to attack back because he loved, you know, he loves being associated with the Wharton School. So mm-hmm. and he wants it to be the case that they support him. Um. Then at the end, he said, um, and and just to finish off, she doesn't have a plan. She copied Biden's plan. And it's like four sentences, like run, spot, run, four sentences that are just, oh, we'll try and lower taxes. She doesn't have a plan. <laughs> run, spot, run. This sounds like a Donald Trump cognitive test to me. <laughs> See, spot, run. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then, well, and then David Muir um, confirms that I was right all, again about the 20 percent tax actually being about tariffs on from foreign countries. Um, so that was confirmed. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, a few minutes later, I think by this point in the debate, Kamala has started kind of looking at Trump and smiling and this will continue throughout the debate. Basically, I'm in at, it eventually, sometimes she's smiling cause she's amused or bemused or something. And at times, at times she like looks genuinely concerned and she's kind of tapping into that, uh, that, uh, Tim Walls, you know, these people are weird kind of vibe as far as like, oh my God, this person is unhinged, which is absolutely the correct tack to take with these, uh, with these people, I think. So, 
yeah, good good strategy, I think, on their part. Because, I mean, the whole premise of conservatives is that they are normal and you are the one that is out of line and strange if you don't conform to their, you know, rigid ideas. Yeah. What, you know, it goes any, back to the 1980s, at least, like the moral majority, right? Yeah, well, we're the, we're that, the yeah. silent, moral, was, Christian, that religious. Nixon's, that was Nixon's whole thing, yeah. Okay, was that, yeah. The, that was like the 70s then, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I think Reagan definitely, you know, played on that for sure. But I think Nixon definitely pioneered it. So, yeah, 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 that's I I think it's I think, you know, like you could say, yeah, calling just calling them weird and stuff. I mean, why didn't somebody do it 15, 20, 30 years ago? But I do think these things like you can say that, but I think things have to reach a certain critical mass before, you know, people are willing and ready to hear the argument that they are weird. But I mean, yeah, I think, you know, for most of my life, I've had a feeling that these people are weird. I'm, I'm not in that religious milieu that they're in. Um, I, I know things about the world that people who want, you know, support this war or. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I, I know certain things that other people in some cases don't know. Maybe I'm not saying I'm smarter than everybody or whatever, but like, I mean, I don't know. With the from day one, we had questions about the Iraq war that were that ended up being borne out. Mm-hmm. But when you when you see like 70, 80 percent of the country or something going or however many it was just going, you know, no, they attacked us. He's connected. They got nuclear weapons, maybe. They might nuke Washington. They're connected to Osama bin Laden. And you're just like, you people are weird. It's it's like, this is weird. This is not normal. You're, you're not basing this on any logic or evidence. It's like, what can I say, you know? So it is it is very, like, a relief to see finally that, that message connecting that these people who believe all this crazy shit, they are just weird, and the American people are sick of it. Yeah, it feels like a turning point, I think, because... <clears throat> Obviously, while I agree that Mm -hmm. Trump is an existential threat, I just feel like people get turned off, I think, hearing that blared over and over and over again. And at a certain point, it's like if you've ever had a smoke alarm go off or, uh, you know, the battery thing where it's like beeps intermittently every couple of minutes and until you change it, it's like you can. You can get used Hello. to that if you if you can't get to the store right away to buy a nine volt battery. You can get used to that for a few hours, and you kind of it kind of fades into the background, even though it's jarring and annoying and weird and terrible. You know, it's like you can you can acclimate to a lot if you don't <laughs> realize because like when you like replace it, it's finally like oh, it's like it, you can you can hear the difference now that it's not doing that anymore. But while it's happening, you can you know if you have a couple hours worth of work to do before you can. You know what I mean? Get to the store to buy that battery. You might just have to tune it out for a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, Bob. I'm gonna have to jump outside for one minute here. So I, I may be on the elevator. The connection may get wobbly for a second. But yeah, just like hang on for when I do that. All right. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, but yeah, no, I agree. I also think like sometimes like I think everything is kind of things ebb and flow, right? And probably the moral majority or whatever was a response to something else that was going on in America at that time. And, you know, until we reached a critical mass or things flowed the other way, we couldn't really um, see it as weird. Okay, elevator now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess you could probably see the seeds of that. Obviously, everything has a prelude, but I think... People were so freaked out by World War Two and the Depression and they just came home from World War Two and were like, we're going to do the most normalist things we can for as long as we can. And I think that is what gave us the 50s and which then causes, you know, the backlash of the 60s, which causes the re-backlash of Nixon in the 70s. And, you know, it's like, I think, you know, you can trace it back further, but yeah. I think there's yeah, yeah, there's yeah. an there's an ebb and there's an ebb and a flow to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess yeah. My my main point is it's it's just not something where, you know, Barack Obama could have just said, oh, the Republicans are just weird, like 15, 20 years ago, and people would have been like, oh yeah, he's right, they are weird. I think you know the the audience has to be in a certain place to really to really grok that. I think, and finally they are. Let's see. 
Kamala says Trump's presidency has ended up selling American ships to China to help them improve and modernize their military. Basically sold us out when a policy about China should be in making sure the United States of America wins the competition for the 21st century. I wasn't really aware about this. Trump claims that he somehow he just approved Taiwan to sell these advanced chips to China. I again, I don't really know what's going on there. Sometimes there's so many issues. It's like I wish I knew more details exactly about this one issue, but I kind of don't. Hello. Oh, I was saying, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I'm not sure. Huh? I was saying, I don't know about that. I'm not sure what you were saying. Okay, about the Taiwanese chips mm -hmm. going to China? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a mistake. I think, you know, some of these really advanced chips, I guess they can be used in weapons in a way that, that less advanced chips are not. So it's kind of like a, you know, national security secret or something. Okay, yeah, so Trump said, first of all, they bought their chips from Taiwan. We hardly make chips anymore because of philosophies like they have and policies like they have. I don't say her because she has no policy. Everything that she believed three years ago and four years ago is out the window. She's going to my philosophy now. In fact, I was going to send her a MAGA hat. She's gone to my philosophy. But if she ever got elected, she'd change it, and it will be the end of our country. She's a Marxist. Everybody knows she's a Marxist. Her father's a Marxist professor in economics, and he taught her well. <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely bizarre. Like the guy just he's just riffing. He's like, she she believes what I believe. She's to my way. I'm gonna send her a MAGA hat and then she's gonna change it. Now she's a Marxist. It's like, what do you <laughs> actually believe, man? Is she on your side actually and supporting your policies, or is she like a you know, a crazy pink -o lefty communist? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, let's see. Then he seems to know he's getting off topic when he goes into their criminals. Many of these people coming in are criminals, and that's bad for our economy, too. You mentioned before. We'll talk about immigration later. So he's again here. He's he's at least doing something that he's sort of kind of supposed to be doing, which is steering the conversation towards uh, immigration. Um, he says, he says, well, bad immigration is the worst thing that can happen to our economy. OK, and I'm like, OK, well, what's the proof and evidence of that? It's like, you know, America gets cheap labor who pay into Social Security and taxes, but get nothing back out of it. So they're subsidizing our our social uh, services for for American citizens. So like, you know, OK, you want to talk about certain people are losing jobs. And a lot of times those are jobs that American citizens refuse to do. Like, I don't know. I think, you know, there's a substantive debate to be had there. But, I, you know, obviously this is a debate. This is not the place for that kind of talk. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we're going to get to it about the Haitians, of course. But, um, you know, these small industrial Midwestern cities that have been hollowed out by a number of factors, including globalization and union yeah. bus, um, are being propped up by, and not just immigrant labor, but I mean, when I was at the editor of the Wabash Plain Dealer, I did several stories about foreign companies that were being enticed to come to the area because the manufacturing base of this entire region has been hollowed out. Mm -hmm. And so who do you think is going to revitalize these small Midwestern cities? You know? Yeah. It has to be immigrants. And, and I would also say, like, I mean, everybody who hates immigrants and stuff, have you ever worked at a restaurant? Mm-hmm. I mean, did you ever have like a, you know, a Mexican guy in the kitchen or something or, you know, something Guatemalan washing dishes or something? I mean, did you call ICE on them? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Number one, of course, most of these people are complaining probably didn't work with these people necessarily. But if they did, like, oh, no, you know, oh, my guy Jorge with him, he was cool. He was OK. But like, you know, broadly, it's a problem. You know, it's like, OK. If you if you don't stand on your principles in the 
in the immediate when they, when you're around them or something and you don't recognize it as a as a huge problem. Like I mean, you know, I worked in an Indian restaurant for a couple months one time and yeah, there was a there was a immigrant working there and he was a nice enough guy. Didn't speak English, you know, gave me a chance to practice my Spanish. My Indian boss could speak enough English to basically order commands to him and stuff. <laughs> but um, you know, like it wouldn't even cross anybody's mind like, oh, we should call the police. This guy's working here illegally. Oh, this is bad for our country. Like, I mean, you, nobody thinks about that. Like, that's not what you think in the immediate when you're, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's yeah. just a thing. So, but anyways, I think that was all I had on the economy, which, you know, as again, you can see, and it, it does tie in a little bit, but you could already see Trump trying to turn it towards immigration and not to say, you know, not to say that the economy and immigration aren't connected, but, you know, that was his strategy. Um, the next topic, I believe, is abortion. Oh, boy. So, and... I want to turn to the issue of abortion. President Trump, you've often touted that you were able to kill Roe v. Wade. Last year, you said that you were proud to be the most pro-life president in American history. Then last month, you said that your administration would be great for women and their reproductive rights. In your home state of Florida, you surprised many uh, with regard to your six-week abortion ban because you initially had said that it was too short. And you said, quote, I'm going to be voting that we need more than six weeks. But then the very next day, you reversed course and said you would vote to support the six-week ban. Vice President Harris says that women shouldn't trust you on the issue of, of abortion because you've changed your position so many times. Therefore, why should they trust you? Well, the reason I'm doing that vote is because the plan is, as you know, the vote is they have abortion in the ninth month. They even have, and you can look at the governor of West Virginia, the previous governor of West Virginia, not the current governor, is doing an excellent job. But the governor before, he said the baby will be born and we will decide what to do with the baby. In other words, we'll execute the baby. And that's why I did that, because that predominates, because they're radical. The Democrats are radical in that. And her vice presidential pick, which I think is a horrible pick, by the way, for our country, because he is really out of it. But her vice presidential pick says abortion in the ninth month is absolutely fine. He also says execution after birth. It's execution, no longer abortion, because the baby is born, is okay. And that's not okay with me, hence the vote. But what I did is something for 52 years, they've been trying to get Roe v. Wade into the states. And through the uh, genius and, and heart and strength of six Supreme Court justices, we were able to do that. Now, I believe in the exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. I believe strongly in it. Ronald Reagan did also. 85% of Republicans do exceptions. Very important. But we were able to get it, and now states are voting on it. And for the first time, you're going to see, look, this is a, an issue that's torn our country apart for 52 years. Every legal scholar Every Democrat, every Republican, liberal, conservative, they all wanted this issue to be brought back to the states where the people could vote. And that's what happened. Happened Now, Ohio, the vote was somewhat liberal. Kansas, the vote was somewhat liberal, much more liberal than people would have thought. But each individual state is voting. It's the vote of the people now. It's not tied up in the federal government. I did a great service in doing it. It took courage to do it. And the Supreme Court had great courage in doing it. And I give tremendous credit to those six justices. There is no state in this country where it is legal to kill a baby after it's born. Madam Vice President, I want to get your response to President Trump. Well, as I said, you're going to hear a bunch of lies. And that's not actually a surprising fact. Let's understand how we got here. Donald Trump hand-selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And they did exactly as he intended. And now in over 20 states, there are Trump abortion bans, which make it criminal for a doctor or nurse to provide health care. In one state, it provides prison for life. Trump abortion bans that make no exception even for rape and incest, which understand what that means. A survivor of a crime of violation to their body 
does not have the right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. That is immoral. And one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government, and Donald Trump certainly, should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. I have talked with women around our country. You want to talk about this is what people wanted? Pregnant women who want to carry a pregnancy to term, suffering from a miscarriage, being denied care in an emergency room because the health care providers are afraid they might go to jail, and she's bleeding out in a car in the parking lot? She didn't want that. Her husband didn't want that. A 12 or 13 year old survivor of incest being forced to carry a pregnancy to term. They don't want that. And I pledge to you, when Congress passes a bill to put back in place the protections of Roe v. Wade as president of the United States, I will proudly sign it into law. But understand, if Donald Trump were to be reelected, he will sign a national abortion ban. Understand, in his Project 2025, there would be a national abortion a monitor that would be monitoring your pregnancies, your miscarriages. I think the American people believe that certain freedoms, in particular the freedom to make decisions about one's own body, should not be made by the government. Thank you, Vice President Harris. Well, there uh, she goes again. It's a lie. I'm not signing a ban, and there's no reason to sign a ban, because we've gotten what everybody wanted, Democrats, Republicans, and everybody else, and every legal scholar wanted it to be brought back into the states. And the states are voting, and it may take a little time, but for 52 years, this issue has torn our country apart, and they've wanted it back in the states. And I did something that nobody thought was possible. The states are now voting. What she says is an absolute lie. And as far as the abortion ban, no, I'm not in favor of abortion ban, but it doesn't matter because this issue has now been taken over by the states. Would you veto a na national abortion ban if it came Well, to I won't desk? have to because, again, uh, two things. Number one, she said she'll go back to Congress. She'll never get the vote. It's impossible for her to get the vote, uh, especially now with the 50 50 and essentially 50 50 in both Senate and the House. She's not going to get the vote. She can't get the vote. She won't even come close to it. So it's just talk. You know what it reminds me of when they said they're going to get student loans uh, terminated and it ended up being a total catastrophe. The student loans and then her, I, I think probably her boss, if you call him a boss, he spends all his time on the beach. But look, her boss went out and said, we'll do it again. We'll do it a different way. And he went out, got rejected again by the Supreme Court. So all these students got uh, taunted with this whole thing about this whole idea and how unfair that would have been part of the reason they lost to the millions and millions of people that had to pay off their student loans. They didn't get it for free. But they were saying it's the same way that they talked about that, that they talk about abortion. But if I could just get a yes or no, because you're running me, J.D. Vance has said that you would veto if you did come to your desk. Well, I didn't discuss it with uh, J.D. In all fairness, uh, J.D., uh, and I, I don't mind if he has a certain view, but I think he was speaking for me, but I really didn't. Look. We don't have to discuss it because she'd never be able to get it, just like she couldn't get student loans. They couldn't get student loans. They didn't even come close to getting student loans. They taunted young people and a lot of other people that had loans. They can never get this approved. So it doesn't matter what she says about going to Congress. Well, wonderful. Let's go to Congress. Do it. But the fact is that for years they wanted to get it out of Congress and out of the federal government. And we did something that everybody said couldn't be done. And now you have a vote of the people on abortion. Vice President Harris, I want to give you your time to respond. But I do want to ask, would you support any restrictions on a woman's right to an abortion? I absolutely support reinstating the protections of Roe v. Wade. And as you rightly mentioned, nowhere in America is a woman carrying a pregnancy to term and, and, and asking for an abortion. That is not happening. It's insulting to the women of America. And understand what has been happening under Donald Trump's abortion bans. Couples who pray and, 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 and dream of having a family are being denied IVF treatments. What is happening in our country? Working people, working women who are working one or two jobs, who can barely afford childcare as it is, have to travel to another state 
to get on a plane sitting next to strangers, to go and get the health care she needs, barely can afford to do it, and what you are putting her through is unconscionable. And the people of America have not, the, the majority of Americans believe in a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, and that is why in every state where this issue has been on the ballot, in red and blue states both, the people of America have voted for freedom. Vice President Excuse Harris, me, thank I have you. to respond. Another lie. It's another lie. I have been a leader on IVF, which, which is fertilization. The IVF, I have been a leader. In fact, when they got a very negative decision on IVF from the Alabama courts, I saw the people of Alabama and the legislature two days later voted it in. I've been a leader on it. They know that, and everybody else knows it. I have been a leader on fertilization, IVF. And the other thing, they, you should ask, will she allow abortion in the eighth month, ninth month, seventh month? Come on. Okay, would you do that? Why don't you ask why, her that question? Why don't you answer That's the, the problem. question? Would you because veto? under Roe v. Wade, answer the question, you, could, you, veto? you could do abortions in the seventh month, the eighth month, the ninth That's month, and probably after birth. Just look at the governor, former governor of, of Virginia. The governor of Virginia said we put the baby aside and then we determine what we want to do with the baby. President Trump, thank you. Yeah, I think this is I think this is an area where it does sound better maybe coming from Kamala than Biden because Biden is so you know, he's got so much Catholic guilt around this issue or something. Yeah. So, um, let's see, they, they mention it, they, they, they bring up the topic. Trump goes insane, of course. They have abortion in the ninth month. They even have, you can look at the governor of West Virginia, the previous governor of West Virginia, not the current governor, who's doing an excellent job, but the governor before he said the baby will be born and we will decide what to do with the baby. In other words, we'll execute the baby. <laughs> and I'm like, I sometimes we need to do like a deep dive on that. Who was this mythological former, you know, West Virginia governor who said this? What were they trying to say? What did they really I mean? In the last uh, debate. Yeah, I mean, this has been a talking point for Republicans for years, I feel like. And like, no, I, no, I include the original clip of the. Oh, did you? I love the previous Virginia governor, not West Virginia governor. Okay. Ralph. Northam. I'm sorry. Ralph Northam. Okay. Yeah, I know the name. So, like, what what did he say exactly? Because I, I mean, I, I'm Goodness. maybe I missed that section or something. But what did he say, and what was he trying to say? Right. Uh, I'll have. Clearly, to... he's not talking about like shooting a baby in the head or something after it's been born. Oh, you can't kill babies after they're born. That's illegal. That's... Um, obviously. <laughs> no, not obviously, because Kim, Trump says this all the time. I know these people are. It, it should be obvious, but it, it it apparently isn't to some people. This is not does not happen. That is not legal to do. You can't do that. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me look. Let me look this quote up. All right. He was giving a hypothetical example of what could happen if a mother whose fetus had severe deformities or wasn't otherwise viable requested an abortion while in labor. His comments came in response to a question about whether he supported state legislation that would have loosened restrictions on abortions in, later in pregnancy. Um, let's see. He said, if a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. He was only addressing what happens in cases where a baby is born with severe deformities and has a low chance of survival. Anyway, I was uh, reading from the Associated Press story about it, but I included the original clip in the last episode about the debate. Well, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, like, I'm not going to lie. That's kind of a weird and ambiguous thing to say. Like, I mean, I don't know what they're talking about exactly. It's kind of like poorly worded, but I think that the point is that there are, 
There are no abortions after birth. There are vanishingly few abortions in the third trimester, and the ones that yeah. are are not Usually because health of the mother wanted that to have happened. But mm -hmm. there's health of the mother or severe deformities or no chance of viability. And it's not like somebody just having fun deciding to do that. Not that any of these decisions are fun, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like if it was at like the eighth week or the sixth week or well, something, you know, it's like. I think Lena, Lena, Dunham, Lena Dunham implied that it might be fun. Lena Dunham, I, I shouldn't go on. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> yeah. Not helpful, not helping. No, I should I should keep my opinions about her to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, so that's well, thank you, Bob, as a reporter. There's our context, perhaps, for that quote. So that's what that's what Republicans have been baying about for the past several years. So, I mean, but it sounds I mean, I guess it sounds to me like they're saying if the baby is like basically on life support and is not viable outside of a life support situation. Right. And then they talk to the mother about what to do or something. They keep the baby comfortable, medicated or something. Right. Is that kind of what I'm getting? Maybe. Yes, but I don't even think he's talking about an abortion at that point. I think he's talking about. A, like a do not resuscitate order, which in the case of some of these deformities that are rare but horrific um they have days or hours to live and will die a very painful death assuredly like nobody has like outlasted some of these things you know what i mean yeah and yeah, so it's like you want to just like make this person suffer for the rest of their short life or would you like to let them die qu more quickly with dignity that's yeah. basically it, it kind of turned into that argument you know but it's like yeah. If you force people to go through this, these things can happen. But yeah. Republicans are creating the scenarios that they're warning everyone about. If you can't, if you make it so hard for people or impossible or illegal, or you track their phones or their period tracking apps when they're going to go across state lines and stuff, of course there's going to be later term abortions because you've made it so hard to have it happen in the the time period when it would have been safer for their you know woman yeah yeah they want to create facts on the ground create make a fate accompli or accomplier or however you pronounce it yeah yeah oh well you didn't do it within six months now you know you're pregnant but it's too late i guess you're having this baby oh Oh, there's deformities now. Oh, my gosh, you're doing a late-term abortion? What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is, yeah, it's it's frustrating. And it's, you know, it's understandably a very disturbing and emotional issue for many people. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, even just talking about it is a little bit, you know, upsetting in a way or whatever. But I don't know. These are the things that people have to deal with. And, yeah, it's... And I think it's I think it's also maddening when you're trying to debate Republicans on this because they're like uh, Democrats want to have abortions in the late in the third trimester in the ninth month da 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 and they're like okay well what about you do you believe in abortion no except for rape and incest and life of the mother okay when does life of the mother come up it comes up in the third trimester ninth month <laughs> so are you so I want somebody to hold them down on that so. If the if if the woman's going into labor and it becomes apparent that her life is in danger in the third trimester in the ninth month, do you believe in abortion in that case? Yes or no? Hold them on that answer because like that's they get away with like trying to have it both ways. Like say, oh, Democrats are crazy. They believe in this. I don't believe in that, but I do respect the wife, the life of the mother, mm -hmm. right? That and this is this is the moderate Republican uh, position. But they never get held down by interviewers about it. Like nobody ever checks them and like ask the follow up. OK, but the life of the mother comes up at that time. That's, you know, nobody's dying of a pregnancy in their first trimester, to my knowledge. Right. Like, I mean, that's not when the problems arise. Probably much fewer. Yes. No, the danger rises as the for the mother's health as the date approaches. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, well, Trump continues. Um and and that's why I did that, because that predominates. I think he's saying this attitude that um, executing born babies is is a predominant um, attitude on the Democratic side because they're radical. And her vice presidential pick, 
which I think was a horrible pick, by the way, for our country, because he is really out of it. But her vice presidential pick says abortion in the ninth month is absolutely fine. He also says ab- execution after birth. It's execution, no longer abortion, because the baby is born is OK. I'm like, OK, is there somebody needs to ask him a follow up question? When did when did Tim Wall say this? Do you have evidence of this? Where did he say this? You have to provide evidence. You can't just say this. Yeah. But OK. He said um, he said for 52 years, they've been trying to get Roe versus Wade into the states. What? <laughs> Roe versus Wade is a federal law that supersedes state law. Like, when and how and where have Democrats been trying to get Roe versus Wade into the states? Also, Roe versus Wade is kind of like a stopgap measure. I don't. I think we'd be going for something a little bit more affirmative, rather than just kind of a you know don't ask, don't tell policy as far as abortion and stuff. If we were trying to get it into the states, Mm -hmm. that's just me though. But okay. Um. And then Trump continues, and through the genius and heart and strength of six Supreme Court justices, we were able to do that. Now, I believe in the exception for rape, incest, the life of the mother. I believe strongly in it. 85% of Republicans do. Exceptions, very important. This is what we were just talking about. Like, then you're talking about third trimester, ninth month abortions, Trump. You're, You're trying to have it both ways. You want to blame the Democrats for it, but then you want to advocate the same thing under a different name, right? Like, come on, jeez, <laughs> so maddening. He says, "Look, this is an issue that's torn our country apart for fifty-two years. Every legal scholar, every Democrat, every Republican, liberal, conservative—they all wanted this issue to be brought back to the states where the people could vote, and that's what happened. Happened. Mm-hmm. Lies, 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 lies. This is, uh, you know." I, I think you'll find in the 19, like probably in the 60s and 70s, I don't think that this was such a controversial partisan issue. Mm-hmm. You know, I think with the, you know, with the rise of the religious Christian right in America, the evangelical right, um, that's when this became an animating issue for them. And quite frankly, throughout probably most of the 80s and 90s, like Republicans paid at lip service, but they weren't really, you know, necessarily going falls to the wall to like, uh, you know, to, to totally ban abortion. But they were like, they bring it up every four years during the thing and get the, get the conservative Christians all riled up, keep them on side. And then somehow, you know, probably around the Trump, I uh, mean, the Bush, the first, second Bush era, I would say is when things got a lot more serious, I guess, about this probably. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I don't, nobody was asking for it to go back to the States. I mean, except Republicans, when they thought that having state laws outside of the federal law was the only way that they could have it in certain states, in their states. You know, and and again, they're just trying to pry the door open. They're saying, hey, we want to make exceptions for abortion bans in our red states. But then once they get the Supreme Court, once they get the trifecta of government power, they're like, OK, nationwide abortion ban, tracking mm-hmm. across states tracking your pregnancy, all this crap, like, so that, you know, again, they try to, you, they try to take an inch and then they try to take a mile. They, they, they just want the states. They just want the freedom to choose. They want to let the Republicans vote on it in the states that are Republican. But then once they get enough power, they're like, no, 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 we're going to do a nationwide abortion ban, basically. So, <laughs> and um, it's just, it's, it, it's extremely dishonest. And it's just like the Republican um, partisan Supreme Court nominees when they were up for the thing and they were being interviewed in the House and Senate or whatever about, you know, are you going to ban abortion? Oh, no, I, I respect the uh, the uh, the history of how it's always been done. I, I respect it. I, I, you know, I'm a I'm a I, I respect precedent. Right. And then you had these like that the woman from Maine or Alaska or whoever it was who was naive enough to like, oh, well, they said they're not going to ban abortion. And I believe them. Was it? I forget who that was. Susan Collins, the same person that said Trump had learned his lesson. Yeah, just I mean that per like there should be there should be things that you do that are so stupid that they should be disqualifying from remaining in elect office, and that woman qualifies on on either one of those two things. Time and time like, again, yes. Yeah, 
if you think Trump learned any lesson at any time without really being punished, you're a, you're a fool. And if you believe that these partisan hacks from the uh, what's that conservative legal think tank or whatever that the, the uh, foundation. Uh, no, what what is the um, I don't know. The, the Supreme Court training ground for Republicans or whatever is it the what am I thinking of? Uh, well, it's Leonard Leo, but I don't remember the organization. Okay, okay, yeah. If you think those people, society. the Federalist Society, exactly, yeah. If you think any of these Federalist Society not graduates who are coming up through the, and they have to answer a certain way to get approved, if you think they're not lying, you're fucking naive and you don't belong in power. Right. Get out of the way and put somebody in who knows what's going on. Sorry. So, um, yeah. All right. So anyways, Trump is lying about abortion and who believes what and all this crazy stuff and how he you know, supports some of it, but not the crazy stuff or whatever. And then Lindsay Davis, the uh, moderator, facts checks him. She says there is no state in this country where it is legal to kill a baby after it's born. You know, Madam Vice President, I want to get your response to President Trump. And she goes in, well, I, well, let's understand how we got here. Donald Trump hand-selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe versus Wade. And they did exactly as he intended. And now in over 20 states here, uh, there are Trump abortion bans, which make it criminal, yada, yada, yada. You get the idea. True. Uh, Trump abortion bans that make no exception for rape and incest. Okay. Again, true. So, you know, you can believe what Trump says. He believes in exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Or you can believe what he does, which is he appoints people who, who put this policy in, which doesn't respect those things. So, mm -hmm. um, And then Harris continues. You want to talk about this is what people wanted? Pregnant women who want to carry a pregnancy to term, suffering from a miscarriage, being denied care in an emergency room because the health care providers are afraid they might go to jail and she's bleeding out in a car in the parking lot. She didn't want that. Her husband didn't want that. A 12 year or 13 year old survivor of incest being forced to carry a pregnancy to term. They don't want that. And I pledge yada, yada. I'm very strong, very strong. I think, you know, again, this is the kind of this is the kind of passion on this issue that we were never going to see, I think, from Joe Biden unfortunately so mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me <coughs> um, so that's that's kind of what we saw there and mm -hmm. then she continues um, but understand if donald trump were to be reelected, he will sign a national abortion ban understand in his pro project 2025 there would be a national abortion ban understand in his project 2025 there would be a national abortion a monitor that will be monitoring your pregnancies your miscarriages yeah, et cetera. So again, she's kind of baiting him with the 2025 stuff. And Trump responds, I'm not signing a ban. It's a lie. There's no reason to sign a ban because we've gotten what everybody wanted. Democrats, Republicans, and everybody else and every legal scholar wanted it to be brought back into the states. And the states are voting. And it may take a little time, but for 52 years, this issue has torn our country apart and they've won it back in the states. This is supreme gaslighting. There's no evidence that anybody wanted this back in the States except Republicans when they were out of power. And that's ridiculous that they say that anyway, because like states like Indiana do not have a public proposition process to put questions on the ballot directly. Hmm. Did you not know. Yeah, you can't even do that here. That's why we haven't had. I think that is one of the reasons why we've been so behind on everything. Hmm. Well, Bob. You have to understand, America is a republic, not a democracy. Did you ever hear that? Yeah, so I become more annoyed every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these people, these people, these know nothing. They're like, they think they got you on that. They're like, oh, checkmate, liberal. Oh, what about this? Yeah, it's like uh, it's like this uh, abortion uh, bumper sticker I saw. I've seen it more than once. Um, it's a quote by Ronald Reagan uh, that goes like, I noticed that everyone who is a, who is for abortion was born. <laughs> it's like, zing. <laughs> Facts don't care about your feeling, libtard. <laughs> <laughs> Booyah. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's, it's bizarre. So, 
Um, but anyways, this kind of this gaslighting that, you know, that everybody's happy now. <laughs> well, then why is the world not? Why are you going to why are you going to lose the election behind this issue? Then if everybody's happy, this is you just you just gave everybody exactly what they wanted on abortion. And now you're you're losing female voters left and right and center. Like, why is that? Huh? It's because you're obviously lying. Not everybody wanted this. Most people didn't want this. Again. Republicans are the dog that caught the car on the abortion issue. They they got their ban. They got their invasive government, big government, tracking women's pregnancies and stuff. And by the way, let me just say this about the Apple Watch, which I have. You know, we have so much worry and fear. I think that I'll, there's a lot of paranoia in the world, I think, because of, you know, being observed by our devices, right? And like... Um, you know, they can track our heartbeat, they can track what we're doing online, they can track our financials, our health, et cetera. But my Apple Watch still tells me, oh, would you like to download or, you know, you can activate this uh, this period tracking app. You can you can track your periods. I'm a man. You know, I'm a man. Why are you why are you asking me this? <laughs> like if you've collected one shred of data about me in the last four years that I've had you. Like, why in the world would you be asking a man about a pregnancy tra- or a, a period tracking app? Like, it's just annoying, right? Yeah. It's super annoying. It's like I, I had a similar experience like that at work today. Um, my work email is based in uh, Google Gmail, and it has three suggestions usually that you can mm-hmm. just click on and will be like the response or whatever. Mm. I was trying to set up an interview for next week, and... The person that I was talking to about setting up the interview was like, hey, um, we can do Monday at this time or Wednesday at this time. And then the three suggestions were Tuesday's great. I, I love Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. <it is." laughs> and it's like, hey, you're going to read my email. Like, just pay attention. He didn't say Tuesday. Nowhere in there. That's the one day in between there that he couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. That's- yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, like, I think that's why there's so much paranoia about this tech is like, because they're obviously tracking us. They're obviously like micro targeting us with ads and stuff. Mm-hmm. They're obviously reporting us to the FBI or whoever for whatever we may uh, do. But when it comes to, are you a man or are you a woman? Or, oh, we detected that you're in a foreign country in Korea. So we're going to switch all your websites to Korean language by default. And mm-hmm. you have to annually figure out where to switch the language. Like I've had this, I've had this phone for years. I'm an English speaker. I'm an, I'm a legal alien, as Sting said. <laughs> you know this about me. Act like you know. You know, it's like, it's, it's, you know, this is. I think again, this is something that if they could actually address it, and our phone was actually somewhat smart about the things that mattered, and not just blast, blasting us with ads, like people would probably be slightly less tech phobic or whatever, you know. But they won't do it. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, okay, that's that's an aside. But okay, so yeah, tracking pregnancies and stuff like that, all this crazy shit. Again, Republicans are weird. Um, Lindsey Davis asked Trump, "Would you veto a national abortion ban if it came to?" And Trump interrupts her, "Well, I won't have to because again, two things. Here comes the bloviating. He doesn't want to answer this." Again, this is Project 2025 stuff, right? A national abortion ban, it has to be, right? Mm -hmm. So he interrupts her. He says, well, I won't have to because, again, two things. Number one, she said she'll go back to Congress. She'll never get the vote. It's impossible for her to get the vote, especially now with a 50-50, essentially 50-50 in both Senate and the House. She's not going to get the vote. She can't get the vote, and she won't even come close to it. So it's just talk. You know what it you know what it reminds me of when they said they were going to get student loans terminated and it ended up being a total catastrophe, the student loans. And then her, I think probably her boss, if you call him a boss, he spends all his time on the beach. But look, her <laughs> boss went out and said, we'll do it again. We'll do it in a different way. He went out, got rejected again by the Supreme Court. So all these students got taunted with this whole thing about this whole idea and how unfair that would have been. The question here. OK, the question was about abortion, a national, nationwide abortion ban. Now, I got to respect the the game here from Trump of trying to pivot to a, a divisive issue on the Democratic side. But again, he doesn't stick to it because he doesn't actually believe in student loan forgiveness. So um, just totally he interrupted her, cut her off and then tried to answer and immediately switch the subject. So um, 
Yeah, et cetera. Lindsay Davis, to her credit, comes back and says, but if I could just get a yes or no, because your running mate, J.D. Vance, has said that you would veto it if it did come to your desk. And Trump says, well, I didn't discuss it with J.D. In fairness to J.D. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, I didn't discuss it with J.D. In all fairness, J.D., I, I, and I don't mind if he has a certain view, but I think he was speaking for me, but I really didn't. Look. <laughs> So he totally just threw J.D. Vance under the, I mean, amazing, amazing. Like, you know, can you imagine Biden saying this about publicly about Kamala Harris? Like, you know, she can have her view, but, you know, she said what she said, but that's not what I said. Or Can you imagine that level of disunity on the Democratic side on this thing? Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. He is not probably wishing he had gone with J.D. at this point. Oh, I, I tried to watch uh, that movie. Um, oh, oh, Billy Elegy. Oh, my gosh. How was it? Well, I, I, I don't know. I got to the part where he's in college and he's, you know, he's going. I don't know. It's just. I mean. I don't know. I mean, there are aspects of the story that are. Um, I don't know. You know, like, I mean, it's. It's hard not to be somewhat sympathetic with the version of the person who is presented at the beginning of the movie. I didn't finish the movie yet. I'm about like maybe a quarter of the way in or something like he's just gotten to Harvard and he's going to this fancy dinner. And his his Indian girlfriend is like, you know, telling him which fork to pick up at the table or something and like trying to trying to, you know, turn him from ashy to classy or whatever. You know, it's like I mean, I mean, there's something universal. I mean, like, you know, I'm a country boy. I'm from a small town. In college, I was put in situations with certain people from like certain regions of the country that were more economically um, advantaged or something. And there were, you know, there were codes that I was totally unaware of. So I get it. Like, I get it. But like, you know, this guy's a political scumbag at this point. He's a terrible person. Like, what can I say? Like, I mean, you know, um, I remember when this book came out, I think my mom had sent me a copy of the book. And she said, oh, I've been hearing good things about this book, this hillbilly elegy. It's really interesting. You know. Uh I mean, I'm from the Appalachians. I'm from down in North Carolina out there, the mountains and stuff. So, you know, I mean, like regionally, I'm, you know, not dissimilar from this person in a way. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, whatever. But like, and I, I had some similar experiences perhaps in university as far as, you know, dating people from different cultures and stuff as far as, uh, you know, South Asian or what have you. And like, you know, and being outclassed by certain people in certain areas and stuff and whatever. I, I get it. But like, I don't know. I, I, I think it'd be interesting to, if they interviewed, was it Ron Howard was the director of the movie and say like, you know, look, hello, Mr. You know, Hollywood liberal elite. How do you feel about this, this piece of hagiography that you basically developed for this person who's become a complete political scumbag? <laughs> like, what would you, what do you want to say? I mean, it's your movie. You want to stand by your movie. I get it. You respect your actors. You respect everybody who worked really hard on it. But like, what do you think about the fact that you basically made this movie for this person? Yeah. Who was recommended by, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum Jr. or whatever. <laughs> and is now the shame of the Trump campaign because Trump doesn't really like him and he hasn't helped. And he's thrown his wife up the bus a million times and he's pandering in very disgusting ways and he said some horrible things about women like and you're just like oh he just a poor boy from the country trying to make it in the big old harvard you know like i mean were you did did you get taken were you taken in by this story i mean like uh -huh. you know it was a very popular book when it came out so i mean they were probably taken by that if nothing else sure yes and i i get it but like i don't know i think it gives us a warning here to I I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I I in a way I feel like he he kind of otherized his own people that he came from. You know, like he I, I, he completely sold out his. I mean, I haven't read the book or seen the movie, but I understand what his main points were, and it was not a good look for the people he grew up with. I think he was kind of insulting, right? Yeah, I think I think there's like I mean, there's an element of it. He's trying to tell the story as though he is just one of these people. He's just like the rest of them. And he came from this and this is what he knows. And this is what he grew up with. But at the same time, he's like, he's looking at them and objectively saying like, 
ooh, as an outsider who's gone to Harvard now, I see that, you know, oh, these people fighting each other for nothing and getting pregnant and not working hard and getting a job and getting fired the next day and being on drugs. It's all incredibly irresponsible. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's not really of that milieu. He's he's out. He's from the outside and judging it. You know, so he, he kind of wants to have it both ways, I think. So, yeah. <sighs> And and I think that there's, you know, he's kind of like he's kind of putting his own the, 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 the bad parts of his own place where he came from under the microscope and inviting the rest of America. Come with me and judge this place that I came with. And and in judging this milieu that I came out of, you can be even more impressed by myself, who is totally not like this. And <laughs> I blame them. You can blame them, too, with me. I mean, I, that's the vibe I get from it. You know, like, like yeah. am I wrong? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. Again, I've not read or seen the movie, but that's the general sense I'm getting, you know. Yeah, I mean, having watched about a quarter of the movie, and, and I'll finish the movie eventually. Like, I probably won't enjoy it. I don't know that I'm ever going to actually read the book because I don't think, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so that's that's an aside on on our boy there, uh, J.D. Vance, so, which isn't even his, like, real name. His birth name was something else, like Hamer or something. Like, I mean, uh, I don't know. The whole thing is really weird to me. Definitely. So, um, let's see. So, anyways, they ask Vice, Pre Vice President Harris, I want to give you your time to respond, but I do want to ask, would you support any restrictions on a woman's right to an abortion? So Kamala says, I absolutely support reinstating the protections of Roe versus Wade. And as you rightly mentioned, nowhere in America is a woman carrying a pregnancy to term and asking for an abortion. That is not happening. OK, good, good. The majority of Americans believe in a woman's right to make decisions about her own body. And that is why in every state where this issue has been on the ballot in red and blue states, both the people of America have voted for freedom. And Lindsey Davis says, Vice President Harris, but then Trump cuts her off. Trump needs to have the last word here. He says, excuse me, I, I have to respond. It's another lie. It's another lie. I have been a leader on IVF, which is fertilization, the IF, IVF. I have been a leader. In fact, when they get a very negative decision on IVF from the Alabama courts, I saw the people of Alabama, yada, 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 yada. Okay. And the other thing they you should ask will she allow abortion in the eighth month ninth month seventh month and Kamala Harris says come on and he says would you do that why don't you ask her that question um and Kamala says why don't you answer the question would you veto Trump says that's the problem because under Roe versus Wade and Kamala says answer the question would you veto and Trump says you could do abortions in the seventh month the eighth month the ninth month and Kamala says that's not true and Trump says and probably after birth so and then and Lindsay says uh president trump thank you and that's the end of the uh immigration debate <laughs> so, all right next topic is immigration and border stuff we're going to turn now to immigration and border security we know it's an issue that's important to republicans democrats voters across the board uh, in this country vice president harris you were tasked by president biden with getting to the root causes of migration from central america we know that illegal border crossings reached a record high in the biden administration this past june president biden imposed tough new asylum restrictions we know the numbers since then have dropped significantly. But my question to you tonight is why did the administration wait until six months before the election to act? And would you have done anything differently from President Biden on this? So I'm the only person on this stage who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations for the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. And let me say that the United States Congress, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Senate, came up with a border security bill which I supported. And that bill would have put 1,500 more border agents on the border to help those folks who are working there right now overtime trying to do their job. It would have allowed us to stem the flow of fentanyl coming into the United States. I know there are so many families watching tonight who have been personally affected by the surge of fentanyl in our country. That bill would have put more resources to allow us to prosecute transnational criminal organizations for trafficking in guns, drugs, and human beings. But you know what happened to that bill? Donald Trump got on the phone, called up some folks in Congress, and said, kill the bill. And you know why? Because he'd prefer to run on a problem instead of fixing 
a problem. And understand, this comes at a time where the people of our country actually need a leader who engages in solutions, who actually addresses the problems at hand. But what we have in the former president is someone who would prefer to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And I'll tell you something. He's going to talk about immigration a lot tonight, even when it's not the subject that is being raised. And I'm going to actually do something really unusual. And I'm going to invite you to attend one of Donald Trump's rallies, because it's a really interesting thing to watch. You will see during the course of his rallies, he talks about fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter. He will talk about windmills cause cancer. And what you will also notice is that people start leaving his rallies early out of exhaustion and boredom. And I will tell you, the one thing you will not hear him talk about is you. You will not hear him talk about your needs, your dreams, and your, need, and your desires. And I'll tell you, I believe you deserve a president who actually puts you first. And I pledge to you that I will. Vice President Harris, thank you. President Trump, on that point, I want to get your response. Well, I would like to respond. Let me just ask, though, why did you try to kill that bill, and successfully so? That would have put thousands of additional agents and officers on the border. First, let me respond as to the Please. rallies. She said people start leaving. People don't go to her rallies. There's no reason to go. And the people that do go, she's busing them in and paying them to be there, and then showing them in a different light. So she can't talk about that. People don't leave my rallies. We have the biggest rallies, the most incredible rallies in the history of politics. That's because people want to take their country back. Our country is being lost. We're a failing nation. And it happened three and a half years ago. And what, what's going on here, you're going to end up in World War III, just to go into another subject. What they have done to our country by allowing these millions and millions of people to come into our country and look at what's happening to the towns all over the United States. And a lot of towns don't want to talk. It's not going to be Aurora or Springfield. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country, and it's a shame. As far as rallies are concerned, as far as the reason they go is they like what I say. They want to bring our country back. They want to make America great again. It's a very simple phrase, make America great again. She's destroying this country, and if she becomes president, this country doesn't have a chance of success. Not only success, we'll end up being Venezuela on steroids. I just want to clarify here, you bring up Springfield, uh, Ohio, and, and ABC News did reach out to the city manager there. Uh, he told us there have been no credible reports of specific claims of pets being harmed, injured, or abused by individuals within the immigrant community. Well, All I've this, seen people on television. Let me just say here, this is the... the people on television say my dog was taken and used for food. So maybe he said that, and maybe that's a good yeah. thing to say for a city manager. I'm not taking this from but television. But the people on I'm television say the their dog was eaten by the people that went there. Again, the Springfield city manager says there's no evidence of that. Vice we'll President Harris, out. I'll let you respond to the rest of what you've heard. <laughs> you talk about extreme. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, this is, I think, one of the reasons why in this election I actually have the endorsement of 200 Republicans who have formally worked with President Bush, Mitt Romney, and John McCain, including the endorsement of former Vice President Dick Cheney and Congress member Liz Cheney. And if you want to really know the inside track on who the former president is, if he didn't make it clear already, just ask people who have worked with him. His former chief of staff, a four-star general, has said he has contempt for the Constitution of the United States. His former national security advisor has said he is dangerous and unfit. His former Secretary of Defense has said the nation, the Republic, would never survive another Trump term. And when we listen to this kind of rhetoric, when the issues that affect the American people are not being addressed, I think the choice is clear in this election. President Trump, I'll give you a quick minute to respond yeah. here. Uh, thank you, because when I hear that, see, I'm a different kind of a person. I fired most of those people. Not so graciously. They did bad things or a bad job. I fired them. They never fired one person. They didn't fire anybody having to do with Afghanistan and the Taliban and the 13 people who's, who's were just killed, viciously and violently killed. And I got to know the parents and the family. 
They didn't fire. They should have fired all those generals, all those top people, because that was one of the most incompetently handled situations anybody has ever seen. So when somebody does a bad job, I fire them. And you take a guy like Esper. He was no good. I fired him. So he writes a book. Another one writes a book. Because with me, they can write books. With nobody else, can they? But they have done such a poor job, and they never fire anybody. Look at the economy. Look, how, look at the inflation. They didn't fire any of their economists. They have the same people. That's a good way not to have books written about you. But just to finish, I got more votes than any Republican in history by far. In fact, I got more votes than any president, sitting president, in history by far. Let me continue on immigration. It was what you wanted to talk about earlier. So let's get back to your deportation uh, uh, proposal that the vice president has reacted to as well. Uh, president Trump, you call this the largest domestic deportation operation in the history of our country. You say you would use the National Guard. You say if things get out of control, you'd have uh, no problem using the U.S. With military. Local police, yes. uh, you also said you would use local police. Uh, how would you uh, deport 11 million undocumented immigrants? I know you, you believe that number is, is much higher. Uh, take us through this. What does this look like? Will authorities be going door to door in this country? Yeah, it is much higher because of them. They allowed criminals, many, many millions of criminals. They allowed terrorists. They allowed common street criminals. They allowed people to come in, drug dealers, to come into our country. And they're now in the United States and told by their countries, like Venezuela, don't ever come back or we're going to kill you. Do you know that crime in Venezuela and crime in countries all over the world is way down? You know why? because they've taken their criminals off the street and they've given them to her to put into our country. And this will be one of the greatest mistakes in history for them to allow. And I think they probably did it because they think they're going to get votes, but it's not worth it because they're, they're destroying the fabric of our country by what they've done. There's never been anything done like this at all. They've destroyed the fabric of our country. Millions of people let in and all over the world, Crime is down all over the world except here. Crime here is up and through the roof, despite their fraudulent statements that they made. Crime in this country is through the roof. And we have a new form of crime. It's called migrant crime. And it's happening at levels that nobody thought possible. President Trump, as you know, the FBI says overall violent crime is actually coming down in this country. But Vice excuse President me, the Harris, FBI defraud. They were defrauding statements. They, they didn't include the worst cities. They didn't include the cities with the worst crime. It was a, a fraud, just like their number of 818,000 jobs that they said they created turned out to be a fraud. President Trump, thank you. I'll let you respond, Vice President Harris. Well, I think this is so rich. <laughs> coming from someone who has been prosecuted yeah. for national security crimes, economic crimes, election interference, has been found liable for sexual assault, and his next big court appearance is in November at his own criminal sentencing. And let's be clear, where each person stands on the issue of what is important about respect for the rule of law and respect for law enforcement. The former vice president called for defunding federal law enforcement, 45,000 agents, get this, on the day after he was arraigned on 34 felony counts. So let's talk about what is important in this race. It is important that we move forward, that we turn the page on this same old tired rhetoric and address the needs of the American people, address what we need to do about the housing shortage, which I have a plan for, address what we must do to support our small businesses, address bringing down the price of groceries. But frankly, the American people are exhausted with this same old tired playbook. Vice President Harris, thank you. Excuse me, every one of those cases was started by them against their political opponent. And I'm winning most of them, and I will win the rest on appeal. And you saw that with the decision that came down just recently from the Supreme Court. I'm winning most of them. But those are cases, it's called weaponization. Never happened in this country. They weaponized the Justice Department. Every one of those cases was involved with the DOJ, from Atlanta and Fawny Willis to, to the uh, Attorney General of New York and the DA in New York, every one of those cases. And then they say, oh, he was, he's a criminal. They're the ones that made them go after me. By the way, Joe Biden, 
was found essentially guilty on the documents case. And what happened in my documents case? They said, oh, that's the toughest of them all. A complete and total victory. Two months ago, it was thrown out. It's weaponization, and they used it, and it's never happened in this country. They used it to try and win an election. President They're Trump. fake cases. President Trump, thank you. A really quick response here, Vice President Harris, on this notion of weaponization of the Justice Department. Well, let's talk about extreme and understand the context in which this election in 2024 is taking place. The United States Supreme Court recently ruled that the former president would essentially be immune from any misconduct if he were to enter the White House again. Understand, this is someone who has openly said he would terminate, I'm quoting, terminate the Constitution of the United States, that he would weaponize the Department of Justice against his political enemies. Someone who has openly expressed disdain for members of our military. Understand what it would mean if Donald Trump were back in the White House with no guardrails, because certainly we know now the court won't stop him. We know J.D. Vance is not going to stop him. It's up to the American people Vice President to stop Harris, him. Thank you. Lindsay? Vice President this Harris, in your last run, run for president. We got this is the one that weaponized, not me. She weaponized. I probably took a bullet to the head because of the things that they say about me. They talk about democracy. I'm a threat to democracy. They're the threat to democracy President with a fake Trump. Russia, Russia, Russia investigation we do have a lot that to get, went nowhere. We have a lot to get to. Lindsay? Trump's Trump's home court advantage, perhaps, in the eyes of the American voter. They, they mention how Biden, Kamala mentions how Biden had tried to make a, a, you know, a bill with the, with the Republicans, basically a conservative bill restricting, severely restricting abortion at the border, right? Uh, sorry, uh, immigration at the border, um, et cetera. And she mentions how Trump held it up. She said, but you know what happened to that bill? Donald Trump got on the phone, called up some folks in Congress and said, kill the bill. And you know why? Because he preferred to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. I think that's that's pretty strong. She says, but what we have in the former president is someone who would prefer to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And I'll tell you something. He's going to talk about immigration a lot tonight, even when it's not the subject that is being raised. And I'm going to actually do something really unusual, and I'm going to invite you to uh, attend one of Donald Trump's rallies because it's a really interesting thing to watch. You will see during the course of his rallies, he talks about fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter. He will talk about windmills cause cancer. And he will also notice that, and what you will also notice is that people start leaving his rallies early out of exhaustion and boredom. So this is another she's making him look crazy. She's totally baiting him because she knows he can't abide any questions about his rally size or the the passion of his followers. Right. So this is this is incredible. And so, David Moore, Vice President Harris, thank you. President Trump, on that point, I want to get your response. Trump says, well, I would like to respond. And David Moore says, let's let me ask, just ask, though, why did you try to kill that bill and successfully so? That would have put thousands of additional agents and officers on the border. But Trump takes the bait. First, let me respond as to the rallies. She said people start leaving. People don't go to her rallies. There's no reason to go. And the people that do go, she's bussing them in and paying them to be there, which we know that Donald Trump actually did at his initial, uh, when he initially announced that he was running for president, that's exactly what he did. And I'm sure in time since then, too. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows? But yes, probably. Um, let's see. She's busing them in and paying them to be there and then showing them in a different light. So she can't talk about that. People don't have people don't leave my rallies. We have the biggest rallies, the most incredible rallies in the history of politics. That's because people want to take their country back. Our country is being lost. We're a failing nation. And it happened three and a half years ago. And what what's going on here? We're just going to you're going to end up in World War Three just to go into another subject. Again, this is the, the subject is immigration. <laughs> this should be Trump's home court advantage. But Kamala just successfully baited him with the, the mention of his rallies and people leaving his rallies early and in boredom. And he's awful. 
to the races. He is talking about some other crazy shit. He's defensive about his rallies. Now he's talking about World War III. He's not talking about migrants coming over the border and stealing our jobs and da 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 and poisoning the lifeblood of the, the motherland or what have you. Fatherland, whichever it was in Germany. Um, let's see. The um, in, We're going to end up in World War III. Just, go, just to go into another subject. What they have done to our country by allowing these millions and millions of people to come into our country and look at what's happening to the towns all over the United States. And a lot of what's happening at the towns uh, and a lot of towns don't want to talk, not going to be Aurora or Springfield. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in, they're eating the cats, they're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. <laughs> And um, Kamala kind of reacts and is very amused. And she says, like, come on she, at this point. And Trump continues. And, it, and this is what's happening in our country. Um, and it's a shame. As far as rallies are concerned, as far as the reason they go is li they like what I say. They want to bring the country back. They want to make America great again. It's a very simple phrase. Make America great again. She's destroying this country. And if she becomes president, this country doesn't have a chance of success. Not only success, we'll end up being Venezuela on steroids. <laughs> okay, so again, he's largely responding to her comment about his rallies. But at the same time, he realizes he's supposed to be talking about immigration. So he brings up the cats and the dogs being devoured by Haitian legal immigrants, allegedly. And then talking about America will become Venezuela on steroids. Um, so again, he's he's wildly destabilized. He's lost his he's lost control of his rock and roll here. He's all over the place, and he's not on the issue he's supposed to be on, which is immigration. So that was that was an interesting thing, and I think Kamala uses this tactic of towards the end of her answer, she throws in some little jab that goes directly to what Donald Trump thinks his strengths are, and he can't take it. He has to he has to address what she said there at that moment. He can't let it go, and it works to his disadvantage, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thoughts about that? Oh man, where to begin? Yeah, he totally gets off subject. The dogs, the cats, oh my goodness. Like, I mean, this is like Groundhog's Day, isn't it? Yeah. What, and you, you, gotta, you gotta drop, Bob, you gotta get a soundboard and like drop that sound. Dogs and cats living together. <laughs> what's what's the Bill Murray quote? Yeah, dogs and cats. I think you're talking about Ghostbusters. But yes. Ah, uh, was it? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghostbusters. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it was Bill Murray. Yep. <laughs> you know, they're eating the dogs. They're coming in. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets of the people who live there. Yeah. Well, and he, it's amazing too. Would bring it back to old JD. He's the one that amplified these rumors in the first place. And after people like fact check this and they were like, no, this is not happening. This was all made up Internet stuff. And he was like, it's OK. It wasn't it highlight. It's OK because it highlights a real issue, even though it's like what I said was a total lie. And it like people are now getting bombed and death threats and, um, you know, in my home state. But, you know, it's it feels true. And, and that's what's important. So, yeah. And and wasn't it originally like the I mean, this original rumor came from a uh, neo-Nazi group, wasn't it? Or a white supremacist group? I forget their names. What yeah, they're called. it was like something a, tri blood tribe or something. Is that what they're called? Yeah, it was all these like fifth hand accounts and like uh, people like reposting videos from other places that had nothing to do with what they were talking about and like saying it was happening. That sounds like Twitter today. Propagated, probably whatever, propagated, whatever, spread by Twitter partially. Yeah, undoubtedly. So, or X, if you, if you, I'll X, never call it X. It's never X. It's or never X, X if you're X. nasty. Yeah, if you're real nasty. Yeah. <laughs> so, but my, my point is, I think it was originally done by a known right wing hate group, like white supremacy neo Nazi hate group was the one that originally put this forward. So it's like, you know, what kind of ideological waters is J.D. Vance swimming in where he, he finds this and he, he puts it forward and he doesn't really question where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The moderator, Dave, David Muir, says, I just want to cl clarify here, another fact check. 
you bring up Springfield, Ohio, and ABC News did reach out to the city manager there. He told us there have been no credible reports of specific claims of pets being harmed, injured, or abused by individuals within the immigrant community. Donald Trump says, well, I've seen people on television. David, let me just say here is, let me just say here this, and Trump, Trump interrupts again. The people on television say my dog was taken and used for food. May, so maybe he said that, and maybe that's a good thing to say for a city manager. And David says, I'm not talking about, I'm not taking this from television. I'm taking it from the city manager, Trump says. But the people on television say their dog was eaten by the people that went there. And David says, again, the Springfield city manager says there's no evidence of that. Trump says, we'll find out. David says, hmm. Vice President Harris, I'll let you respond to the rest of what you heard. <laughs> the rest <laughs> of what you heard. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, again, a few minutes ago, Kamala was looking amused and kind of like laughing at him and saying, come on, Trump, you know, come on, Donald, like, don't be like this or what? don't be crazy. At this point, like her face looks genuinely concerned. She's got a very concerned look on her face because this is just getting so depraved. And, and um, so she says, OK, talk about extreme. And she says, I actually have the endorsement of 200 Republicans who have formerly worked with um, President Bush, Mitt Romney and John McCain, including the endorsement of former Vice President Dick Cheney and Congresswoman Liz Cheney, Congressmember Liz Cheney. And if you want to really know the inside track on who the former president is, if he didn't make it clear already, just ask the former pre uh, just ask people who have worked with him. His former chief of staff. Again, Bob, this is in the immigration section. OK, mm -hmm. so now Kamala is again switching it. She's saying Republicans support me. They don't support Trump. People who have worked with Trump don't support Trump. They support me. Right. So she is keeping him. She's she's dangling the catnip in front of him that he can't allow this to go unaddressed. But at the same time, he's not talking about immigration, per se, when, when this is going on. So um, his former chief of staff, a four star general, has said he has contempt for the Constitution of the United States. His former national security advisor has said he hold that thought. Um, is dangerous and unfit. His former Secretary of Defense has said the nation, the Republic, the Republic would never survive another Trump term, and so on. So David says, David Moore says, uh, Trump, I'll give you a quick minute to respond. Yeah, thank you. Because when I hear that, see, I'm a different kind of a person. I fired most of those people, not so graciously. They did bad things or a bad job. I fired them. They never fired one person. They didn't fire anybody having to do with Afghanistan and the Taliban and the 13 people who's, who's were just killed viciously and violently killed. And I got to know the parents and the family. Again, the topic is immigration. <laughs> they should have fired all those generals, all those top people, because that was one of the most incompetently handled situations anybody has ever seen. So when somebody does a bad job, I fire them. And you take a guy like Esper. He was no good. I fired him. So he writes a book. Another one writes a book because with me, they can write books with nobody else. Can they? But they have done such a poor job and they never fire anybody. Look at the economy. Look at the inflation. They didn't fire any of their economists. They have the same people. That's a good way not to have. They have the same people. That's a good way not to have books written about you. But just to clear, just to just to finish a good way. I, I got more votes than any Republican in history by far. In fact, I got more votes than any president, sitting president in history by far. <sighs> um, and David Moore says, let me continue on immigration. <laughs> it was what you wanted to talk about earlier. So um, let's see. <laughs> so and then down below, Trump says, um, OK, yeah, it is much higher because of them. They allowed criminals, many, many millions of criminals. They allowed terrorists. They allowed common street criminals. They allowed people to come in, drug dealers to come into our country, and they are now in the United States and told by their countries like Venezuela, don't ever come back or we're going to kill you. I'm like, OK, even if these are drug dealers, that sounds like an ironclad case for asylum, doesn't it? Yeah. Don't ever come back to in Venezuela or we will kill you. OK, I think we have to grant them asylum, even if they are, you know, selling a little marijuana or something like this is <laughs> This is, there's there's no terrorists. We haven't seen terrorists. I, I don't think that's there's anything that bears that out. So 
Uh, whatever. Okay, so he's back on immigration at least, anyways. So, right. Um, yeah. Later, later he says uh, he has some more fascist rhetoric because they're destroying the fabric of our country by what they've done. They've never been anything done like this at all. They've destroyed the fabric of our country. Millions of people let in. It's called migrant crime, and it's happening at levels that nobody thought possible. David Moore says, President Trump, as you know, the FBI says overall violent crime is coming down in this country. But Vice President, the, and Trump continues, jump, 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 excuse me, the FBI, they were defrauding statements. They didn't include the worst city. They didn't, yada, yada, yada. So, okay. Again, it's statistically known that immigrants, whether illegal or legal or illegal, commit crimes at a lower rate than domestic native born Americans. We all know this, right? This is a known fact. So, I mean, yeah, enough said. Okay. Um, let's see. Kamala says, well, I think this is so rich coming from someone who has been prosecuted for national security crimes, economic crimes, election interference has been found liable for sexual assault. And his next big court appearance is in November at his own criminal sentencing. Um, the former vice president called for, wait, the former vice president called for defunding federal law enforcement. Does she mean the former president? I don't know why she said vice president there. The former vice president called for defunding federal law enforcement. 45,000 agents gets called for de- defunding federal, uh, sorry, get, get this, on the day after he was arraigned on 34 felony counts. Okay, so... Um, so again, like, I mean, okay, so they're still on immigration, supposedly, I think. Um, but now they're shifting to crime and she's immigrant crime, migrant crime, as Trump wants to talk about. But Kamala says, well, Donald Trump's a criminal, right? And she's, she's got the whole prosecutor criminal vibe here. And um, Trump, again, needs to have the last word, gets again distracted from his number one topic of immigration. Excuse me, every one of those cases was started by them against their political opponent. And I'm winning most of them. And I'll win the rest on appeal. They weaponized the Justice Department. And now they say, oh, he was, he's a criminal. They're the ones that made them go after me. By the way, Joe Biden was found essentially guilty on the documents case. And what happened in my documents case? They said, oh, that's the toughest of them all. A complete and total victory. Two months ago, it was thrown out. It's weaponization. Okay, so again, he's talking about himself, his criminal cases, how he feels like he's being politically targeted, Mm -hmm. how he thinks that he and Joe Biden did the same thing with their hiding documents from the FBI or whatever, which has been demonstrably not true, as we've shown, I think, in previous episodes here. I don't know. The man can't stay on topic, even on his number one issue. He's he's just all over the place. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm getting to the point here where I'm just reading a lot of what they said, but it's just like, you know, this is this is what's happening in the debate. Like, it's just it's just so hard to so follow chaotic. the plot with a lot of what he's saying. Yeah. 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 He says that he weaves things together. Did you hear that quote? Um, I don't remember that one per se, but what was he talking about there? from the rally. Uh, it may have been from after the debate. It may have been a couple days ago. But anyway, it was he was like, uh, I do this thing of weaving. And people say, I have English professor friends who say, what you've done is so incredible. And... You talk, drop a little tidbit here, and then you talk about something else, but it all comes back together. (laughs) And I look forward to the debate with her. But what happened, so, with Afghanistan, you know, I do the weave. You know what the weave is? I'll talk about, like, nine different things, and they all come back brilliantly together. And it's like, and friends of mine that are, like, English professors, they say, It's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. But the fake news, you know what they say? He rambled. That's not rambling. When you have, what you do is you get off a subject to mention another little tidbit, then you get back onto the subject, and you go through this, and you do it for two hours, 
and you don't even mispronounce one word. And they say he had 100,000 people. You know, in New Jersey, we had 107,000 people. They never would like to report it, so I say it. But <clears throat> I'm, I'm not doing the quote justice, but that was the, that was the gist of it. But... Okay, yeah, you, maybe you can drop the audio in there. But yeah, that's, yeah, I, I, yeah, that sounds, I mean, there is, like, I mean, Donald Trump, I mean, it's like the way he speaks, when you read it written down, it sounds insane. When you hear him speak, like, you, you know what he's talking about, and you know what he's, I mean, there is an aspect of it that it's, it is kind of like, you know, I don't know, like a subordinate clause or something. I mean, there, he's, he's dropping little asides in there about other things. And if you are trying to read it directly straight through, it's bizarre, but you kind of like, when you hear him talk, you know what he's talking about. So it's, it's again, this, this thing, but, but, you know, to some degree, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's clearly had professional training on how to speak. And so he's able to speak in, uh, kind of like random ways, but ways where, you know, I, I I don't know how to describe it, but there is like, there's an aspect of like, he'll, he'll be talking about one thing and then he'll drop it and mention something else that's unrelated. He does usually find a way to back to the thing that he was supposed to be talking about, but it's, it's very, it feels very chaotic to listen to. So, sorry, I'm going to pop a hot six here. I need some energy. Mm -hmm. Got to keep my energy up. This is not a beer. This is a hot six, hot six purple edition. I love it. Grape flavor. Delicious. What's hot six? Oh, um, sorry. Red Bull. Oh. Mm. Hot six is like a local Korean version of Red Bull, but this is actually Red Bull grape flavor, not hot six. Sometimes you got to ride the bull. Yeah. I haven't had hot six for a long time. <laughs> that's a that's a pun, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Riding the bull, is that an innuendo too? Oh wow. sure. <laughs> huh? Oh sure. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> that's what she said. Okay. Um Speaking of what she said, our next quote comes from Kamala Harris. Understand, this is someone who has openly said he would terminate, I'm quoting, terminate the Constitution of the United States, and he would weaponize the Department of Justice against his political enemies. Understand that it would mean if Donald Trump were back in the White House with no guardrails, because certainly we now know, we know now the court won't stop him. We know G J.D. Vance is not going to stop him. It's up to, you, to the American people to stop him now. Okay. Um, so again, she's, you know, we're wrapping up again, the immigration section and she's basically saying again, you know, he's a criminal. He doesn't want to respect the constitution. There's nobody going to be checking and balancing him. If he's in power again, we have to stop him. So David Moore says, uh, vice president Harris. Thank you, Lindsay. And vice Lindsay Davis says, vice president Harris in your last run for president. And Trump says, Trump needs to have the last word again. He says, this is one the one that weaponized, not me. She weaponized. I took a bullet to the head. I probably took a bullet to the head because of the things that they say about me. They talk about democracy. I'm a threat to democracy. They're, they're the threat to democracy with the fake Russia, Russia, Russia investigation that went nowhere. And David Moore says, we have a lot to get to. Lindsay, <laughs> so now they're changing the topic. Um, Kamala, I mean, they ask Lindsay, Lindsay Davis asked, Harris about changing her positions. He says, you know, President Harris, in your last run for president, you said you wanted to ban fracking. Now you don't. You wanted mandatory government buyback programs for assault weapons. Now your campaign says that you don't. You supported decriminalizing border crossings. Now you're talking about a harder line. Um, I know you say that your values have not changed. So then why have so many of your policy positions changed? Okay. Vice President Harris, in your last run for president, you said you wanted to ban fracking. Now you don't. You wanted mandatory government buyback programs for assault weapons. Now your campaign says you don't. You supported decriminalizing border crossings. Now you're taking a harder line. I know you say that your values have not changed. So then why have so many of your policy positions changed? So my values have not changed, and I'm going to discuss every one of the, at least every point that you've made. But in particular, let's talk about fracking because we're here in Pennsylvania. I made that very clear in 2020. I will not ban fracking. I have not banned fracking as Vice President of the United States. And in fact, I was the tie-breaking vote on the Inflation Reduction Act 
which opened new leases for fracking. My position is that we have got to invest in diverse sources of energy so we reduce our reliance on foreign oil. We have had the largest increase in domestic oil production in history because of an approach that recognizes that we cannot over-rely on foreign oil. As it relates to my values, let me tell you, I grew up a middle-class kid raised by a hard-working mother who worked and saved and was able to buy our first home when I was a teenager. The values I bring to the importance of home ownership, knowing not everybody got handed $400 million on a silver platter and then filed bankruptcy six times, is a value that I bring to my work to say we are going to work with the private sector and home builders to increase 3 million homes, increase by 3 million homes by the end of my first term. My work that is related to having a friend when I was in high school who was sexually assaulted by her stepfather. And my focus then on protecting women and children from violent crime is based on a value that is deeply grounded in the importance of standing up for those who are most vulnerable. My work that is about protecting Social Security and Medicare is based on long-standing work that I have done, protecting seniors from scams. My values have not changed. And what is important is that there is a president who actually brings values and a perspective that is about lifting people up and not beating people down and name-calling. The true measure of the leader is the leader who actually understands the strength is not in beating people down, it's in lifting people up. I intend to be that president. President Trump, your Well, response? first of all, I wasn't given $400 million. I wish I was. My father was a Brooklyn builder, Brooklyn, Queens, and a great father, and I learned a lot from him. But I was given a fraction of that, a tiny fraction, and I built it into many, many billions of dollars, many, many billions. And when people see it, they are even surprised. So we don't have to talk about that. Fracking? She's been against it for 12 years. Uh, defund the police. She's been against that forever. She gave all that stuff up very wrongly, very horribly, and everybody's laughing at it, okay? They're all laughing at it. She gave up at least 12 and probably 14 or 15 different policies. Like, she was big on defund the police. In Minnesota, she went out — wait a minute, I'm talking now, if you don't mind, please. Does that sound familiar? She went out — she went out in Minnesota and wanted to let criminals that killed people, that burned down Minneapolis — she went out and raised money to get them out of jail. She did things that nobody would ever think of. Now she wants to do transgender operations on illegal aliens that are in prison. This is a radical left liberal that would do this. She wants to confiscate your guns, and she will never allow fracking in Pennsylvania. If she won the election, fracking in Pennsylvania will end on day one. Just to finish one thing, so important in my opinion. So I got the oil business going like nobody has ever done before. They took — when they took over, they got rid of it, started getting rid of it, and the prices were going up the roof. They immediately let these guys go to where they were. I would have been five times, four times, five times higher, because you're talking about three and a half years ago. They got it up to where I was because they had no choice, because the prices of energy were, were quadrupling and doubling. You saw what happened to gasoline. So they said, let's go back to Trump. But if she won the election, the day after that election, they'll go back to destroying our country, and oil will be dead, fossil fuel will be dead, we'll go back to windmills, and we'll go back to solar, where they need a whole desert to get some energy to come out of. You ever see a solar plant? By the way, I'm a big fan of solar. But they take 400, President 500 Trump. acres of desert President soil. Trump, we have a These lot are of not good things for the environment, as she understands. Thank you. Kamala answers. She talks about things, things that change, fracking, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, then she mentions the values I bring to the the values I bring to the importance of home ownership, knowing not everybody got handed four hundred million dollars on a silver platter and then filed bankruptcy six times is a value that I bring to my work. And this is in the middle of a very long part where she talks about various things and things that she believes and has believed before and stuff. The overall message being my values have not changed. But she mentions that one thing about she didn't get handed four hundred million dollars. 
Then they go to Lindsey Davis says, President Trump, your response. He says, well, first of all, I wasn't given 400 million. I wish I was. My father was a Brooklyn builder, Brooklyn, Queens, and a great father. And I learned a lot from him. But I was given a fraction of that, a tiny fraction. I built it into many, many billions of dollars, many, many billions. And when... <laughs> um, and again, notice this. <clears throat> the question was about inconsistencies in Kamala Harris's policies from her original runs and her senatorship or whatever to today as vice president in her presidential campaign. This should be fertile ground for Trump's arguments, right? This, mm -hmm. this, is, this is something that he should be drilling down on and trying to keep the focus on that. But she made this one offhand comment in her answer that said she didn't get given 400 million like Donnie was. And he's going to spend his whole time talking about that. Uh, so he, you know, he's exhausting. And he says, and when people see it, they are even surprised. So we don't have to talk about that. Fra OK, so finally he gets back to it. Fracking, she's been against it for 12 years. Uh, defend the police. She's been against that forever. She gave that up. She gave that stuff all very wrongly, very horribly. And everybody's laughing at it. OK, they're all laughing at it. She gave up at least 12 and probably 14 or 15 different policies like she was a big on defend, defund the, pol the, the police. Kamala says that's not true. And Trump says in Minnesota, she went out. Wait a minute. I'm talking now. If you don't mind, please. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and Kamala says, like, <laughs> don't lie. <laughs> she says, don't lie. She went out. She went out in Minnesota and wanted to let criminals that killed people that burned down Minneapolis. She wanted to raise... She went out and raised money to get them out of jail. She did things that nobody would ever think of. Now she wants to do transgender operations on illegal aliens that are in prison. Oh my God. This is <clears throat> at the mouthful of a sentence. Oh, this yeah. is a radical left liberal that would do this. So then he, he just keeps getting more and more in hinge. I mean, like she wants to do transgender, trans, transgender operations on illegal aliens that are in prison. That is like a that is like a conservative orgasm or something. I don't know. Just the, the combination of those issues together. Incredible. Um, he continues down below. They immediately let these guys go to where they were. Um, I think he's talking about immigrants, maybe. Um, I would have been five times, four times, five times higher because you're talking about three and a half years ago. They got it up to where I was because they had no choice. Um, is he? Oh, he's talking about fracking or something. OK, um, let's see. Uh, they got it up to where I was because they had no choice because the prices of energy were quadrupling and doubling. You saw what happened to gasoline. So they said, let's go back to Trump. But. If she won the election, the day after that election, they'll go back to destroying our country and oil will be dead. Fossil fuel will be dead. We'll go back to windmills and we'll go back to solar where they need a whole desert to get some energy to come out. You ever see a solar plant? By the way, I'm a big fan of solar, but they took 400, 500 acres of desert soil. Lindsey De Davis interjects. President Trump, he says, these are not good things for the environment. That she understands. Uh, Lindsey Davis says, President Trump, we have a lot of issues that we have to get to. We're out of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, OK, so he does try to get back onto the Kamala flip flops or something. But our next topic is Trump's favorite January 6th. Lindsey, thank you. We have an election in just 56 days. And I want to talk about the peaceful transfer of power, which, of course, we all know is a cornerstone of our democracy and the role of a president uh, in a moment of crisis. Uh, Mr. President, on January 6th, you told your supporters to march to the Capitol. You said you would be right there with them. Uh, the country and the world saw what played out of the Capitol that day, the officers coming under attack. Aides in the West Wing say you watched it unfold on television off the Oval Office. Uh, you did send out tweets, but it was more than two hours before you sent out that video message uh, telling your supporters to go home. Is there anything you regret about what you did on that day? You just said a thing that isn't covered peacefully and patriotically, I said, during my speech, not later on. Peacefully and patriotically. And nobody on the other side was killed. Ashley Babbitt was shot by an out-of-control police officer that should have never, ever shot her. It's a disgrace. But we didn't do this group of people that have been treated so badly. 
I ask, what about all the people that are pouring into our country and killing people that she allowed to pour in? She was the border czar. Remember that. She was the border czar. She doesn't want to be called the border czar because she's embarrassed by the border. In fact, she said at the beginning, well, I'm surprised you're not talking about the border yet. That's because she knows what a bad job they've done. What about those people? What's, when are they going to be prosecuted? When are these people from countries all over the world, not just South America, they're coming in from all over the world, David, all over the world, and crime rates are down all over the world because of it. But let me but just one ask of those, you. David, when are those people going to be prosecuted? When are the people that burned down Minneapolis going to be prosecuted? Or in Seattle, they went into Seattle, they took over a big percentage of the city of Seattle. When are those people going to be prosecuted? But let me just ask you. You might ask her that question. You were the president. You were watching it unfold on television. It's a very simple question as we move forward toward another election. Is there anything you regret about what you did on that day? Yes or no? I had nothing to do with that other than they asked me to make a speech. I showed up for a speech. I said, I think it's going to be big. I went to Nancy Pelosi and the mayor of Washington, D.C., and the mayor put it back in writing, as you know. I said, you know, this is going to be a very big rally or whatever you want to call it. And again, it wasn't done by me. It was done by others. I said, I'd like to give you 10,000 National Guard or soldiers. They rejected me. Nancy Pelosi rejected me. It was just two weeks ago. Her daughter has a tape of her saying she is fully responsible for what happened. Vice they want to get rid of that tape. It would have never happened if Nancy Pelosi and the mayor of Washington did their jobs. I wasn't responsible for security. Nancy Pelosi was responsible. She didn't do her job. The question was about you as president, not about former Speaker Pelosi. But I do want Vice President Harris to respond here. I was at the Capitol on January 6th. I was the vice president-elect. I was also an acting senator. I was there. And on that day, the president of the United States incited a violent mob to attack our nation's capital, to desecrate our nation's capital. On that day, 140 law enforcement officers were injured, and some died. And understand, the former president has been indicted and impeached for exactly that reason. But this is not an isolated situation. Let's remember Charlottesville, where there was a mob of people carrying tiki torches, spewing anti-Semitic hate. And what did the president then at the time say? There were fine people on each side. Let's remember that when it came to the Proud Boys, a militia, the president said, the former president said, stand back and stand by. So for everyone watching who remembers what January 6th was, I say, we don't have to go back. Let's not go back. We're not going back. It's time to turn the page. And if that was a bridge too far for you, well, there is a place in our campaign for you to stand for country, to stand for our democracy, to stand for rule of law, and to end the chaos, and to end the approach that is about attacking the foundations of our democracy because you don't like the outcome. And be clear on that point. Donald Trump, the candidate, has said in this election there will be a bloodbath if this and the outcome of this election is not to his liking. Let's turn the page on this. Let's not go back. Let's chart a course for the future and not go backwards to the past. Let me just follow up here. It was a different term, and it was a term that related to energy, because they have destroyed our energy business. That was where bloodbath was. Also, on Charlottesville, that story has been, as you would say, debunked. Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, Jesse, all of these people, they covered it. If they go an extra sentence, they will see it was perfect. It was debunked in almost every newspaper, but they still bring it up, just like they bring 2025 up. They bring all of this stuff up. I ask you this. You talk about the Capitol. Why are we allowing these millions of people to come through on the southern border? How come she's not doing anything? And I'll tell you what I would do, and I would be very proud to do it. I would say we would both leave this debate right now. I'd like to see her go down 
to Washington, D.C. during this debate, because we're wasting a lot of time. Go down to, because she's been so bad, it's so ridiculous. Go down to Washington, D.C. and let her sign a bill to close up the border, because they have the right to do it. They don't need bills. They have the right to do it. The president of the United States, you'll get him out of bed, you'll wake him up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right. you'll say, come on, come on down to the office, let's sign a bill. If he, if he signs a bill that the border is closed, all he has to do is say it to the Border Patrol, who are phenomenal. If they do that, the border is closed. Mr. Those president, people are killing many people, wanna, unlike J6. Uh, we talked immigration here tonight. I do want to focus on this next issue to both of you, because it really brings us uh, this into focus, truth uh, in these times that we're living in. Uh, Mr. President, for three and a half years after uh, you lost the 2020 election, you repeatedly uh, falsely claimed that you won, many times saying you won in a landslide. In the past couple of weeks leading up to this debate, uh, you have said, quote, you lost by a whisker, that you, quote, didn't quite make it, that you came up a little bit short. I are said you, that. Are you now acknowledging that you lost in 2020? No, I don't acknowledge that at all. But I you said did that say sarcastically. That. You but know those... that. It was said, oh, we lost by a whisker. That was said sarcastically. Look, there's so much proof. All you have to do is look at it. And they should have sent it back to the legislatures for approval. I got almost 75 million votes, the most votes any sitting president has ever gotten. I was told if I got 63, which was what I got in 2016, you can't be beaten. Uh, the election, people should never be thinking about it. An election is fraudulent. We need two things. We need walls. We need, and we have to have it. We have to have borders, and we have to have good elections. Our elections are bad. And a lot of these illegal immigrants coming in, they're trying to get them to vote. They can't even speak English. They don't even know what country they're in, practically. And these people are trying to get them to vote. And that's why they're allowing them to come into our country. I did watch all of these pieces of video. I, I, I didn't detect the sarcasm. Lost by a whisker. We didn't quite make it. And we should just point out here as clarification, and you know this, you and your allies, 60 cases in front of many judges, many of them no Republican. No judge looked at it. And said they there was said no we didn't have standing. Fraud. Uh, That's the other thing. They said we didn't have standing, a technicality. Can you imagine a system where a person in an election doesn't have standing? The president of the United States doesn't have standing. That's how we lost. If you look at the facts, and I'd love to have you do, you'll do a special on it. I'll show you Georgia, and I'll show you Wisconsin, and I'll show you Pennsylvania, and I'll show you. We have so many facts and statistics, but you know what? That doesn't matter, because we have to solve the problem that we have right now. That's old news. And the problem that we have right now is we have a nation in decline, and they have put it into decline. We have a nation that is dying, David. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, Vice President Harris, uh, you heard the president there tonight. He said he didn't say that, that he lost by whisker. So he still uh, believes uh, he did not lose the election. Uh, that was won by President Biden uh, and yourself. Uh, but I do want to ask you about something that's come up in the last couple of days. This was a post from uh, President Trump uh, about this upcoming election uh, just weeks away. He said, when I win, those people who cheated, and then he lists donors, voters, election officials, he says will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, which will include long-term prison sentences. One of your campaign's top lawyers responded saying, we won't let Donald Trump intimidate us. We won't let him suppress the vote. Is that what you believe he's trying to do here? Donald Trump was fired by 81 million people. So let's be clear about that. And clearly he is having a very difficult time processing that. But we cannot afford to have a president of the United States who attempts, as he did in the past, to upend the will of the voters in a free and fair election. And I'm going to tell you that I have traveled the world as Vice President of the United States, and world leaders are laughing at Donald Trump. I have talked with military leaders, some of whom work with you, and they say you're a disgrace. And when you then talk in this way, in a presidential debate, and deny what over and over again are court cases you have lost because you did, in fact, lose that election, it leads one to believe that perhaps we do not have in the candidate to my right the temperament or, or the ability to not be confused about fact. That's deeply troubling, and the American people deserve better. I'll give you one minute to respond, Mr. President. Let me just tell you about world leaders. Viktor Orban, one of the most respected men, they call him a strong man. He's a, he's a tough person, smart, prime minister of Hungary. They said, why is the whole world blowing up? Three years ago, it wasn't. Why is it blowing up? 
He said, because you need Trump back as president. They were afraid of him. China was afraid. And I don't like to use the word afraid, but I'm just quoting him. China was afraid of him. North Korea was afraid of him. Look at what's going on with North Korea, by the way. He said Russia was afraid of him. I ended the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and Biden put it back on day one, but he ended the XL pipeline. The XL pipeline in our country, he ended that. But he let the Russians build a pipeline going all over Europe and heading into Germany, the biggest pipeline in the world. Look, Viktor Orban said it. He said the most respected, most feared person is Donald Trump. We had no problems when Trump was president. But when this weak, pathetic man that you saw at a debate just a few months ago, that if he weren't in that debate, he'd be running instead of her. She got no votes. He got 14 million votes. What you did, you talk about a threat to democracy. He got 14 million votes and they threw him out of office. And you know what? I'll give you a little secret. He hates her. He can't stand her. Mr. But he President. got 14 million votes. They threw him out. She got zero votes. And when she ran, she was the first one to leave because she failed. And now she's running. I don't understand it, but Mr. I'm President. okay with it because Your time is I up. think Thank we're going to do very well. We've got a lot more to get. Final question is, is there anything you regret about what you did on that day? And Trump says, you just said a thing that isn't covered. Okay, I don't know what that means. Peacefully and patriotically, I said during my speech, not later on, peacefully and patriotically. And nobody on the other side was killed. Ashley Babbitt was shot by an out of control police officer that should have never, ever shot her. It's a disgrace. But we didn't do this group of people that have been treated so badly. Uh, she's the border czar. She said at the beginning, I'm surprised you're not talking about the border yet. OK, so he's, he's calling back to when. When she mentioned that he was going to drag every topic back to the immigration and then he spent most of immigration not talking about immigration. She said at the beginning, I'm surprised you're not talking about the border yet. But that's because she knows what a bad job they've done. And what about these those people? What's when are you they going to be prosecuted? When are they these people from countries all over the world, not just South America? They're coming in from all over the world, David, all over the world. And crime rates are down all over the world be, just because of it. And David Moore says, let me, but let me just ask you, but when are those, David, when are those people going to be prosecuted? When are the people that burned down Minneapolis going to be prosecuted or in Seattle? They went into Seattle. They took over a big percentage of the city of Seattle. When are those people going to be prosecuted? And David says, but let me just ask you, Donald Trump says, you might ask her that question. <laughs> So he's on January 6th. He's trying to go back to immigration and or Black Lives Matter, I think, or <laughs> something. Um, remarkably, you know, playing hide the football or whatever. Hey. <coughs> Just, <clears throat> excuse me. Never, never talking about the topic at hand. Um, then they, they get him back on topic and he says, I had nothing to do with that other than they asked me to make a speech. I showed up for a speech. I said, I think it's going to be big. I said, you know, this is going to be a really very big rally or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it's a riot, an insurrection. And again, it wasn't done by me. It was done by others. I wasn't responsible for security. Nancy Pelosi was responsible. She didn't do her job. David Moore says, the question was about you as president, not about former Speaker Pelosi. But I do want Vice President Harris to respond here. Uh, Kamala Harris says, on that day, 140 law enforcement officers were injured and some died. And understand the former president has been indicted and impeached for exactly that reason. So for everyone watching who remembers what January 6th was, I say we don't have to go back. Let's not go back. We're not going back. It's time to turn the page. And if that was a bridge too far for you, well, there's a place in our campaign for you to stand for country, to stand for our democracy, to stand for rule of law and to end the chaos and to end the approach that is about attacking the foundation of our democracy because you don't like the outcome. And be clear on that point. Donald Trump, the candidate, has said in this election there will be a bloodbath if this and the outcome of this election is not to his liking. Let's turn the page on this. Let's not go back. Let's chart a course for the future and not go backwards to the past. 
Okay, so, you know, pretty strong monologue. And she also threw in the quote about the bloodbath, which I think Trump is going to have to respond to because he thinks he was misquoted on that or something, or he thinks it was the context was different than the way that she used it or something. So mm-hmm. David Moore says, let, let me just follow up there. And Donald Trump says, he has to have the last word. I have said bloodbath. Uh, he said, I, I have said blood bash, bath. It was a different term, but it was a term that related to energy because they're, they have destroyed our energy business. That was where bloodbath was. Also, on Charlottesville, that story has been, as you would say, debunked. Laura Ingraham, Sean Hannity, Jesse, all of these people, they covered it. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry. Um, all of these people, they've covered it. If they go an extra sentence, they will see it was perfect. It was debunked in almost every newspaper, but they still bring it up, just like they bring up 2025 up. They bring out all this stuff up. I will ask you this. You walk in, you walk about the Capitol, or you talk about the Capitol. Why are we allowing these millions of people to come through on the southern border? How come she's not doing? And I'll tell you what I would do, and I would be very proud to do it. I would say we would both leave this debate right now. I'd like to see her go down to Washington, D.C. during this debate because we're wasting a lot of time. Go down to because she's been so bad and it's so ridiculous. Go down to Washington, D.C. and let her sign a bill to close up this border. The president of the United States, you'll get him out of bed. You'll wake him up at four o'clock in the afternoon. You'll say, come on, come on down to the office. Let's sign a bill. If he if he signs a bill that the border is closed, all he has to do is say it to the Border Patrol, who are phenomenal. If they do that, the border is closed. Uh, Mr. President, David Moore tries to interject. Those people are killing people, many people, unlike January 6th. <laughs> David Moore says, we already talked about immigration here tonight. <laughs> so, again, just like the goofy talk down to, to Biden, like, you wake him up at four o'clock in the afternoon. You'll say, come on, come on down to the office. Let's sign a bill. <laughs> it's like he's talking to a child or something. Come on, this will be fun, Grandpa. <laughs> it's just like Trump. I mean, Trump missed his calling as a stand-up comedian, frankly. Mm. Unintentionally, he became one. Um, so, so David Moore reminds him that they're already finished with, he missed his chance to talk about immigration as much as possible. And as Kamala pointed out, he keeps trying to bring it back to immigration. So they, so they spent the time, and, and Donald Trump has been absolutely all over the place doing many things when they were supposed to be talking about Kamala Harris's inconsistencies, right? So now, David Moore says, we talked about immigration. Truth in these times that we're living in, Mr. Pre- President, for three and a half years after you lost the 2020 election, you repeatedly falsely claimed that you won, many times saying you won in a landslide. In the past couple of weeks leading up to this debate, you have said, quote, you lost by a whisker, that you, quote, didn't quite make it, and that you came up a little bit short. And Donald Trump says, I said that? He says, are you now acknowledging that you lost in 2020? No, I don't acknowledge that at all. But you did say that. I said that sarcastically. You know that. It was said, oh, we lost by a whisker. That was said sarcastically. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Um, I was told if I got, I was told if I got 63, which was what I got in 2016, you can't be beaten. The election, people should never be thinking about an election as fraudulent. We need two things. We need walls. We need, and we have to have it. We have to have borders and we have to have good elections. Our elections are bad. And a lot of these illegal immigrants coming in, they're trying to get them to vote. They can't even speak English. They don't even know what country they're in practically. And these people are trying to get them to vote. And that's why they're allowing them to come into our country. Okay, so David Moore says, I did watch all of these pieces of video. I didn't detect the sarcasm. Lost by a whisker. We didn't quite make it. And we should just point out as clarification you and you know this you and your allies 60 cases in front of many judges many of them no judge ever looked at it trump interjects uh and david morgan and said there was no widespread fraud okay um trump goes off on this uh we have so many facts and statistics and you know what that doesn't matter because we have to solve the problem that we have right now and that's old news 
And the problem that we have right now is that we have a nation in decline and they have put it into decline. We have a nation that is dying, David. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> president, thank you. Vice President Harris, we heard the president there tonight. He said he didn't say that he lost by a whisker. So he still believes he did not lose the election, that he won by President Biden and yourself. That was won by President Biden and yourself. He said, when I win, those people who cheated, and then he lists donors, voters, election officials, he says, will be prosecuted to the full ex extent of the law, which will include long-term prison sentences. One of your campaign's top lawyers responded saying, we won't let Donald Trump intimidate us. We won't let him suppress the vote. Is that what you believe he's trying to do here? Harris says, Donald Trump was fired by 81 million people. So let's be very clear about that. And clearly, he is having a very difficult time processing that. Uh, so again, she's she's correct, and she's baiting him a little bit. And I'm going to tell you that I have traveled the world as vice president of the United States, and world leaders are laughing at Donald Trump. I have talked with military leaders, some of whom worked with you, and they say you're a disgrace. It leads one to believe that perhaps we do not have in the candidate to my right the temperament or the ability to be to not be confused about fact. That's deeply troubling, and the American people deserve better. <laughs> and, um, David Moore says, I'll give you one minute to respond, Mr. President. Let me just tell you about world leaders. Victor Orban, one of the most respected men, they call him a strong man. He's a tough person, smart, prime minister of Hungary. They said, why is the whole world blowing up? Three years ago, it wasn't. Why is it blowing up? He said, because you need Trump back as president. They were afraid of him. China was afraid. And I don't like to use the word afraid, but I'm just quoting him. China was afraid of him. North Korea was afraid of him. Look at what's going on with North Korea, by the way. He said Russia was afraid of him. I ended the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and Biden put it back on day one. <laughs> but he ended the XL pipe, yada, yada, yada. He goes off on some other thing about oil. Look, Viktor Orban said it. He said the most respected, most feared person is Donald Trump. We had no problems when Trump was president. But when this weak, pathetic man that you saw at a debate just a few months ago, that if it weren't in that, that if he weren't in that debate, he'd be running instead of her. She got no votes. He got 14 million votes. What you did, you talk about a threat to democracy. He got 14 million votes. 14 million. I'm like, Biden got a hell of a lot more than 14. What are we talking about? 14 million. I think he's talking about the primary. Ah, OK, OK, OK. All right. He got 14 million votes and they threw him out of office. And you know what? I'll give you a little secret. He hates her. He can't stand her. <laughs> and David Moore says, Mr. President, he says, but he had 14 million votes. They threw him out. She got zero votes. And when she ran, she was the first one to leave because she failed. And now she's running. I don't understand it, but I'm OK with it because I think we're going to do pretty well. <laughs> OK, so that makes more sense. He's talking about in the primary Kamala didn't really go anywhere in the primary and Biden at least got 14 million votes, you know, giving him some legitimacy. Um, and David Moore says, Mr. President, your time is up. We've got a lot more to get to. OK, so now they move to Israel, Palestine, which is, again, I think an issue that Trump could have made hay out of if he was not basically ideologically uh, more or less in the same place as the Democrats as far as supporting Israel no matter what. Turning now yes. to the Israel-Hamas war and the hostages who are still being held, Americans among them. Vice President Harris, in December you said, quote, Israel has a right to defend itself, but you added, quote, it matters how, saying international humanitarian law must be respected, Israel must do more to protect innocent civilians. You said that nine months ago. Now an estimated 40,000 Palestinians are dead. Nearly 100 hostages remain. Just last week, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said there's not a deal in the making. President Biden has not been able to break through the stalemate. How would you do it? Well, let's understand how we got here. On October 7, Hamas, a terrorist organization, slaughtered 1,200 Israelis. Many of them young people who were simply attending a concert. Women were horribly raped. And so absolutely, I said then, I say now, Israel has a right to defend itself. We would. And how it does so matters. 
because it is also true, far too many innocent Palestinians have been killed, children, mothers. What we know is that this war must end. It must when end immediately, and the way it will end is we need a ceasefire deal and we need the hostages out. And so we will continue to work around the clock on that, work around the clock also understanding that we must chart a course for a two-state solution. And in that solution, there must be security for the Israeli people and Israel and in equal measure for the Palestinians. But the one thing I will assure you always, I will always give Israel the ability to defend itself, in particular as it relates to, as it relates to Iran and any threat that Iran and its proxies pose to Israel. But we must have a two-state solution where we can rebuild Gaza, where the Palestinians have security, self-determination, and the dignity they so rightly deserve. Uh, President Trump, how would you negotiate with Netanyahu and also Hamas in order to get the hostages out and prevent the killing of more innocent civilians in Gaza? If I were president, it would have never started. If I were president, Russia would have never, ever, I know Putin very well, he would have never, and there was no threat of it either, by the way, for four years, have gone into Ukraine and killed millions of people when you add it up. Far worse than people understand what's going on over there. But when she mentions about Israel, all of a sudden, she hates Israel. She wouldn't even meet with Netanyahu when he went to Congress to make a very important speech. She refused to be there because she was at a sorority party of hers. She wanted to go to the sorority party. She hates Israel. If she's president, I believe that Israel will not exist within two years from now. And I've been pretty good at predictions, and I hope I'm wrong about that one. She hates Israel. At the same time, in her own way, she hates the Arab population because the whole place is going to get blown up. Arabs, Jewish people, Israel, Israel will be gone. It would have never happened. Iran was broke under Donald Trump. Now Iran has $300 billion because they took off all the sanctions that I had. Iran had no money for Hamas or Hezbollah or any of the 28 different uh, spheres of terror. And they are spheres of terror, horrible terror. They had no money. It was a big story, and you know it. You covered it very well, actually. They had no money for terror. They were broke. Now they're a rich nation. And now what they're doing is they're spreading that money around. Look at what's happening with the Houthis and Yemen. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. This would have never happened. I will get that settled and fast, and I'll get the war with Ukraine and Russia ended. If I'm president-elect, I'll get it done before even becoming president. Vice President Harris, he says you hate Israel. That's absolutely not true. I have my entire career and life supported Israel and the Israeli people. He knows that. He's trying to, again, divide and, and distract from the reality, which is it is very well known that Donald Trump is weak and wrong on national security and foreign policy. It is well known that he admires dictators, wants to be a dictator on day one, according to himself. It is well known that he said of Putin that he can do whatever the hell he wants and go into Ukraine. It is well known that he said when Russia went into Ukraine, it was brilliant. It is well known he exchanged love letters with Kim Jong-un. And it is absolutely well known that these dictators and autocrats are rooting for you to be president again because they're so clear. They can manipulate you with flattery and favors. And that is why so many military leaders who you have worked with have told me you are a disgrace. That is why. We understand that we have to have a president who is not consistently weak and wrong on Vice national president security, Harris. including the importance of upholding and respecting in highest regard our military. Vice President Harris, thank you. They're the ones, and she's the one that caused it, that's weak on national security by allowing every nation last month for the year, 168 different countries sending people into our country. Their crime rates are way down. Putin endorsed her last week, said, I hope she wins. And I think he meant it. 
because what he's gotten away with is absolutely incredible. It wouldn't have happened with me. The leaders of other countries think that they're weak and incompetent, and they are. They're grossly incompetent. And I just ask one question. Why does Biden go in and kill the Keystone Pipeline and approve the single biggest deal that Russia's ever made, Nord Stream 2, the biggest pipeline anywhere in the world going to Germany and all over Europe? Because they're weak and they're ineffective. And Biden, by the way, President gets paid Trump, a lot of money. Thank you. We have a lot of issues to get to. This could be the, this is the kind of issue that I almost would have expected Trump in 2016 to kind of outflank to the left of the Democrats on populism on. But he's not there now. Um, Kamala Harris is mentioning that on October 7th, women were horribly raped. I don't. Did you follow the debunking of the screams without sounds or whatever it was that the New York Times re report on the rapes? Vaguely, uh, you'll have to remind me. Um, well, I mean, from what I, again, this is all this is all somewhat getting memory hold, but I think that the there were no credible descriptions that anyone was raped on the day that this happened, right? Like that some people had tried to say that they had seen somebody getting raped or something. Um, there, there were no firsthand accounts. Like, I, again, I don't know. I think there was, th this report was outsourced by a, a very high level um, New York Times reporter to basically some activists in Israel to do the reporting themselves. They were misquoting and mis, mis, um, Bob, you're the journalist guy. You should, you should get into this a little bit because like they were, they were talking to a victim's family who had died. She had been burned or something. And they, the, the family had no inkling that their, their loved one had been raped, but the, the report said that she had been raped and they said, well, no, there's no way she was raped. Like, like we had a, we had a phone call with her husband, like, you know, at like whatever, whatever time it was, 52 minutes. And then at, like one minute after the hour, he called back and said, she's dead. And like, no, she got killed. She was not raped within those nine minutes or whatever that you're talking about. So it's, I, again, okay. Again, I don't want to, that, that could be a whole other episode or something, but there was a, a major anyways, I don't know. I think it's interesting that she's mentioning this because there have been several cases where the Biden administration has continued to, to put forward, um, factually disproven, details about October 7th, I think. And that was that was one of them there. So um, Kamala says, I said then, I say now, Israel has a right to defend itself. We would. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, they have the right to defend themselves. They don't have the inclination. <laughs> They'd rather have their soldiers not on the border with Gaza. They'd rather have them over stealing land in the West Bank for these radical settlers, right? So, yeah. OK, yes, yes. It's such a truism. Yes. Israel has a right to defend itself. They have the technology. They have the soldiers. They have everything they need. But they chose not to on that day to some degree. So um, she says, because it is also true that far too many innocent Palestinians have been killed, children and mothers. OK, both sides. Um, and in that solution, there must be security for the Israeli people and Israel and an equal measure for the Palestinians. OK. Hmm. Um, I will always give. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm listening. Oh, sorry. I, I was getting some feedback or something there. Um, on the one, the one thing I will assure you always, I will always give Israel the ability to defend itself in particular as it relates to Iran and any threat from uh, that Iran and its proxies pose to Israel. OK, so that's not really about Iran. That's about Iran and everybody. That's about, you know, Hezbollah, Hamas, anybody who's opposing Islamic Jihad, any, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, anybody who may or may not be a threat to Israel that could in any way be connected to Iran. So it's, it's not really just about protecting from Iran. Um, Let's see. President Trump, how would you negotiate with Netanyahu and also Hamas in order to get the hostages out and prevent the killings of more innocent civilians in Gaza? He says, if I were president, it would have never started. If I were president, Russia would have never, ever. I know Putin very well. He would have never. And there was no threat of it either, by the way, for four years, have gone into Ukraine and killed millions of people when when you add it up. 
far worse than people understand what's going on over there. But when she mentions about Israel, all of a sudden, she hates Israel. She wouldn't even meet with Netanyahu when he went to Congress to make a very important speech. So this is when Netanyahu came to give a, a an address to mostly Republicans in Congress in opposition to the re-election of Joe Biden and in support of Trump's policies, right? Oh, at that moment, yeah, of course Kamala Harris is not going to meet the asshole. <laughs> she refused to go there because she was at a sorority a party of hers. She wanted to go to the sorority party. She hates Israel. If she's president, I believe that Israel will not exist within two years from now. And I've been pretty good at predictions, and I hope I'm wrong about this one. She hates Israel. At the same time, in her own way, she hates the Arab population because the whole place is going to get blown up. Arabs, Jewish people, Israel, Israel will be gone. It would have never happened. Iran was broke under Donald Trump. Now Iran has $300 billion because they took off all the sanctions that I had. Iran had no money for Hamas or Hezbollah or any of the 28 different spheres of terror. And they are spheres of terror, horrible terror. They had no money. It was a big story, and you know it. You covered it very well, actually. <laughs> they had no money for terror. They were broke. Now they're a rich nation. And now what they're doing is spreading that money around. Look at what's happening with the Houthis and Yemen. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. This would have never happened. I will get that settled and fast. And I'll get the war with Ukraine and Russia ended. If I'm president-elect, I'll get it done before even becoming president. That's not legal. Of course not. You, you, you can't, I mean, it's not legal, but it's a repeated thing that Republicans do where they try to negotiate behind the backs of a Democratic uh, president um, with an enemy of America. Uh, frankly, I mean, offhand, I can mention, I'm pretty sure that, uh, what can we say, Nixon... Sure. When Nixon negotiated with the uh, with the the Econ. with well, no, he he negotiated with the uh, South Vietnamese government to um, not achieve peace. Scuttle the before peace he talks. became president, so that he could try to get them a better deal after he had yeah. become president. So again, he's negotiating behind the back of the 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 exiting Democratic administration to prevent and extend the war in a way that was disadvantageous for everybody because he thought he could get a better deal. It's a violation of some law. I mean, I forget exactly what the law is, but there's a, there's a, it's a, it's illegal for citizens of America who are not elected or who are not in power in the government to negotiate with foreign adversaries against the interest of the government in power. It's a very clear law, but that was a case where they did that. I believe also, um, you know, Richard Nixon, um, Iran, uh, Iran hostages, the Logan, the Logan Act. Yes, the Logan Act. There you go. So again, again, this is something where repeatedly Richard Nixon did it behind uh, what's his name, um, Texas. What's his name? Vice President of JFK, LBJ. Uh, LBJ, yeah. When LB, LBJ was on his way out, Nixon negotiated with the South Vietnamese not to accept a peace deal that they were they were going to get because he thought he could get them a better deal. Extending the war, which eventually, of course, went into Cambodia and Laos, leading to the Khmer Rouge and the, the killing fields, etc. Jimmy Carter was working with the about getting the, the hostages home from Iran, which is obviously an election issue. Um, I believe that uh, it's been shown that uh, Ronald Reagan negotiated with secretly with the Iranians to not give the hostages back until he came into power so that he could take credit for that instead of Jimmy Carter and now Donald Trump is sitting here exactly and saying, look, you know, it, if I'm elected before I even become president, I will call Zelensky and Putin and Netanyahu and whoever. And I'm going to solve all these problems while I'm not even president before. I'm pre this is, a, as you said, a Logan Act violation. This is he's, he's sitting here set, like this is where somebody needs to do a fact check. Like President Trump, it's illegal. You this would be you'd be in violation of the Logan Act if you attempted this. What are you talking about? You don't even know what the law is, so. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. One of my pet peeves. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Uh, Lindsey Davis asks, Vice President Harris, he says you hate Israel. Okay. And Kamala Harris is married to a Jewish man, as I understand, right? I don't know exactly what her personal beliefs are, religiously, but whatever. But, like, you know, it's very hard to believe that she... 
I don't know. I'm I'm somewhat hoping that she's going to be a little bit more in the in the mo- model of Barack Obama, somebody whose you know tendencies lie maybe a little bit less, you know, automatically with Israel, but she's a mainstream Democrat in the year 2024. I, I don't think she hates Israel, and she's married to a Jewish man. I I don't think she hates Israel. Okay. Kamala Harris says, that's absolutely not true. I have my entire career and life supported Israel and the Israeli people. He knows that. He's trying to, again, divide and distract from the reality, which is it is very well known that Donald Trump is weak and wrong on national security and foreign policy. It is well known that he admires dictators. He wants to be a dictator on day one, according to himself. It is well known that he said of you, Putin, that he can do whatever the hell he wants and go into Ukraine. It is well known that when he said that Russia went into Ukraine, it was brilliant. It is well known he exchanged love letters with Kim Jong-un. And it is absolutely well known that these dictators and autocrats are rooting for you to be president again because they're so clear. They can manipulate you with flattery and favors. So here she's baiting Trump again with a very commonly known belief. And that is why so many military leaders have who you have worked with have told me you are a disgrace. That is why... <laughs> You almost, I mean, you feel like she's channeling, you know, Fred Trump or something or whoever Trump's father was or whatever, you know, the, you, Donald, you're a disgrace. Everybody who works with you knows you're a disgrace. You know, you, you, you can feel her like channeling dad and her angry, abusive father energy at Trump to kind of bait him into having to take this. So um, every, they told me you're a disgrace. That is why we understand that we have to have a president who is not consistently weak and wrong on national security including the importance of upholding and respecting in highest regard our military. Um, Let's see. So Trump, let's see. Um, They're the ones, and she's the one that caused it. That's weak on national security by allowing every nation last month for the year, 168 different countries sending people into our country, immigration, okay? Their crime rates are way down. I think he means other countries, not America. Putin endorsed her last week, said, I hope she wins. And I think he meant it. He was absolutely being sarcastic. If you saw the interview, even the interviewer responded sarcastically. She, the, uh, whatever. Uh, Because what he's gotten away with is absolutely incredible. Meaning Putin, I think. Again, again, Trump is not really describing who his subjects are in these sentences, but you have to kind of infer it from from the context. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, it wouldn't have happened with me. The leaders of other countries think that they're they're weak and incompetent. The Bidens, I guess. And they are. They're grossly incompetent. And Biden, by the way, he finally, he keeps rambling. He says, and Biden, by the way, Lindsay says, President Trump got paid a lot of money Thank you. We have a lot of issues to get to. Okay. Now, okay, so that was the entire debate about Israel-Palestine. Now, you know, yeah, Kamala got some zingers in on him. She reiterated her report for Israel. Okay. Did she, did she answer, did anybody answer any substantive questions about the, what they're going to do there? What it would take to stop this war? No. How many people have been killed? How many civilians have been killed on the other side? No. How Kamala Harris may have to reach out and uh, placate the people who uh, want the, basically the ethnic cleansing or the genocide or whatever you want to call it to stop? No, she didn't, you know. Again, these were all things that Trump could have forced that issue into, but he didn't, nobody did. Kamala didn't have to answer these questions. So, you know, I, I think it's, Yes, it's, there's a lot of victories. Trump looks unhinged. Kamala looks presidential. And yet policy questions were not answered, right? Not at all. Huh? Not at all. No no yeah. policy was discussed. Yeah, and that's that's this is the thing like you know, as much as, you know, you know, Kamala does her thing here and she, you know, she 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 bosses she she's like a boss or whatever she just she ruins trump emotionally and psychologically and stuff and it's it's fun to watch on that that you know just pure like blood sport uh gladiatorial level 
it's coming to some degree because of the unseriousness, perhaps, of the entire MAGA ideology. We're not answering questions that need to be answered about America's role in the world, how much control we have over these countries that are supposedly subservient to us. I mean, you know, it's just it's this we're we're all losing. I would just say, in a way, even if we win, we're kind of losing this one. So, um, I don't know. Any other things on Israel, Palestine? The next topic is Ukraine and Russia. Yeah. No, it's let's just get on to <laughs> to Ukraine. Chris, Chris Bob's like, a, I don't want to touch that hot hot potato. No, no, thank you very much. I won't pass that. That's fine with me. So Ukraine and Russia. We're going to continue here, and I want to turn to the war in Ukraine. We're now two and a half years uh, into this conflict. Mr. President, it has been the position of the Biden administration that we must defend Ukraine from Russia, from Vladimir Putin, to defend their sovereignty, their democracy, that it's in America's best interest to do so, arguing that if Putin wins, he may be emboldened to move even further into other countries. You have said you would solve this war in 24 hours. You said so just before the break tonight. How exactly would you do that? And I want to ask you a very simple question tonight. Do you want Ukraine? to win this war. I want the war to stop. I want to save lives that are being uselessly people being killed by the millions. It's the millions. It's so much worse than the numbers that you're getting, which are fake numbers. Look, we're in for 250 billion or more because they don't ask Europe, which is a much bigger beneficiary to getting this thing done than we are. They're in for $150 billion less because Biden and you don't have the courage to ask Europe like I did with NATO. They paid billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars when I said, either you pay up or we're not going to protect you anymore. So that's maybe one of the reasons they don't like me as much as they like weak people. But you take a look at what's happening. We're in for 250 to 275 billion. They're into 100 to 150. They should be forced to equalize. With that being said, I want to get the war settled. I know Zelensky very well, and I know Putin very well. I have a good relationship, and they respect your president, okay? They respect me. They don't respect Biden. How would you respect him? Why? For what reason? He hasn't even made a phone call in two years to Putin. Hasn't spoken to anybody. They don't even try and get it. That is a war that's dying to be settled. I will get it settled before I even become president. If I win, when I'm president-elect, and what I'll do is I'll speak to one, I'll speak to the other, I'll get them together, that war would have never happened. And in fact, when I saw Putin after I left, unfortunately left because our, our country has gone to hell. But after I left, when I saw him building up soldiers, he did it after I left. I said, oh, he must be negotiating. It must be a good, strong point of negotiation. Well, it wasn't, because Biden had no idea how to talk to him. He had no idea how to stop it. And now you have millions of people dead, and it's only getting worse, and it could lead to World War III. Don't kid yourself, David. We're playing with World War III, and we have a president that we don't even know if he's — where is our president? We don't even know if he's a president. And, and just to clarify they here — They threw him out of a campaign like a dog. We don't even know. Is he our president? But we have a president, Mr. president that doesn't know he's alive. Your time is up. It would, just to clarify in the question, do you believe it's in the U.S. best interest for Ukraine to win this war, yes or no? I think it's the U.S. best interest to get this war finished and f just get it done. All right. Negotiate a deal, because we have to stop all of these human lives from being destroyed. I want to take this to Vice President Harris. I want to get your thoughts on uh, support for Ukraine in this moment, but also as commander in chief, if elected, how would you deal with Vladimir Putin? And would it be any different from what we're seeing from President Biden? Well, first of all, it's important to remind the former president, you're not running against Joe Biden, you're running against me. I believe the reason that Donald Trump says that this war would be over within 24 hours is because he would just give it up. And that's not who we are as Americans. Let's understand what happened here. Um, I actually met with Zelensky a few days before Russia invaded tried through force to change territorial boundaries to defy one of the most important international rules and norms, which is the importance of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I met with President Zelensky. I shared with him American intelligence about how he could defend himself. Days later, I went to NATO's eastern flank, to Poland and Romania. 
And through the work that I and others did, we brought 50 countries together to support Ukraine in its righteous defense. And because of our support, because of the air defense, the ammunition, the artillery, the javelins, the Abrams tanks that we have provided, Ukraine stands as an independent and free country. If Donald Trump were president, Putin would be sitting in Kyiv right now. And understand what that would mean, because Putin's agenda is not just about Ukraine. Understand why the European allies and our NATO allies are so thankful that you are no longer president and that we understand the importance of the greatest military alliance the world has ever known, which is NATO, and what we have done to preserve the ability of Zelensky and the Ukrainians to fight for their independence. Otherwise, Putin would be sitting in Kyiv with his eyes on the rest of Europe, starting with Poland. And why don't you tell the 800,000 Polish Americans right here in Pennsylvania how quickly you would give up for the sake of favor and what you think is a friendship with what is known to be a dictator who would eat you for lunch. Vice President Harris, thank you. We've heard from both of you on Ukraine tonight. Afghanistan came up in the last hour. I, I wanted her to respond to something you said earlier. And I'll, please, I'll, I'll give you a minute here. Putin would be sitting in Moscow, and he wouldn't have lost 300,000 men and women, but he would have been sitting in Moscow. Quiet, please. He would have been sitting in Moscow much happier than he is right now. But eventually, you know, he's got a thing that other people don't have. He's got nuclear weapons. They don't ever talk about that. He's got nuclear weapons. Nobody ever thinks about that. And eventually, uh, maybe he'll use them, and maybe he hasn't been that threatening. But he does have that, something we don't even like to talk about. Nobody likes to talk about it. But just so you understand, they sent her to negotiate peace before this war started. Three days later, he went in and he started the war because everything they said was weak and stupid. They said the wrong things. That war should have never started. She was the emissary. They sent her in to negotiate with Zelensky and Putin, and she did. And the war started three days later. And that's the kind of talent we have with her. She's worse than Biden. In my opinion, I think he's the worst president in the history of our country. She goes down as the worst vice president in the history of our country. But let me tell you something. She is a horrible negotiator. They sent her in to negotiate. As soon as they left, Putin did the invasion. President Trump, thank you. You did bring up something. You said she went to negotiate with Vladimir Putin. Vice President Harris, have you ever met Vladimir Putin? Can you clarify tonight? Yet again, I said it at the beginning of this debate, you're going to hear a bunch of lies coming from this fellow. And that is another one. When I went to meet with President Zelensky, I've now met with him over five times. The reality is it has been about standing as America always should, as a leader upholding international new rules and norms, as a leader who shows strength, understanding that the alliances we have around the world are dependent on our ability to look out for our friends and not favor our enemies because you adore strongmen instead of caring about democracy. And that is very much what is at stake here. The President of the United States is commander in chief and the American people have a right to rely on a president who understands the significance of America's role and responsibility in terms of ensuring that there is stability and ensuring we stand up for our principles and not sell them for the, for the benefit of personal flattery. Uh, David Moyer asked Trump, you have said that you would solve this war in 24 hours. You said so just before the break tonight. How exactly would you do that? And I want to ask you a very simple question tonight. Do you want Ukraine to win this war? That's a very incisive question, I think. Yeah, I think it's an question. open secret. Trump doesn't want Ukraine to win the war, basically. Absolutely. And actually, I'm, I'm afraid to say, I think it's also an open, se uh, an open question whether Biden really wants Ukraine to decisively win this war, or does he just want them to, you know, kind of, keep bleeding things along on both sides, dragging everybody down. So that's a, I, I would like to see, you know, frankly, an American administration that was interested in quickly and decisively wrapping this thing up. I think it's pretty clear that nuclear weapons are not going to fly. You know, I'll eat my hat if I turn out to be wrong on that. 
we'll talk, they'll save that for another day. But, you know, at this point we need to just, you know, we could, we could put things in a position where Russia could no longer continue. They should just do it. I think. Okay. That's my opinion. Um, but so again, David Moore asks, do you want Ukraine to win this war? <clears throat> Donald Trump says, I want the war to stop. Notice that total avoidance of the question. Do you want Ukraine to win? I want the war to stop. I want to save lives that are being useful, uselessly, people being killed by the millions. It's the millions. It's so much worse than the numbers that they're getting, but which are fake numbers. Um, it starts talking about funding NATO. They paid billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars when I said, Either you pay up or you're not going to we're not going to protect you anymore. So that may be one of the reasons they don't like me as they as much as they like weak people. The Biden Harris administration. With that being said, I want to get the war settled. I know Zelensky very well and I know Putin very well. I have a good relationship and they respect your president. OK, they respect me. They don't respect Biden. How would you respect him? Why? For what reason? He hasn't even made a phone call in two years to Putin. Hasn't spoken to anybody. They don't even try and get it. That is a war that's dying to be settled. Such a weird, that is a war that's dying to be settled. That is, I mean, is this guy a beat poet? What is he, I mean, like, is he a, is this a poetry slam? What are we doing? Right. Um, I will get it settled before I even become president. Again, this is illegal. If I win when I'm president elect and what I'll do is I'll speak to one, I'll speak to the other, I'll get them together. That war would have never happened. And in fact, when I saw Putin after I left, unfortunately left because our country has gone to hell. But after I left, when I saw him building up soldiers, he did it after I left. I said, oh, he must be negotiating. It must be a good, strong point of negotiation. Well, it wasn't because Biden had no idea how to talk to him. He had no idea how to stop it. And now you have millions of people dead and it's only getting worse and it could lead to World War Three. Don't kid yourself, David. We're playing with World War Three and we have a president that we don't even know if he's where is our president. We don't even know if he's a president. Hmm. And David Moore says, and just to clarify here, Donald Trump says they threw him out of the campaign like a dog. We don't even know. Is he our president? But we have a president. David Moore says, Mr. President, that doesn't know he's alive. Your time is up. Just to clarify the question, do you believe it's in the U.S. best interest for Ukraine to win this war? Yes or no? I think it's in the U.S. best interest to get this war finished and just get it done. All right. Negotiate a deal because we have to stop all of these human lives from being destroyed. Okay, So he absolutely won't say that he wants Zelensky or Ukraine to win. He's he's just bloviating about a variety of things and like, oh, I have a better relationship with everybody. Millions of people have died. I don't know if millions of people have died. I don't know how many have died. I think they say Russia's lost like half a million troops or something. I don't know what the death has been like in Ukraine exactly, all told. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the idea that this is going to lead to World War III and that nuclear weapons could be brought into it, I think these are Russian talking points. I want to get your thoughts on support for Ukraine in this moment and also as commander-in-chief, if elected, how would you deal with Vladimir Putin and would it be any different from what we're seeing from President Biden? OK, again, this is another one of those important questions, I think. Are you going to differentiate a Harris presidency from a Biden presidency? She doesn't want to answer these kinds of questions. I think that's mar- I think that's largely why she's been avoiding the press largely. And he's asking it. So good on him. Um, Kamala Harris says, well, first of all, it's important to remind the former president You're not running against Joe Biden. You're running against me. I believe that the reason Donald Trump says that this war would be over within 24 hours is because he would just give it up. She's not wrong. She's avoiding the question, though. How would you be different from Biden? Mm -hmm. Um, She talks about she had gone to, you know, meet Zelensky before the invasion and try to beef him up and everything, warn him and stuff. Um, She says, if Donald Trump were president, Putin would be sitting in Kiev right now. Understand why the European allies and our NATO allies are so thankful that you are no longer president, that we understand the importance of the greatest military alliance the world has ever known, which is NATO. Otherwise, Putin would be sitting in Kiev with his eyes on the rest of Europe, starting with Poland. And why don't you tell the 800,000 Polish Americans right here in Pennsylvania 
how quickly you would give up for the sake of favor and what you think is a friendship with what is known to be a dictator who would eat you for lunch. Okay, so she's, again, she's avoided the question, but she's baiting him again. She's saying, oh, you know, he doesn't respect you. He's going to eat you for lunch. You think he's your friend, all this stuff. Uh, Vice President Harris, thank you. We heard from both of you on Ukraine tonight. Afghanistan came up in the last hour. I want to her to respond to something you said earlier. And Trump says, I have to respond. <laughs> Please, I'll, I'll give you a minute here. Putin would be sitting in Moscow and he wouldn't have lost 300,000 men and women, but he would have been sitting in Moscow. Kamala Harris says something inaudible. <laughs> and Trump continues with a bunch of rushing talking points. Quiet, please. He would have been sitting in Moscow much happier than he is right now. But eventually, you know, he's he's got a thing that other people don't have. He's got nuclear weapons. They don't ever talk about that. He's got nuclear weapons. Nobody ever thinks about that. And eventually, uh, maybe he'll use them. Maybe he hasn't been that threatening. But he does have that. Maybe we don't even like to talk about it. Nobody likes to talk about it. But just so you understand, they sent her to negotiate peace before this war started. Three days later, he went in and he started the war because everything they said was weak and stupid. They said the wrong things. That war should have never started. But she was the emissary. They sent her in to negotiate with Zelensky and Putin. And she did. And the war started three days later. David Morrison, vice president. And that's the kind of talent we have with her. She's worse than Biden. In my opinion, I think she's the he's the worst president in the history of our country. She goes down as the worst vice president in the history of our country. But let me tell you something. She is a horrible negotiate, negotiator. They sent her in to negotiate. As soon as they left, Putin did the invasion. President Trump, thank you. You did bring up something. You said she went to negotiate with Vladimir Putin. Vice President Harris, have you ever met Vladimir Putin? Can you clarify tonight? Kamala says, yet again, I said it at the beginning of this debate, you're going to hear a bunch of lies coming from this fella. And that is another one. When I went to meet with President Zelensky, I've met with him over five times. The reality is it has been about negotiating. It has been about standing as America always should as a leader upholding international rules and norms as a leader who shows strength. OK, so here she's starting to bait Trump again as a leader who shows strength, understanding that the alliances we have around the world are dependent on our ability to look out for our friends and not favor our enemies because you adore strong men stand, instead of caring about democracy. And then she keeps going and then she baits him again um, in terms of ensuring that there is stability and ensuring we stand up for our principles and not sell them out for the benefit of personal flattery. So, you know, Trump's going to have to take the bait. David Moore says, uh, We've talked about Ukraine and Vladimir Putin. I do want to talk about Afghanistan. It came up in the first hour of this debate. Donald Trump, David, one thing. Uh, I want to move on to Afghanistan. Secretary General Stoltenberg said Trump did the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He got these countries, the 28 countries at the time, to pay up. He said, I've never seen. He's the head of NATO. He said, I've never seen. For years, we were all paying almost all of NATO. We were being ripped off by European nations, both on trade and on NATO. I got them to pay up. Um, saying one of the statements you made before, if you don't pay, we're not going to protect you. Dave Moore says, President Trump. Trump continues, otherwise we would have never gotten it. He said it was one of the most incredible jobs he's ever seen done. And at this point, Kamala is smiling and she's just kind of shaking her head in amusement because it's, you know, it's just so easy to bait Trump into just getting very defensive about things and lying and everything. So... At this point, David Moore moves on to Afghanistan. We've talked about Ukraine and Vladimir Putin. I do want to talk about Afghanistan. It came up in, in the first hour of this debate. I, I, I want to move on to Afghanistan. Stoltenberg said Trump did the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He got these countries, the 28 countries at the time, to pay up. He said, I've never seen. He's the head of NATO. He said, I've never seen. For years, we were paying almost all of NATO. We were being ripped off by European nations, both on trade and on NATO. I got them to pay up by saying one of the statements you made before, if you don't pay, we're not going to protect you. President Otherwise, Trump. we would have never gotten it. He said it was one of the most incredible jobs that he's ever seen done. Thank you. I want to turn to Afghanistan. It came up in the first hour of the debate, and we witnessed a, a poignant moment today on Capitol Hill honoring the soldiers who died in the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. I do want to ask the vice president, uh, do you believe you bear any responsibility in the way that withdrawal played out? Well, I will tell you, I agreed with President Biden's decision to pull out of Afghanistan. Four presidents 
said they would, and Joe Biden did. And as a result, America's taxpayers are not paying the $300 million a day. We were paying for that endless war. And as of today, there is not one member of the United States military who is in active duty in a combat zone in any war zone around the world the first time this century. But let's understand how we got to where we are. Donald Trump, when he was president, negotiated one of the weakest deals you can imagine. He calls himself a deal maker. Even his national security advisor said it was a weak, terrible deal. And here's how it went down. He bypassed the Afghan government. He negotiated directly with a terrorist organization called the Taliban. The negotiation involved the Taliban getting 5,000 terrorists, Taliban terrorists, released. And get this, no, get this. And the president at the time invited the Taliban to Camp David, a place of storied significance for us as Americans, a place where we honor the importance of American diplomacy, where we invite and receive respected world leaders. And this former president, as president, invited them to Camp David because he does not again appreciate the role and responsibility of the president of the United States to be commander in chief with a level of respect. And this gets back to the point of how he has consistently disparaged and demeaned members of our military, fallen soldiers, and the work that we must do to uphold the strength and the respect of the United States of America around the world. Vice President Harris, thank you. President Trump, your response to her saying that you began the negotiations yeah, thank with the you. Taliban. So if you take a look at that period of time, the Taliban was killing our soldiers, a lot of them, with snipers. And I got involved with the Taliban because the Taliban was doing the killing. That's the fighting force within Afghanistan. They don't bother doing that because, you know, they deal with the wrong people all the time. But I got involved. And Abdul is the head of the Taliban. He is still the head of the Taliban. And I told Abdul, don't do it anymore. You do it anymore. You're going to have problems. And he said, why do you send me a picture of my house? I said, you're going to have to figure that out, Abdul. And for 18 months, we had nobody killed. We did have an agreement negotiated by Mike Pompeo. It was a very good agreement. The reason it was good, it was we were getting out. We would have been out faster than them, but we wouldn't have lost the soldiers. We wouldn't have left many Americans behind, and we wouldn't have left, we wouldn't have left $85 billion worth of brand new, beautiful military equipment behind. And just to finish, they blew it. The agreement said you have to do this, 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 and they didn't do it. They didn't do it. The agreement was was terminated by us because they didn't do what they were supposed to I, do. I want to move and on. And these people did the worst withdrawal and, in my opinion, the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. And by the way, that's why Russia attacked Ukraine, because they saw how incompetent she and her boss are. President Trump, thank you. Thank you. I want to turn to Afghanistan. I do want to ask Vice President, do you believe you bear any responsibility in the way that that withdrawal played out? Kamala Harris says, well, I will tell you, I agree with President Biden's decision to pull out of Afghanistan. Four presidents said they would. Joe Biden did. As a result, America's taxpayers are not paying the $300 million a day we were paying for that endless war. Um, she continues on. She starts baiting Donald Trump again. Donald Trump, was, when he was president, negotiated one of the weakest deals you can imagine. She's totally baiting him. He calls himself a deal maker. Even his national security advisor said it was a weak, terrible deal. He bypassed the Afghan government. He negotiated directly with a terrorist organization called the Taliban. The negotiation involved the Taliban getting 5,000 terrorists, Taliban terrorists released. And get this, no, get this, and the president at the time invited the Taliban to Camp David, a place of storied significance for us as Americans, a place where we honor the importance of American diplomacy and we invite and respected world leaders. And this, and here she pauses for great effect, and this former president, as president, invited them to Camp David because he does not, again, appreciate the role and responsibility of the president of the United States to be commander-in-chief with a level of respect. Okay. 
So she is she's thrown enough chum in the water that Trump is, you know, not going to be able to probably stay on topic here. All right. Vice President Harris, thank you. President Trump, your response to her saying that you began the negotiations with the Taliban. Um, Trump steps on David's question before he can even finish it. He says, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. I got involved with the Taliban because the Taliban was doing the killing. That's the fighting force within Afghanistan. Uh, they don't bother doing that because, you know, they deal with the wrong people all the time. But I got involved and Abdul is the head of the Taliban. He is still the head of the Taliban. And I told Abdul, don't do it anymore. You do it anymore. You're going to have problems. And he said, why do you send me a picture of my house? And I said, you're going to have to figure that out, Abdul. And for eight, 18 months, we had nobody killed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I, I don't know. I mean, on a very small point, I think Trump is right. You do have to negotiate with your enemies. Right. Like, I mean, there's this idea. I think we don't negotiate with terrorists. Well, if you want to make peace like, you know. <clears throat> sure, we, we got unconditional sur surrenders in World War Two with uh, Japan and Germany or whatever. But like we had to negotiate, you know, like we had to talk to the people we're fighting. So to some degree, there is something there. But like. Um, you know, this stuff, I'm, I'm threatening to assassinate the leader of the Taliban if he doesn't stop killing American soldiers. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know if assassin. I mean, it's a drone war. OK, what have you? But um, he's, he's talked. He, he's basically just talking like a uh, mafia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. like both on this subject and the NATO thing. Like, it's like the NATO thing. It's like, oh. Nice uh, North American uh, treaty organization you got there. It should be a shame if something uh, happened to it. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, are, uh, you know, and you got to show the instinct. picture of the, you know, the, and the horse's head and the bed. No, you didn't say that, yeah. but he's basically. Ooh, like, looks like a nice little mud hut you got there. Ooh, I'd hate to drop a missile on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the level the man operates at consistently. So, uh, yeah. OK, he said he's saying they didn't they, he negotiated the, the, the peace, but he says they didn't follow it. He says the agreement said they have to do this, 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 this. And they didn't do it. They didn't do it. The agreement was yada, yada. OK, David Moore says, I want to move on. And Trump continues. And these people did the worst withdrawal. And in my opinion, the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. And by the way, that's why Russia attacked Ukraine, because they saw how incompetent she and her boss were. OK. David Moore, President Trump, thank you. I want to move on now to race and politics in this country. New, new, new subheading. I want to move on now to race and politics in this country. Mr. President, you recently said of Vice President Harris, quote, I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black and now she wants to be known as black. I want to ask a bigger picture question here tonight. Why do you believe it's appropriate to weigh in on the racial identity of your opponent? I don't and I don't care. I don't care what she is. I don't care. Uh, you make a big deal out of something. I couldn't care less. Whatever she wants to be is okay with me. But those were your words. So I'm I asking. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, all I can say is I read where she was not black that she put out. And I'll say that. And then I read that she was black. And that's okay. Either one was okay with me. That's up to her. That's Vice up to her. Vice President Harris, your thoughts on this? I think it's, I mean, honestly, I think it's a, a tragedy that we have um, someone who wants to be president who has consistently, over the course of his career, attempted to use race to divide the American people. You know, I do believe that the vast majority of us know that we have so much more in common than what separates us, and we don't want this kind of approach that is just constantly trying to divide us, and especially by race. And let's remember, how Donald Trump started. He was a, 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 a land, he had owned land, he owned buildings, and he, he was investigated because he refused to rent property to black families. Let's remember, this is the same individual who took out a full page ad in the New York Times calling for the execution of five young black and Latino boys who were innocent, the Central Park Five, took out a full page ad calling for their execution. This is the same individual 
who spread birther lies about the first black president of the United States. And I think the American people want better than that, want better than this, want someone who understands, as I do, I travel our country. We see in each other a friend. We see in each other a neighbor. We don't want a leader who is constantly trying to have Americans point their fingers at each other. I meet with people all the time who tell me, can we please just have discourse about how we're going to invest in the aspirations and the ambitions and the dreams of the American people? Knowing that regardless of people's color or the language their grandmother speaks, we all have the same dreams and aspirations and want a president who invests in those, not in hate and division. Vice President Harris, thank you. Lindsay? President Trump, this is now your third time this is the most divisive presidency in the history of our country. There's never been anything like it. They're destroying our country, and they come up with things like what she just said. Going back many, many years, when a lot of people, including Mayor Bloomberg, agreed with me on the Central Park Five, they admitted, they said, they pled guilty. And I said, well, if they pled guilty, they badly hurt a person, killed a person, ultimately. And if they pled guilty, then they pled, we're not guilty. But this is a person that has to stretch back years, 40, 50 years ago, because there's nothing now. I built one of the greatest economies in the history of the world, and I'm going to build it again. It's going to be bigger, better, and stronger. But they're destroying our economy. They have no idea what a good economy is. Their oil policies, every single policy. And remember this, she is Biden. You know, she's trying to get away from Biden. I don't know the gentleman, she says. She is Biden. The worst inflation we've ever had. A horrible economy because inflation has made it so bad. Mr. And she President, can't get away with that. Thank you. Your time is up. I, I want to respond to that, though. I want to just respond briefly. Clearly, I am not Joe Biden. And I am certainly not Donald Trump. And what I do offer is a new generation of leadership for our country. One who believes in what is possible, one who brings a sense of optimism about what we can do instead of always disparaging the American people. I believe in what we can do to strengthen our small businesses, which is why I have a plan. Let's talk about our plans and, and let's compare the plans. I have a plan to give startup businesses $50,000 tax deduction to pursue their ambitions, their innovation, their ideas, their hard work. I have a plan, $6,000 for young families for the first year of your child's life to help you in that most critical stage of your child's development. I have a plan that is about allowing people to be able to pursue what has been fleeting in terms of the American dream by offering a help with down payment of $25,000 down payment assistance for first time home buyers. That's the kind of conversation I believe, David, that people really want tonight, as opposed to a conversation that is constantly about belittling and name calling. Let's turn the page. Vice President and move Harris, forward. thank you. Let's turn to policy. President let's Trump, turn back we to have policy. to move on. To President Trump, let's turn to policy, she please. She has a plan to defund the police. She has a plan to confiscate everybody's gun. President Trump, she we has do a have plan to, move to on not to other allow issues. fracking in Pennsylvania or anywhere else. Okay, thank that's you, what President. her plan is until just recently. I, I just need Lindsay, to respond. President, President Trump, no, the, President the Trump, President has said no, something twice that I need to respond no, I'm, to. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to we're going to move on, Vice one President time to what he President has said Trump. Multiple. This is this gets pretty wild, Mr. President. You recently said of Vice President Harris. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black, and now she wants to be known as black. I want to ask a bigger picture question here tonight. Why do you believe it's appropriate to weigh in on the racial identity of your opponent? <laughs> I don't. I don't care. I don't care what she is. I don't care. You make a big deal out of something. I couldn't care less. Whatever she wants to be is okay with me. But those were your words, so I'm asking. I don't know. I don't know. All I can say is I read where she was not black that she put out. Uh, and I'll say that. And then I read that she was black and that's okay. Either one is okay with me. That's up to her. That's up to her. <laughs> very, very defensive here. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> Vice President Harris, your thoughts on this? I think it's, I mean, honestly, I think it's a tragedy that we have someone who wants to be president who has consistently over the course of his career attempted to use race to divide the American people. And we don't have this kind of, and we don't want this kind of approach that is just constantly trying to divide us, to divide us, and especially by race. And let's remember how Donald Trump started. He was a a a, a land. He was a he owned land. He was he owned buildings, and he was investigated because he refused to rent property to black families. Let's remember this is the same individual who took out a full page ad in the New York Times calling for the execution of five young black and Latino boys who were innocent. The Central Park Five took out a full page ad calling for their execution. This is the same individual who spread birther lies about the first black president of the United States. And OK. So he, he she, she responds like this. Um, David Moore says, Vice President Harris, thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay says, Lindsay Davis, President Trump, this is now your third time. And Trump can't let it go again. He needs to have the last word. This is the most divisive president in the history of our country. There's never been anything like it. They're destroying our country. And they come up with things like what she said. She just said going back many, many years when a lot of people, including Mayor Bloomberg, agreed with me on the Central Park Five. They admitted. They said they pled guilty. And I said, well, if they pled guilty that they badly hurt a person, killed a person ultimately. And if they pled guilty, then they pled we're not guilty. But this is a person that has to stretch back years, 40, 50 years ago, because there's nothing new. They have no idea what a good economy is. Their oil policies, every single policy. And remember this, she is, Bi she is Biden. She's trying to get away from Biden. I don't know the gentleman. I don't know the gentleman, she says. She is Biden. The worst inflation we've ever had, a horrible economy because inflation has made it so bad and she can't get away with that. Mr. President, thank you. Your time is up, Lindsay. <laughs> okay, so I thoughts on race? Oh man, where to begin? I mean, it's just uh, oh, I gotta drop in that quote from the original that they were referencing. Okay, from the Black Journalists Conference, where he went on the extended riff on her <laughs> on her race. Sir, do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is only on the ticket because she is a black woman? Well, I can say no. I think it's maybe a little bit different. So uh, I've known her a long time indirectly, not directly very much. And she was always of Indian heritage. And she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black. And now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I respect she went to a historically black one. college. I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't because she was Indian all the way. And then all of a sudden she made a turn and she went, she became a black. He is a character. He is a specimen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I don't know. He tries to be divisive, certainly. But I don't think she's playing that up either. Yeah. I don't think she really like is making that a centerpiece of her campaign the same way that I think Hillary did. Okay. She's the first, you know what I mean? Yeah, the first woman or what have you. Or yeah, anything. I just don't think that's like her message that she's trying to like get out there, I guess. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't know exactly what he's talking about, frankly, when he says something like because, like, she's partially Indian American as well, right? Yeah, she's mixed race. Her father's Jamaican and her mother's Indian. So Okay. I mean, to give him the most benefit of the doubt and possible, I mean, is it possible that in the past she has more played up the aspect of the Indian background and then at other times she's more played up the aspect of being an African American or... I, yeah, I don't. I, you know, I think that's a natural thing for people, especially I think of uh, people of more than one race to do yeah. is code switch depending on you know what I mean. Yeah. What I audience mean, dealing with? I mean, I don't know how else you're supposed to navigate the world that you know, yeah. except to do that. Yeah, I, I I don't really want to give him any credit at all, but like you know. I don't know. It's 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 a it's an ugly way to go about it, a campaign like this. It's it's not productive. Of course, it's exactly how he got his start in politics, basically. So what can we say about it that hasn't been said since?
probably back around 20, 2013, 2014, whenever the birther stuff started. Right. It's, it's ugly. So yeah. what can we say? But, um, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyways, whatever. Yeah. Um, in this case, Kamala does want to respond. It sounds like they were trying to move on, but she does want to respond to him. She says, I, you know, I want to respond to that, though. I just want to make I just want to respond briefly. Clearly, I am not Joe Biden and I am certainly not Donald Trump. And what I do offer is a new generation of leadership for our country, one who believes in what is possible. Unburdened by what has been, I might add myself. That's that's an aside. That's not what she said here. She said it other places. That's what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, I, and what I do offer is a new generation of leadership for our country, one who believes in what is possible, one who brings a sense of optimism about what we can do instead of always disparaging the American people. She wants to give, I want to give startup businesses $50,000 tax deduction to pursue their ambitions, their innovation, their ideas, their hard work, $6,000 to young family, Something the American dream by offering help with down payment of twenty five thousand dollars, down payment assistance for first time home buyers. OK. Uh, I, I don't have a family, so I'm not going to get the six thousand. I don't have enough money to start a business, so I'm not going to get the fifty thousand. I, I can't possibly buy property in America, so I don't get the twenty five thousand. This is this is what I fucking hate about Democrats. <laughs> it's like. It's like just cut the check. <laughs> just cut the like, check, baby. <laughs> just, just do the student loan forgiveness and I'll start at zero, okay? <laughs> like, that's all I'm asking for you, you fucking incompetence. But um, no, it's got to be micro-targeted tax benefits for various specific people. Okay. All right, anyway, so she goes about all that. And Vice President Harris, thank you. We have to move on. President Trump. Trump can't let it go again. She's destroying our country. She has a plan to defund the police. She has a plan to confiscate everybody's gun. She has a plan to not follow, to not allow fracking in Pennsylvania or anywhere else. That's her plan is until just recently. President Lindsey Davis says, President Trump, President Trump. Harris says, the former president has just said something twice and I need to respond to. I just need to respond one time to what he has said multiple times. But Lindsey Davis says, I'm sorry, we are moving. We're going to move on, Vice President Harris. This is now your third time running for president. OK, now Kamala endures this indignity of not being able to respond, but she does come back to that later here. Um, let's see. Hey, this is her third time running for president? No, no. Trump said something about her three times that she wants to respond to, apparently. Oh, oh no okay yeah talking to trump never mind go on um i think they they shift to obamacare here at this point the affordable care act and this is yeah. now your yes. third time running for president you have long vowed to repeal and replace the affordable care act also known as obamacare you have failed to accomplish that you now say you're going to keep obamacare quote unless we can do something much better Correct. last month you said quote we're working on it so tonight nine years after you first started running do you have a plan and can you tell us what it is obamacare was lousy health care always was it's not very good today and what I said, that if we come up with something and we are working on things, we're going to do it and we're going to replace it. But remember this, I inherited Obamacare because Democrats wouldn't change it. They wouldn't vote for it. They were unanimous. They wouldn't vote to change it. If they would have done that, we would have had a much better plan than Obamacare. But the Democrats came up. They wouldn't vote for it. I had a choice to make when I was president. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be? Never going to be great. Or do I let it rot? And I felt I had an obligation, even though politically it would have been good to just let it rot and let it go away. I decided and I told my people, the top people, and they're very good people. I have a lot of good people in this that administration. We read about the bad ones. We had some real bad ones, too. And so do they. They have really bad ones. The difference is they don't get rid of them. But let me just explain. I had a choice to make. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be? Or do I let it rot? And I saved it. I did the right thing. But it's still never going to be great, and it's too expensive for people. And what we will do is we're looking at different plans. If we can come up with a plan that's going to cost our people, our population, less money and be better health care than Obamacare, 
then I would absolutely do it. But until then, I'd run it as good as it can be run. So just a yes or no, you still do not have a plan? I have concepts of a plan. I'm not president right now. But if we come up with something, I would only change it if we come up with something that's better and less expensive. And there are concepts and options we, we have to do that. And you'll be hearing about it in the not too distant future. Vice President Harris, in 2017, you supported Bernie Sanders' proposal to do away with private insurance and create a government run health care system. Two years later, you proposed a plan that included a private insurance option. What is your plan today? Well, first of all, I absolutely support, and over the last four years as vice president, private health care options. But what we need to do is maintain and grow the Affordable Care Act. But I, I'll, I'll get to that, Lindsay. I just need to respond to a previous point that the former president has made. I've made very clear my position on fracking. And then this business about taking everyone's guns away, Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. We're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. As it relates to the Affordable Care Act, understand, let, just look at the history to know where people stand. When Donald Trump was president, 60 times he tried to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. 60 times. I was a senator at the time when I will never forget the early morning hours when it was up for a vote in the United States Senate and the late, great John McCain, who you have disparaged as being, a, a, you don't like him, you said at the time, because he got caught. He was an American hero. The late, great John McCain, I will never forget that night, walked onto the Senate floor and said, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't get rid of the Affordable Care Act. You have no plan. And what the Affordable Care Act has done is eliminate the ability of insurance companies to deny people with pre-existing conditions. I don't have to tell the people watching tonight, you remember what that was like? Remember when an insurance company could deny if a child had asthma, if someone was a breast cancer survivor, if a, if a grandparent had diabetes? And thankfully, as I've been vice president and we over the last four years have strengthened the Affordable Care Act, we have allowed for the first time Medicare to negotiate drug prices on behalf of you, the American people. Donald Trump said he was going to allow Medicare to negotiate pri drug prices. He never did. We did. And now we have capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. Since I've been vice president, we have capped the cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000 a year. And when I am president, we will do that for all people understanding that the value I bring to this is that access to health care should be a right and not just a privilege of those who can afford it. And the plan has to be to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, not get rid of it, Vice Past President prologue, Harris, thank in terms you. of where Donald Trump stands on that. I want to move to an issue well, that's important for a lot of... She made a mistake. At number one, John McCain fought Obamacare for 10 years. But it wasn't only him. It were all of the Democrats that kept it going. And you know what? We can do much better than Obamacare. Much less money. But she won't improve private insurance for people, private medical insurance, that's another thing she doesn't want to President get. People Trump are paying privately for insurance that have worked hard and made money, and they want to have private. She wants everybody to be on government insurance where you wait six months for an operation that you need immediately. President Trump. She says, well, you know, Trump, you wanted to repeal Obamacare, and then you were president, and you didn't do it, basically. Do you have a plan, and can you tell, it, tell us what it is? Trump says, Obamacare was a lousy health care always was, and it's not very good today. Um, I had a choice to make when I was president. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be? Never going to be great, or do I let it rot? And I felt I had an obligation. Even though politically it would have been good to just let it rot and let it go away, I decided, and I told my people, the top people, and they're very good people, I have a lot of good people in this, that administration. We read about the bad ones. We had some really bad ones, too. And so do they. They have really bad ones. The difference is that they don't get rid of them. But let me just explain. I had a choice to make. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be or let it rot? And I saved it. I did the right thing. But it's still never going to be great. And it's too expensive for people. And then he talks about... Um, what I will do is we're looking at different plans and so on and so forth stuff about plans. But until then, I'd let it run as good as it can run. So he's basically saying, like, I don't want to repeal 
uh, Obamacare until I have a plan. Lindsey Davis says, so just a yes or no, you still do not have a plan? <laughs> Trump famously said, I have concepts of a plan. <laughs> I'm not president right now. But if we come up with something, I would only change it once we come up with something better and less expensive. And there are concepts and options we have to do that. And we will be hearing about it in the not too distant future. I love it. Concepts of a plan. I'm going to remember that one the next time someone asks me, where's yeah. where's that story, Rob, that you were supposed to be working on? Yeah, I have concepts of a plan for an outline. Plan. Okay, just, you know, yeah. everything's under control here. Yeah, my brother in Christ, this is the debate. The election's <laughs> less than two months away. You're running for president. What do you mean you, you have concepts of a plan to replace Obamacare, which you've been bitching about since 2012? <laughs> what are you talking about? Hey. <laughs> yeah, it's it's bizarre. It's just bizarre. Easy. It's unserious. No, yeah, of course. So at this point, they move on to health care which, you know, they're already, kind of already on with the Obamacare, Affordable Care Act stuff. And this is where Kamala, she comes back to that thing where they, they kept her off what she wanted to talk about. She says, uh, you know, Vice President Harris, in 2017, you supported Bernie Sanders' proposal to do with way with private insurance and create a government-run health care system. Two years later, you proposed a plan that included a private insurance option. What is your plan today? She says, well, first of all, I absolutely support, and over the last four years as Vice President Health Care, options, private health care options. But what we need to do is maintain and grow the Affordable Care Act. But I, I'll get to that, Lindsay. I just need to respond to a previous point that the former president has made. I've made very clear my position on fracking and then this business about taking everyone's guns away. Tim Walls and I are both gun owners and we're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Trump may be starting to think, oh, man, is she going to shoot me, too? Like, everybody's trying to shoot me these days. Kamala got a gun? <laughs> so um, then she points out 60 times Trump tried to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. 60 times. Um, here she's going to start baiting him again by comparing him to uh, uh, John McCain. I was a senator at the time when I will never forget the early meeting or early morning hours when it was up for a vote in the United States Senate and the late great John McCain, who you have disparaged as being, I don't like, uh, uh, you don't like him. You said at the time because he got caught, he was not, a, he was an American hero. The late great John McCain, I will never forget that night, walked onto the Senate floor and said, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't get rid of the Affordable Care Act. You have no plan. Okay. Um, yeah. So Lindsey Davis, of course, is going to, I want to move on to an issue that's important, but of course, you know, you know, 35 seconds ago or something, Kamala has baited Trump by talking about John McCain. Uh, I want to move on to an issue that's important. Trump says she made a mistake. Number one, John McCain fought Obamacare for 10 years, but it wasn't only him. Uh, let's see. Private, private medical. She won't improve private insurance people. Private medical insurance. That's another thing she doesn't want. Lindsey Davis says, President Trump. He says, people are paying privately for insurance that they have worked hard and made money and they want to have private she wants everybody to be on government insurance where you wait six months for an operation that operation that you need immediately. <laughs> like, OK, people, people, this is this Republican talking point that people actually enjoy working hard and making money so they can spend that money to buy private insurance. Right. Yeah, we for the very wealthy, I'm sure that's true. For the rest of us. No, definitely don't want we have to. Oh, we, do, we definitely don't want that. Anything but that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm OK with supplemental private insurance on top of your government, what you already have to pay into, which you still have but to pay the full amount in. For like elective things, you know what I mean? Or like on top of extras, not to like just live like you should just let people. Well, well, I, I think it's a reality. The wealthy are always going to have better access to medical stuff yeah, than some, normal some, people. Some access would be nice. <laughs> well, 
I, I mean, I, I think there are cases like, you know, they say in the British case and stuff, there are waiting lists, there are long lines for certain things. And when you have a medical thing, sometimes you just want to take care of it as, as quick as possible. I acknowledge I'm realistic about that. I think the, the wealthy will always jump to the front of the line and get the access they need when they want it. But I do think there has to be a baseline for the poorest. Amount. I mean, for the poor people, if you don't have medical insurance and the insurance won't cover, you've got pre-existing conditions or what have you. You're never going to get this thing taken care of until it's a life or death situation. And then maybe. Right. That's an unacceptable reality for the most vast majority of people. But this thing that, oh, well, you pay you. Some people want to pay extra money to have private insurance so they don't have to wait in line. OK, well, just take care of everybody at the basic level first and then we can talk about what the wealthy want. Right. So I don't know. That's yeah. my thing. Um, so anyway, so, yeah, she talks about, OK. Yeah, he's complaining. OK, so he's he's repeating this lie that, you know, people enjoy paying for their private insurance. OK, next topic, climate change. Thank you. We have another issue that we'd like to get to that's important for a number of Americans, in particular younger voters, and that's climate change. President Trump, with regard to the environment, you say that we have to have clean air and clean water. Vice President Harris, you call climate change an existential threat. The question to you both tonight is what would you do to fight climate change? And Vice President Harris, we'll start with you. One minute for you each. Well, the former president had said that climate change is a hoax. And what we know is that it is very real. You ask anyone who lives in a state who has experienced these extreme weather occurrences, who now is either being denied home insurance or it's being jacked up. You ask anybody who has been um, the victim of what that means in terms of losing their home, having nowhere to go. We know that we can actually deal with this issue. The young people of America care deeply about this issue. And I am proud that as vice president over the last four years, we have invested a trillion dollars in a clean energy economy while we have also increased domestic gas production to historic levels. We have created over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs while I have been vice president. We have invested in clean energy to the point that we are opening up factories around the world. Donald Trump said he was going to create manufacturing jobs. He lost manufacturing jobs. And I'm also proud to have the endorsement of the United Auto Workers and Sean Fain, who also know that part of building a clean energy economy includes investing in American-made products, American automobiles. It includes growing what we can do around American manufacturing and opening up auto plants, not closing them like happened under Donald Trump. Vice President Harris, thank you. It didn't happen under Donald Trump. Let me just tell you, they lost 10,000 manufacturing jobs this last month. It's going. They're all leaving. Uh, they're building big auto plants in Mexico, in many cases owned by China. They're building these massive plants, and they think they're going to sell their cars into the United States because of these people. What they have given to China is unbelievable. But we're not going to let that. We'll put tariffs on those cars so they can't come into our country because they will kill the United Auto Workers and any auto worker, whether it's in Detroit or South Carolina or any other place. What they've done to business and manufacturing in this country is horrible. We have nothing because they, they refuse. You know, Biden doesn't go after people because supposedly China paid him millions of dollars. He's afraid to do it between him and his son. They get all this money from Ukraine. They get all this money from all of these different countries. And then you wonder, why is he so loyal to this one, that one, Ukraine, China? Why is he? Why did he get three and a half million dollars from the mayor of Moscow's wife? Why did he get why did she pay him three and a half million dollars? This is a crooked administration, and they're selling our country down the tubes. President Trump, thank you. Thank you. President Trump, thank you. We have another issue that we'd like to get to that's important for a number of Americans, in particular younger voters, and that's climate change. Kamala Harris says, well, the former president has said that climate change is a hoax, and what we know is that it is very real. You ask anyone who lives in a state that has experienced these extreme weather occurrences who now is either being denied home insurance or it is being jacked up. You ask anybody who has been the victim of what that means in terms of losing their home, having nowhere to go. Uh, we have addressed, invested a trillion dollars in a clean energy economy, while we have also increased domestic gas production to historic levels. 
Okay, Kamala, that seems like kind of a contradiction. <laughs> I mean, I know we have to increase gas production to offset the damage of the Ukraine war right now, but, you know, <laughs> giving a trillion dollars to clean energy while also increasing gas, it's like, okay, we're kind of working at cross purposes here. <laughs> Politics is complicated. Um, Donald Trump said, she's baiting him again here. Donald Trump said he was going to create manufacturing jobs. He lost manufacturing jobs. And I'm also proud to have the endorsement of the United Auto Workers and Sean Fain. So I didn't Sean Fain, was he the one, did he give a speech at the RNC National Convention or whatever? Uh, well, I, I think you're thinking of the, the Teamsters. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the okay. Teamsters refused to endorse Sean O'Brien. Okay. I'm sorry, okay. Sean Payne, Sean O'Brien, Sinn Fein. I'm getting all this this Irish stuff mixed up in my head. I'm sorry. Sean so. Fein is actually from Kokomo, where I used to work, and oh. he, he is a worker at the plant there locally. And he rose. That's how he became president, rising through the ranks. Aruba, so, Jamaica. Oh, no, no, different. Come on, come on. <laughs> I wrote a story about that, too. Ooh, I want to take you. Yeah. <laughs> Fictional. All right, uh, Beach Boys. Yeah. Uh, but, yes, no, Sean Fain is, uh, I believe he spoke at the DNC. Okay, okay, okay. So, I'm sorry, I'm getting these guys mixed up a little bit then, so. Yeah, well, they're in a both, the, it's both two, <coughs> two Sean spelled differently, both labor leaders. <laughs> Okay. different ideas about who should be president all right um okay so she's baiting him here again about he's he lost jobs he failed to create manufacturing jobs etc he promised to um he talks about what we're going to do it includes growing what we can do around american automobile manufacturing and opening up auto plants not closing them like what happened under donald trump lindsey davis says vice president harris thank you trump takes the bait again that didn't happen under Donald Trump. Let me tell you. Let me just tell you. They lost 10,000 manufacturing jobs this last month. It's going. They're all leaving. They're building big audio, auto plants in Mexico, in many cases owned by China. Um, yeah. You know, Biden doesn't go after people because supposedly China paid him millions of dollars. He's afraid to do it between him and his son. They get all this money from Ukraine and they get all this money from all of these different countries. And then you wonder, why is he so loyal to this one, that one, Ukraine, China? Why is he? Why did he get three and a half million dollars from the mayor of Moscow's wife? What? Why did he get, why did she pay him three and a half million dollars? This is a crooked administration and they're selling our country down the tubes. President Trump, thank you. President Trump says, thank you. A very polite conclusion to an unhinged rant, I have to say. Um, so finally, they come to closing statement. Welcome back tonight. The time has come for closing statements. And Vice President Harris, we begin with you. So I think you've heard tonight two very different visions for our country. One that is focused on the future and the other that is focused on the past and an attempt to take us backward. But we're not going back. And I do believe that the American people know we all have so much more in common than what separates us. And we can chart a new way forward. And a vision of that includes having a plan, understanding the aspirations, the dreams, the hopes, the ambition of the American people, which is why I intend to create an opportunity economy investing in small businesses, in new families, in what we can do around protecting seniors, what we can do that is about giving hardworking folks a break and bringing down the cost of living. I believe in what we can do together that is about sustaining America's standing in the world and ensuring that we have the respect that we so rightly deserve, including respecting our military, and ensuring we have the most lethal fighting force in the world. I will be a president that will protect our fundamental rights and freedoms, including the right of a woman to make decisions about her own body and not have her government tell her what to do. I'll tell you, I started my career as a prosecutor. I was a DA, I was an attorney general, a United States senator, and now vice president. I've only had one client, the people. 
And I'll tell you, as a prosecutor, I never asked a victim or a witness, are you a Republican or a Democrat? The only thing I ever asked them, are you okay? And that's the kind of president we need right now. Someone who cares about you and is not putting themselves first. I intend to be a president for all Americans and focus on what we can do over the next 10 and 20 years to build back up our country by investing right now in you, the American people. Vice President Harris, thank you. President Trump? So she just started by saying she's going to do this, she's going to do that, she's going to do all these wonderful things. Why hasn't she done it? She's been there for three and a half years. They've had three and a half years to fix the border. They've had three and a half years to create jobs and all the things we talked about. Why hasn't she done it? She should leave right now, go down to that beautiful White House, go to the Capitol, get everyone together and do the things you want to do. But you haven't done it and you won't do it because you believe in things that the American people don't believe in. You believe in things like we're not going to frack. We're not going to take fossil fuel. We're not going to do things that are going to make this country strong, whether you like it or not. Germany tried that. And within one year, they were back to building normal energy plants. We're not ready for it. We can't sacrifice our country for the sake of bad vision. But I just ask one simple question. Why didn't she do it? We're a failing nation. We're a nation that's in serious decline. We're being laughed at all over the world. All over the world, they're laughed. I know the leaders very well. They're coming to see me. They call me. We're laughed at all over the world. They don't understand what happened to us as a nation. We're not a leader. We don't have any idea what's going on. We have wars going on in the Middle East. We have wars going on with Russia and Ukraine. We're going to end up in a third world war, and it'll be a war like no other because of nuclear weapons, the power of weaponry. I rebuilt our entire military. She gave a lot of it away to the Taliban. She gave it to Afghanistan. What these people have done to our country, and maybe toughest of all, is allowing millions of people to come into our country. Many of them are criminals, and they're destroying our country. The worst president, the worst vice president in the history of our country. I have to say, when I first listened to the closing statements, I thought Kamala's was, you know, boilerplate, boring, inspirational, very respectable, but just basically blah, blah, blah. But when I, I listened to Donald Trump's final statement, which he requested, he specifically requested he wanted to have the last word, which was another narcissistic mistake on his part in a way, because I, when I went when I listened to his response to her response to her final statement, I realized that the very first thing that she said in her final statement was the final uh, bait for Donald Trump to take, and he absolutely took it. So Vice Pre uh, the time has come for closing statements, and Vice President Harris, we begin with you. So I think you've heard tonight two very different visions for our country, one that is focused on the future and the other that is focused on the past and an attempt to take us backward. But we're not going back. And then she continues. And the other part I found largely unnoteworthy. But this is the final bait. It's a, a cliche about progressivism versus conservatism. You know, they want to go back. We want to go forward. Progress versus regression. And it totally gets him. OK, because when we she comes, she finishes. OK, Vice President Harris. Thank you, President Trump. And he says, OK. Listen to this statement from Donald Trump's closing statement. So she just started by saying she's going to do this. She's going to do that. She's going to do all these wonderful things. Why hasn't she done it? She's been there for three and a half years. They've had three and a half years to fix the border. They've had three and a half years to create jobs and all the things we talked about. Why hasn't she done it? She should have done. She should leave right now. Go down to that beautiful White House. Go to the Capitol. Get everyone together and do the things you want to do. But you haven't done it and you don't you won't do it. It's like she's the vice president, bro. She's not the president. She can't do whatever she wants. That's, you know, obvious. He continues. Um, later, he says, but I just want but I just ask one simple question. Why didn't she do it? We're a failing nation. We're a nation that's in serious decline. We're being laughed at all over the world, all over the world. They laugh. I know the leaders very well. They're coming to see me. They call me. 
We're laughed at all over the world. They don't understand what happened to us as a nation. We're not a leader. We don't have any idea what's going on. Uh, we're going to end up in World War III, and it will be like a war like no other because of nuclear weapons, the power of weaponry. I rebuilt our entire military. She gave it to Afghanistan. What these people have done to our country, and maybe toughest of all, is allowing millions of people to come into our country, many of whom are criminals, and they're destroying our country. The worst president, the worst vice president in the history of our country. President Trump, thank you. And that is our ABC News presidential debate from here in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. I'm Lindsey Davis. And I'm David Moore. Okay, so. So what do you notice about his final closing statement? He's very much on the back foot. He's he doesn't say a single word about himself, what he's going to do, his vision. It's yeah. all about, she said this, she did this, she lied about this, she died, we're weak, everybody hates us, they're laughing at us, we're weak, our country's a joke. He took the bait completely. He didn't have a single word to say like a normal closing statement that a president would give, where you say, you know, okay, I've been debating this other person the whole time, but here, now I'm going to talk to you, the American people, and I'm going to say what I want, what I want to do, what we're going to do together. That's what you do in a closing statement. You don't sit there and go back and back and back again on the other person. And yeah. say every single sentence in the entire closing statement is about her, not him, the future, his vision, the people. Yeah, it's yeah. insane. It's insane. I think you can. I think you can read the or include the entire, you know, part of his speech right there, and you'll find what he is lacking because he allowed himself for one final time in this debate to be baited into responding to what she said about him or this or that to his own detriment which is really, I think, the story of this whole debate. Definitely. Yeah. No, she led him around by the nose. And, uh, you know, every she was, you know, the roadrunner with Wiley Coyote every time. You know, she was she she got him every single time. Um, yeah. Yeah, he walked right into it. But it's like he can't help himself. Even if he knows that's what she's doing, it's like he can't let these statements stand, you know? It would just be too threatening to his ego or his perception of himself. Yeah, it's it's like she didn't have a debate prep team. She just sat down with some really good psychiatrists. You know? <laughs> it's like, this is what narcissists are like. This is what they have to respond to. This is what they cannot allow. And this is, you know, this is how you, if you, if you really wanted to, then this is how you could have them have a complete meltdown on public TV. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. So, you know, like I said, Donald Trump, uh, you know, after he had absolutely decimated Biden in the first debate there, he thought, oh, now they're going to put in Kamala. She's terrible. She's terrible. I hope they do. Well, be careful what you wish for, I guess. I mean, and at the same time, not to give Kamala too much of a pass. Like we said at the beginning, there were questions in this debate that I wanted answers to. There were places where I wanted to different. I wanted her to have to differentiate herself from Joe Biden in some way. And she didn't really have to because she just had a, spent the whole, you know, two hour debate bullying by bullying Trump, which while that's a noble pursuit, you know. We, the American people, are having to make a decision about what our policies are going to be for the next four to eight years. And while obviously voting for Kamala is a net good, voting for Kamala is better than voting for Trump. But we're voting for you because he's terrible and you're our only option at this point. Right. Yeah. We're not voting for you because we know what you're going to do on Israel, Palestine, on Ukraine, Russia on all these different things. We're not voting for you because you're going to give homeowners a $25,000 tax credit necessarily, right? I I don't know. Like so there are things here that you know, this this debate was about Trump and how crazy he was and how that is very clearly exploitable by anybody who knows anything about him. Um and so I feel like you know, yeah, it's good. It's a good debate outcome. Trump loses. Harris wins, but we have unanswered questions remaining, I think, is what's frustrating for me. Yeah, well, I think it'll be interesting to see if what happens in the next couple of weeks, you know, like, will will any of the dynamics change? How much does this matter? I mean, this, this may be the only debate, Chow. We may not get another bite at this apple. Yeah, yeah, that would... 
you know, this being a thing that we've been doing going back almost eight or 10 years or something, however long it's been, that would be slightly disappointing, but it would save us a lot of work at the same time, I suppose. But <laughs> like you said, you know, if the vice, if the, B, if the VPs go at it, that could be interesting. Oh, no, I'm I'm sure. we could do the VP one. I'm just saying, I, I think uh, Harris said she was up for another debate right away. And Trump was like, well, I don't know. I'm very unfair on the moderators. <laughs> and, you know, it was very difficult to debate against the person and the and the and the refs or whatever like you know <laughs> for for the poor wounded narcissist yes for him yeah so yeah it's you know it's like that meme on twitter or whatever you know me when i'm reaping or yeah. me when i'm sowing and then me when i'm reaping it's like oh yeah joe biden lost oh, he sucks i'll do it <laughs> I'll do a mini another debate right now, Joe Biden. I'll give you another chance. Oh, ooh, ooh, Kamala kind of beat me. Oh, I, I don't know. Was it fair? I don't think the, you know, the judging wasn't fair. Oh, they were against it. Why'd they fact check me? It's not fair. I can't yeah. help it if I lie. <laughs> Just, yeah, it's like, yeah, very now, clearly. Remember how uh, giddy the Republicans were when they were having their convention? Like, it was like they already had this thing in the bag. You know what I mean? They were all like. <laughs> I Hey, at that point, I didn't disagree with them. No, at that no, point, Trump was, was writing tough. about a week off his assassination yeah. attempt. Yeah. You know, he chose a person who everybody said this person doesn't really benefit with any uh, group of voters that Trump needs. But it doesn't almost matter at this point because Trump looks like a fucking rock star hero with blood on his face after with a fist in the air yelling fight 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 after he just got clipped like it was over it was jover at that point absolutely jover but and another thing i'll say about kamala harris is i don't think kamala harris is a great candidate i don't think she's the greatest candidate no, I don't. She, I don't think her policies in 2020 uh, she didn't crack the top 5 for me yeah. But neither did, but didn't neither did Biden. Yeah. Either of but them. I think the thing is, I think I think probably, you know, and at the same time, I'll admit I was wrong. I wanted to see a primary fight, but the powers that be in the DNC decided not to. And that's okay, that's fine. Uh it was weird though, because I think like people like Nancy Pelosi were talking. I, well, I don't remember. I think like Nancy Pelosi might have been pushing for a primary fight. I think they were looking to get Josh Shapiro or somebody in like that. And AOC was against it. AOC says, no, we're going to, well, AOC and Bernie and them, they were supporting Biden to the bitter end, which I didn't understand. But maybe they knew something I didn't. I don't know. But then when it was, when it was going to be, when Biden was, when it was Jover, as we said, and when it was going to be somebody else, AOC quickly came out and said, we're going to support Kamala. And I'm like, huh. I mean, Okay. I get it. It's going to be Kamala or it's going to be, you know, Gretchen Whitmer or some of these people who rapidly said they didn't want it. Basically, they just kind of deferred to Kamala. You know, when there's a vacuum, you've got to you've got to you've got to consolidate power quickly. And and Kamala was very rapidly able to do that against some challenges from, I think, people like Nancy Pelosi, which really surprised me. But but maybe like Pelosi doesn't think Kamala she's going to be she thinks Kamala's going to be more like Barack Obama is on Israel Palestine than like a Josh Shapiro or somebody who she might have preferred was going to be. So, I mean, those are some of my, that's my speculation. I'm not sure exactly, but so I was a little confused. And at the time I didn't really like the idea that they were going to put, just kind of install Kamala when I know she's not a strong candidate from the previous elections. But I think once they did put her there, we consolidated very quickly because it's like, thank God that, you know, this is a breath of fresh air. It doesn't matter who it is almost. To some degree, Kamala is an empty vessel we can all pour our hopes and aspirations into. I hope she's going to be better on Israel-Palestine, but she has not communicated that. So, you know, we're making a decision for the next four to eight years on supporting Kamala when she won't say exactly what she's going to do on some of these things. She won't do interviews where she says that. She goes to a debate where they don't really make her say that because they it's, a, it's such a back and forth with this petulant little narcissist. Um, so these are some reservations I still have about her, but at the same time, I think that's why Democrats coalesce so quickly when it was not Trump and when it was not Biden anymore. As somebody who often wants the Democrats to do better in so many ways, I feel that it would be to all of our 
uh, you know, a benefit to have a two to have two sane political parties in this country. But that yeah. is what we have now. There is one there. I mean, there's basically what a center right party compared to the rest of the world, the Democrats. And then we've got these tinfoil hack. Can, the inmates have taken over the asylum uh, Republicans and there's no comparison. And it's like you don't really have to push too hard on the Democrats because all they have to do is point to the other side and be like, look, we're the only ones that live in reality. And you have to kind of agree, you know, yeah. and it's like like if both if both parties lived in reality, Democrats would have to do better because then they wouldn't just be able to appoint the Republicans and say, look how off kilter they are. They'd have to actually, you know, answer these questions that you're saying you want to answer. But as of now, they don't, you know what I mean? It's, it's not equal. It's not an equal situation at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, ever, I mean, frankly, after they put down the Bernie Sanders revolt, mm-hmm. from that point on, it has not been aspirational Democratic policies. It's been we're better than the other guys. And so you, you really have to support us. And as morally bankrupt and as disappointing and uninspiring as that is, they're not totally wrong. They're not <laughs> so wrong. It's, no, 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 I'm saying they're right, but it's like, they don't have to like be better than in that case. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, what was I, there was some other thing I was going to say about this. Um, yeah. Uh, you're mentioning, okay. So you mentioned shit, something about the two parties, uh, well, I was just saying, like the like like uh, both sides of them, I guess. I mean, like in the, in the media, you know, it's always they treat treat it as if it's the same thing happening on both sides. Well, the right the right has crazies and the left has crazies. You know, you never know. You, there's people on the fringe of both parties, and it's like, no, it's not it's not the same. Like it's <laughs> one side is is way way out, out, yeah, you know, outside. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other okay, I, I remember what I was going to say. I think the um. The other maddening thing about it is what I've come to realize living abroad is that, I mean, I don't know. I have very conflicted feelings about these things because American weakness breeds global chaos. I'm sorry. We are the superpower, right? Um, If American people were unified behind the idea of not just the Ukrainian survival or Ukrainian negotiated settlement with Putin where they get to keep like 60% of their country or something. If we were unified and committed to Ukrainian victory, holding 100% of their lands and throwing out the Russians, we could have had this thing over by now. But we've got people, oh, oh, Trump, Putin might nuke us. He's got nuclear weapons. Don't forget, nobody wants to talk about the nuclear. These are Russian talking points. He's not going to nuke us. It's insane. He's losing conventionally. He can lose conventionally. He can lose nuclearly. It doesn't matter. Like, it's, I don't know. But if the American political, if the two major American political parties, the Uniparty or whatever you want to call it, were actually unified on this, we could have had this thing over by now. If the American people, if the Democrats and Republicans were both saying, yes, we need, you know, I don't like you. You know, I don't want a transgender birthday party at my soccer game with the female boxer or what have you. You can do all this crazy culture war bullshit. Okay, you but know, we all agree, you know, Russia's our our international foe. Russia doesn't want good things for us. If yeah. Russia takes Ukraine, that's bad for Europe. It's been the American century because Europe has been stabilized. So I, I you know, I'm a I'm a reformed, not a pacifist per se. I don't think I've ever been a pacifist, but I think like you know, my anti anti war bona fides used to be a certain way, but now I'm saying like, you know, if if the Americans were unified, we may actually defeat a country instead of, you know, slow walking ourselves into a negotiated settlement where nobody's happy and it just gets pushed off for another twenty years or something. I mean that that goes back to the point of why you, it's in the interest of Russia to pay these people, right? Because if you sow division within the country, then they can't unify and rise up against you, yeah. right? Yeah, the the Democrats want to defeat Russia mostly, except for the pacifists who want it to end, and the Republicans mostly think that maybe Putin has a point and maybe NATO doesn't pay their bills and maybe NATO's not so good and maybe NATO, you know, encroached on him and da 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 and all this, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it helps. This is this is all stuff that's good for him. Well, uh, any predictions 
that you want to make? I know that you uh, hadn't thought about it, but anything you want to say before the VP debate, we should definitely do one of these for that. I'm sure there'll be some some more moments. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think like, I mean, I do think Tim Walls is, as far as I can tell, he's the originator of the Republicans are just weird talking point, which has been remarkably effective. Yeah. And I think think you know jd vance is one of the weirdest he's proven himself to be one of the weirdest he's going on these he's been going on these right-wing podcasts for years um saying wacky stuff about cat ladies and women and women not having children not having families and how you know all this whatever he's he's confusing the you know the causes and the effects of economic instability leading to not marrying and buying a house he's saying well women not getting married means that we don't have economics to be you know i don't know I just I think Tim Walls going up against this guy could be a very good thing because Tim Walls comes out looking normal and J.D. Vance comes out looking out like a a right wing fever swamp creature who is just deep and deep in the muck of these this this right wing thought. So that's what I that's the strategy I'd like to see Tim Walls go for. Perhaps I don't know what J.D. Vance could do. I think he's moved way far too past this hillbilly elegy stuff, this crap. So I don't know. You know, we'll see. <laughs> Again, at the same time, I haven't really given it as much as thought as I have before this presidential debate about what their two strategies ought to be, right? And also at the same time, like we know a lot more about Trump and Harris, even though we know not less about her as the vice president, but we know a lot more about both of them than we do know about Tim Walls. I like Tim Walls a lot. I think he was the absolutely the correct choice. It gave me a lot of faith in Harris that she chose him. 100%. Over the Pennsylvania guy. Oh yeah. Would have been a disaster. But again, I think I feel like I had a better idea of what I wanted to see from both Trump and Harris coming into this debate. Whereas with JD Vance and the other guy, uh, uh, what, uh, walls, Mm -hmm. Tim walls. Like I, I can't say exactly what I need to see from them as clearly, I think right now. So I'll, I'll give it some thought though. Just I feel like J.D. Vance is a very I mean, he he never really backs down from a bad position. Mm -hmm. Like I've never like like when he got called out for the childless cat ladies thing. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made. And so they want to make the rest of the country miserable, too. And it's just a basic fact. You look at Kamala Harris. Pete Buttigieg, AOC, the entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. He was like, I'd like to apologize to the cats. Ah. Yeah. Look, Megan, I've heard from a lot of conservative women and frankly, a lot of liberal women who said, I'm actually glad that you pointed out that there's become something profoundly anti-family in our public policy and in our public conversation. Obviously, it was a sarcastic comment. I've got nothing against cats. I've got nothing against dogs. I've got one dog at home and I love them, Megan. But look, this is not people are focusing so much on the sarcasm and not on the substance of what I actually said. And the substance of what I said, Megan, I'm sorry, it's true. <laughs> you know, and then like the thing with the or people went eating. wild. Yeah, exactly. And then <laughs> again with the cats, what is this? God, the cats. Then the eating the cats thing, then that was debunked. And he was like, well, it's not true, but it could be, you know, just like talking about immigration or whatever. And it's like, pew. <laughs> it's like, he's not, he never like really back. Like, I, I think that's very exploitable. If somebody's really just never willing to, you know what I mean? Admit a mistake or back down from a position, really. Like, that's mm-hmm. not, like, that's, that's a very rigid constraint, you know? Like, you, you I feel like uh, somebody who has a good head on their shoulders, like Tim Walls, could really, you know, exploit that. Yeah. And, it, and if you've always got to define yourself in some way in opposition to the opponent, then you, as, as the opponent, you can really make somebody take some very indefensible positions in that case, oh, yeah. just by just by saying something blatantly obvious and reasonable and then they have to take the opposite half of that bet again i you know again i'm not a i'm not a tim walls debate prep guy but uh, there seems like there's something there maybe yeah at the same time like they're they're both vp so they can't really stake out too much on their own they do have to stick to their their bosses uh their bosses positions 
And it's interesting, again, in the debate, we saw Trump kind of, you know, well, I don't know what J.D. was talking about there. And maybe he has a different opinion of his own and that's OK. But, you know, he's really, really throwing his own VP under the bus. So we can all see that Trump is pretty fed up with J.D. Vance. So. Oh, man. Yeah. Anyways. Well, I don't know. I think. Yeah. Bob, how many hours have we gone on the, on the, the, the Harris Trump debate here? God. Well, it's uh, two oh nine in the morning. We started. <laughs> we started recording. I think slightly after nine p.m. So I think we've been recording for four and a half hours on and off. So. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be. This is one. This is another one for the books here. This is another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think. I don't know. I think. I don't know. I got. I do got to say, like, even though I had just woken up when we got started and everything, like, and drank some coffee and drank some Red Bull and stuff, and I, I do think, like, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to disparage myself as a night owl, but I do think I was able to, hopefully, keep myself a little bit more. I, I think I said I don't know a lot less today, probably, than I normally sure. do, which is one of my pet peeves of myself when I when I yeah. hear myself. I'm like, sometimes I'm like, when I'm listening back to the podcast, I'm like. Oh, I think I should bring up this point. And then I do. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> brilliant. Good That's job, exactly man. what I would have done. I'm glad I did that. That's good job, me. But then sometimes I'm like, well, I don't know. 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 And I'm just like, God, why do I fucking say that? I really <laughs> wish I didn't say that. It's like a verbal tick or something. Yeah, you really notice those when you edit your own speech. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. So I'd like to think, I don't know how it's going to come out, but I'd like to think I was a little bit more coherent and uh, focused perhaps today than I sometimes am at night when I'm, you know, coming off work at 10 o'clock and my brain's all frazzled and everything or something. So. <laughs> Definitely. No, I think this is a good one. So. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Well, let's keep our eyes out for when the, uh, when the VP debates are coming up and get ready to do that one too. Awesome. All right, well, uh, take care of yourself there in uh, Korea, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right, yep, have a good day there. Have a good night there, Bob. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.